The Final Game Written by Cueve MacDonald And read by Morgan C. Jones Chapter 1 The Deal Danny emitted a girlish squeal as Esther's hand grasped his left buttock. Jesus! She stepped back as he swung around, holding her hands up and laughing. Well, someone is jumpy. Anger and embarrassment collided on Danny's face, making it glow bright red even in the gloom of the warehouse. Where did you come from? And what in the hell are you doing going around grabbing people's arses? Relax. Take it as a compliment. A compliment? We work together. Sexual harassment is what it is. I've a good mind to report you to HR. Esther rolled her eyes. Sure you will. Do you think they'll have questions about the millions of dollars worth of stolen tech in that case, handcuffed to your wrist? Danny looked down at the briefcase and then back up at her. I'd imagine they'll have questions for both of us on that front. Esther nodded. It was best to get off of the subject. Danny wasn't the brightest, but she didn't want him thinking too hard about what they were doing, just in case his brain started belatedly putting a few things together. An awful lot of work had gone into this, and the last thing she needed was him getting any ideas now. It had been a struggle to find somebody so quickly once O'Mara had fallen through. Jason O'Mara had been a senior engineer at Talina, one of the world's major high-tech chip manufacturers, which had four plants in Ireland, spread around the outer Dublin and Wicklow areas. Three months ago, he confessed to a friend that he had got in over his head with the wrong people and they were forcing him to steal prototype microprocessors from work. They found him the next morning, floating below the Valleymount Bridge in Wicklow, having taken the quickest and most permanent route down. Talina's security team, in conjunction with the Irish police, launched an exhaustive investigation, but found no evidence of foul play or industrial espionage. O'Mara was a fantasist, with some kinky sexual preferences and an online gambling problem. He had clearly conjured up a story to make his predicament seem less pathetic. That was the conclusion reached by Talina's head of security. Esther Levy made sure of it, seeing as she was Talina's head of security. O'Mara had been a weak fool, and she chastised herself for picking him. Luckily. She had improvised before the situation got out of hand. If there was one thing twenty years in Mossad had taught her, it was how to think on her feet. She'd been working for Talina for six years now, and she thoroughly hated it. Meetings and memos, mission statements, and goddamned HR guidelines on everything. Not to mention the miserable Irish weather. She had decided that she would take early retirement to a beach somewhere with endless cocktails, soft sand, and hard-bodied men who didn't mind if you grabbed their arse. Danny's arse wasn't even that impressive. For a gay man, he was remarkably heterosexual-looking. In fact, he was average height, waist, everything. A man you could forget meeting while you were still doing so. Normally gay guys are more fun than you, Danny. Yeah, well, normally women aren't as... Danny paused, his jabbing finger suspended in mid-air as he struggled to find the word he was looking for. Women aren't as... whatever is the female equivalent to being a misogynist. Esther laughed. Relax, princess. I think your little Colombian marching powder problem is making you jumpy. I told you to keep yourself straight for this, didn't I? I'm perfectly fine. You're the one who's acting the maggot. The what? Christ! You Irish really can't go three sentences without saying something unintelligible. Danny glared at her. Racist. Let's add that to your CV, along with the reverse misogyny and the homophobia. Esther tutted. 
Oh, please. She didn't care if someone was straight or gay, but preferred working with straight men. It was one of her little personal rules. She liked to sleep with men she worked with, having found over the years that it was an excellent way to gain leverage. She was not a doe-eyed romantic. Sex was a weapon, same as anything else. It worked on O'Mara up to a point, that point being when she had needed to hurl him off a bridge. Danny had been a gift. After O'Mara's little whoopsie, Esther found herself minus a way of acquiring the merchandise, and the Koreans were getting antsy. Not only might they go off the deal, but they were the type to clean up any loose ends on their way out the door. She needed to find another way, and fast. Happily, looking for weaknesses was not only one of her skills, it was her actual job. The initial checks on the head of development's new PA had thrown up a couple of red flags. Despite coming from a good job with a financial services company, he seemed very short of cash. Digging deeper revealed that Danny Byrne had a serious coke problem, and better yet, he owed money to some very serious people. Defaulting on his mortgage was the least of his worries. The banks were bastards, but they didn't break legs. He was, in short, desperate for cash. Still, she couldn't be too careful after the O'Mara debacle. She'd called in favors from the old days and had his apartment bugged and his phone tracked. Every inch of his life had been examined and re-examined. Danny Byrne was legit and legitimately in the shit. Turning him had been easy. And seeing as the head of development walked around with his head in the clouds, it had been only a matter of weeks before Danny got hold of his login and security clearance. And so it had been this evening at 7 p.m. Danny Byrne walked into Lab 18 using his boss's ID card, punched in the code, and taken a set of chips out of the safe. Esther had met him at a prearranged location and driven him here to the warehouse. She had let him out of the car and told him where to go, citing the need for them not to be seen together. The fool hadn't questioned it. He followed her instructions to the letter because, while he might be a prissy little shit, desperation made him a compliant one. This place stinks, said Danny, wrinkling his nose in disapproval. It did. Esther had scoped it out the week before. Its ownership was in default with the banks, and there were some ongoing legal issues, hence the strong smell of mold. The previous owners were listed as being in the fiberglass supply business, which didn't do the warehouse justice. The place was like an odd terracotta army display. Massive thirty-foot shelves stacked four levels high with fiberglass figurines stretching back one hundred meters. Disney characters, reindeers, dinosaurs, unicorns and smiling guys in various mundane uniforms excitedly pointing in all manner of directions. It gave you the unnerving sensation that hundreds of dead eyes were watching you. A row of jolly, fat, fiberglass men with sausages around their necks had all their faces smashed in. It wasn't Esther's place to worry about such things but one of the local teenagers had some serious anger management issues. "'What did you expect?' asked Esther. "'It's an abandoned warehouse. I doubt they have a cleaning service.' "'Are you sure the cameras back at the plant blacked out okay?' "'Like I told you the first three times, yes. Relax.' Esther had explained that he had to grab the merchandise alone so she could run interference from the control room, knocking out security cameras and card readers to erase his presence. He'd bought it hook, line, and sinker. She had done nothing of the sort. When Talina realized in the morning what had happened and raised the alarm, there would be a detailed recording of exactly what Danny had done and how, captured live and in technicolor all the way from his desk until the time he left the plant via the front gate. Later on, 
the Garda investigation would uncover five different CCTV camera feeds showing Danny walking alone into the warehouse where they now stood, carrying a special briefcase that he bought online two weeks beforehand. Esther would appear nowhere on that footage, having come in a different way. She had left nothing to chance. She guessed it might be a week before that footage was found. That was her best guess for how long it would take for Danny's body to reek enough for someone from the garage next door to come looking. The investigation would conclude that he had been double-crossed by his buyers. The head of development would be fired in disgrace, and the head of security would be asked to resign quietly, having let such a thing happen on her watch. Ain't life a bitch. Can we go over this one more time? said Danny. No, said Esther. All you need to know is to shut up, look pretty, and let Mommy do all the talking. Yeah, well, just remember, I'm the only one with the code to this case. Danny held it up, a look of triumph on his face. Esther did her best to look annoyed. This was Danny's cunning little plan. It was sad, really. She had made him leave his phone and all other electronics in the office so he couldn't be traced on the off chance someone realized what was happening. He thought this briefcase, with the thumbprint identifier and the code, meant he was in control of the situation. Fool. She guessed that if it came to it, he'd give up the code before she had even begun to remove the thumb. Not that it would be necessary. Danny would be counting his money, and no doubt calculating how much white powder it would buy, when the rope in her pocket pinched around his throat. Anything happens that I don't like, said Danny, and I'm walking away. Esther heard a noise. Shut up. They're here. Two men emerged from the darkness, both wearing tracksuits. Esther had worked with Johnny Jung before, although she doubted that was his real name. It had been back in the day when they'd both been agents of their respective states. These days, Esther was private sector, and she guessed Johnny was somewhere in between. The guy was short, even by Korean standards, which probably explained why every time she met him, he had a large sumo-sized dude with him. It was like he picked them out of the henchmen catalogue. Idiot. Not a great way to keep a low profile. Esther looked at her watch. Right on. Johnny held a finger to his lips and nodded at the man Mountain, who opened the briefcase he was carrying, took out an electronic device, and started moving around the room. Esther winced as Danny spoke. What's he doing? Shut up, hissed Esther through clenched teeth. He's checking for surveillance. Why is he? Danny stopped talking as Johnny placed his hand inside his jacket. Esther mirrored his action while simultaneously holding her left hand out in a calming gesture. This was all she needed. Five minutes from a life-changing amount of money, and the dead man walking doesn't know when to shut his damn mouth. Johnny and Esther locked eyes, and then, with a nod, they both slowly lowered their hands. Easy does it, thought Esther. Nobody needs to die. At least, not yet. Chapter Two the van. The atmosphere inside of the MCM investigations van was tense. There were several reasons for this. Firstly, there were too many people in it. While Bridget sat with Phil in the front seat, there were three people in the rear compartment, which was at least one too many to fit comfortably. It was not designed to be a people carrier, seeing as it was, after all, a converted ice cream van. The three people in question were DSI Susan Burns, 
head of the National Bureau of Criminal Investigation, Detective Donica Wilson, also of the NBCI, and James Hammond, chief legal counsel for Irish operations for Talina Corporation. Secondly, the van was tense because it contained, at least in the opinion of the three people in the back, one too many German shepherds. In the defense of Maggie, the aforementioned dog, she was firmly of the opinion that the back contained three too many people. While Bridget could not confirm this, she suspected that Maggie did not like the guardee, which in one way was odd, as she used to be one. On the other hand, it made perfect sense. From what Bridget understood, Maggie was not only forcibly removed from the force, but she would have also been forcibly removed from life itself, if the dearly departed Bunny McGarry had not intervened and helped to fake her death. Bridget was sketchy on the exact details of what happened, and, seeing as Bunny wasn't around any more, and Maggie couldn't exactly fill in the blanks, it was likely to stay that way. Not that Maggie was barking at their guests or anything. In fact, it was the exact opposite. She was sitting there in silence, just looking at them. Maggie had the ability to make that feel way more threatening than it sounded. She also had a chronic flatulence issue, which did nothing for the ambience. It wasn't possible to open a window, as they needed to keep all external noise out of the van, because, thirdly, and most importantly, they were all intently listening to the goings-on in the warehouse that sat one street over, via a listening device located in a titanium briefcase. Bridget tried to keep the tension from her voice. Are we sure they won't find the bug? Hammond shook his head. The man had a supercilious air to him that had previously only been a little annoying, but in a confined space and a tense situation was kicked up several notches to fingernails on a blackboard level. Guaranteed, as long as your man presses the concealed button on the handle, the bug will turn itself off and become undetectable. State of the art. Bridget found this a lot less reassuring than intended, probably because her boyfriend, Paul Mulcrone, surprised her two months ago with a state-of-the-art TV with a curved screen, voice recognition, and surround sound. Every time she sneezed, it turned itself over to MTV Base, and it was properly getting on her tits. She was looking forward to slagging Paul off about it. The reason she hadn't been able to yet was that for the last six weeks, after MCM Investigations was hired by Mr. Hammond, off the books, to investigate his head of security on not much more than a hunch, Paul had been working deep undercover, pretending to be a man called Danny Byrne. He didn't do cocaine, he didn't have massive debts, and the only thing he definitely shared with the fictitious Danny Byrne was a dislike of strangers grabbing his arse. What he did have was a television that Bridget knew he got off some guy called One-Eyed Barry, that inexplicably turned itself on at 4 a.m. some mornings and started talking French. He also seemingly had the urge to show Bridget how much more responsible he was these days, which was why he'd thrown himself into the undercover gig with such gusto. She had not seen him in the last six weeks because Esther Levy was paranoid, and they couldn't take any chances. They detected some surveillance, but with a pro like Levy, you couldn't guarantee you had found it all. So Paul had become Danny, right down to engaging in fake drugs buys for the benefit of whoever Esther had following him. It had to be said, Paul was a natural. Her partner being a superb liar was something Bridget didn't quite know how to feel about. Something she was much less conflicted on was her feelings on Esther Levy. She hated her with a white-hot fury that went way beyond a professional interest. Thanks to this woman, 
She'd had to make up excuses as to where her boyfriend was while attending her cousin Dervla's wedding. That, coupled with the fact that Levy was a despicable criminal who had almost certainly killed Jason O'Mara, and was currently putting Paul's life in danger. Bridget had been put on the sad singles table for the reception, too. Hammond's instructions were clear. They had to catch Esther Levy bang to rights, which meant them getting evidence of an exchange taking place. As the head of security, she could justify everything as a sting operation she was running without concrete, irrefutable proof showing otherwise. Bridget's stomach was a rolling ball of anxiety, from both the pressure of delivering what their client wanted and her worries about Paul's safety. Throughout this whole thing, she harbored the unspoken fear that MCM investigations were totally out of their depth. DSI Susan Burns also looked far from happy with proceedings. She unclipped the walkie-talkie from her belt and spoke into it. Did anyone get eyes on the buyers going in? The question was greeted with brief negative responses. How is that possible? asked Hammond. Because, said Burns, failing to keep the irritation from her voice, you only informed us this was going down twenty-four hours ago, and we did not know the location in advance. My people are trying to do surveillance on the fly without being seen. Do you have any idea how annoyed the head of the Garda Emergency Response Unit is? I had to drag him back from a conference in France. Hammond ran a hand through his thinning hair. Yes, yes, well, rest assured, Talina will be passing on its thanks to the Irish government, assuming this goes smoothly. Bridget caught the flash of irritation on Byrne's face, indicating the implied threat in that last statement had not gone unnoticed. They all stopped talking, as there was a beep from the audio feed coming through the speakers, and the background noise of the warehouse disappeared. Phil spoke up. That's Polly deactivating the bug. Bridget looked at Burns. Right. Send in the cavalry. Burns lifted the walkie-talkie to her lips, but Hammond grabbed her hand. Do no such thing. We need them making the exchange on tape for this to stick. He looked at Phil. This bug keeps recording even when it's not transmitting, doesn't it? Phil nodded. And he can turn it back on once they finish the scan? Phil nodded again. Then we wait. If anything goes wrong, started Burns. What can go wrong, said Hammond. Two vans full of your armed response team are sitting a minute away. Right now, Mr. Mulcrone is probably the safest man in the country. Burns glanced at Bridget, and then looked at her watch. I'm giving it exactly a minute, and if it doesn't come back, we go. End of story. Bridget chewed nervously on her thumbnail. This was going to be the longest sixty seconds of her life. Chapter 3 Location, Location, Location Paul watched nervously as the big fella finished scanning the room. He took one last look at the screen on the electronic device that looked tiny in his massive hands and nodded at his boss. Johnny Jung's face broke into a wide smile. Esther, looking lovely as always. Still fighting back those advancing years, I see. Johnny, she responded. Have you gotten shorter, or have the ludicrous henchmen you bring everywhere with you just gotten bigger? Oh, Esther, always so myopic in your perspective. I'll have you know that Mr. Choi is an electronics expert. Sure he is. 
and Danny here is an original member of the Backstreet Boys. Paul smiled uneasily, not least because Esther had focused attention on him, just as he was trying to subtly run his fingers around the case's handle, to put them in two very specific locations that would turn the listening device back on. Jung shook his head. Believe what you like, my dear, but the truth remains the truth. Paul attempted to smile at the big fella, who looked at him like a salad that had turned up as his main course. The dude was humongous. He was easily six feet ten, and must have weighed over four hundred pounds. Paul always wondered how such massive human beings got around. Airplanes, for a start. Paul had only been on one in his entire life, but his memory was that the seats were tiny. Come to that. Toilets. This fellow wasn't built to use an Irish shitter. So many questions. Paul was also aware that in his panicked state, his mind was diverting itself from dealing with the reality at hand. Any second now, the Garda armed response unit would come flying in the windows or the doors. There was a skylight. They could come through that, too. The case was bulletproof. In the event of a firefight, Paul had yet to decide whether he would hold it over his head or his nether regions. He knew that shouldn't really be a decision, but somehow... it was. Okay, said Esther. As you can see, we have the merchandise. I take it you have the money? Johnny Jung lifted the laptop bag he held in his right hand. The money will be transferred into your account once we receive the Pegasus chipset as agreed. Twenty-five million dollars. Excellent, said Esther, then nodded at Paul. Paul nodded back. Esther sighed. Danny, open the case, there's a good boy, and show the gentlemen the microprocessors we are selling them. Right, yeah. Paul placed the case up on a nearby crate and started fumbling with the code. They had her. They finally bloody had her. Three months, and she was now banged to rights, on tape, closing the deal. Paul smiled at Esther. She didn't know it yet, but she'd just put her own arse-grabbing arse behind bars for a very long time. DSI Burns had her walkie-talkie to her lips. Go! 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 Bridget's heart was in her throat. And you're sure they know which one is Paul? Relax, said Burns. He'll be the terrified-looking white guy. They're not going in all guns blazing. This isn't TV. Everyone will just surrender. Right. Bridget nodded her head and looked across at Phil, sitting there with his headphones on, listening intently. He, if anything, looked even more terrified than she felt. It'll be fine. Ah, yeah, said Phil. It'll be 100% absolutely not an issue, can't miss, fine. Oh, Christ, don't say that, Phil. What? In your entire life you've never been optimistic about anything. You trying to be so now is truly terrifying. Fair enough, said Phil. We gave it a go. Do you want me to put on the radio? In the middle of an armed raid, said Bridget. Phil shook his head. There's no pleasing some people. The entire van tensed as voices could be heard shouting over Burns' radio. Armed police! Drop your weapons! Drop your weapons! Armed police! Clear! There then followed a lack of shooting, which Bridget was thrilled about and lots of people shouting clear at each other. Burns looked at the walkie-talkie, and then at the laptop. 
It was noticeable that the armed raid didn't appear to be stilting the flow of conversation between Esther and her guests. Her voice sounded relaxed. So, Johnny, have you been enjoying your time in Ireland? The food is terrible. Bridget and Burns locked eyes for a moment, as Bridget felt her stomach somersault inside her body. Burns snatched up the walkie-talkie. Control, status report. There were some muffled voices, and then one clear, pissed-off-sounding male one came through. Clear, ma'am, the whole location. There's nobody here. Are you sure? said Burns. Confirmed, came the terse response. Seriously? I know what an empty building looks like, Susan. Burns looked at Phil. It's the wrong bloody warehouse. Phil's eyes were wide. It can't be. Paul said when he got out of the car and turned on the mic, I'm in Donnybrook. I'm heading down a road to a warehouse. There's a Starbucks up on the opposite corner. This is the only Starbucks in Donnybrook. We triple-checked. Phil looked at Bridget, his eyes wide with terror. I did, Bridgie. I swear. Paul tried to remain calm as he fumbled with the code. He was stalling, waiting to hit the deck with the sound of doors being kicked in. There was an alarming lack of alarm in the room. Will this be much longer? said Jung. Sorry, said Paul. Sweaty fingers. I'm such a clumsy sod. He laughed. Nobody joined in. Danny, said Esther, glaring at him. I'm going as fast as I... Paul stopped talking. His treacherous fingers had apparently put in the right code of their own accord, and the case clicked open. There we go. He turned the case around. It contained a set of a dozen microchips, packed tightly amidst styrofoam and some other substance that he couldn't identify. All present and correct? Excellent, said Esther her voice returning to its more relaxed tone. So now we can do the transfer. Jung shook his head. Not so fast. We need to check we have the right goods first. Esther tensed. What? Chill, said Jung. Joy here is going to run some very quick tests to make sure we are getting what we are paying for. That's not part of the deal. It is now. Are you questioning my honesty? Esther's eyes narrowed as she glowered at Jung. Oh, please, Esther. We're here because you and your... Jung nodded in Paul's direction. Whatever he is, are stealing from your employer. I think it is a little late for you to get all high and mighty about your integrity, don't you? Mr. Choi here really is an expert in electronics. He just needs to plug one of these into a special board to confirm the performance is as promised. Fine, said Esther snatching her gun from her holster and pointing it at Choi. But he makes one wrong move, and I blow his brains out. Jung pulled out his gun and pointed it at Esther. Likewise. Paul's legs were turning to jelly. He looked at Choi. I hate it when Mammy and Daddy fight. Choi said nothing just blinked. Even his eyelids were bloody massive. It was taking all of Bridget's self-control not to scream at somebody. Okay. Are there any other warehouses near here? Phil shook his head. 
We checked everywhere. Detective Donica Wilson chipped in. Yeah, right. Phil pointed a finger at Wilson. What did you bleeding say? Ignore him, said Bridget. No, no. If PC Plod has something to say... I said ignore him, Phil. All that matters is finding Paul. Although clearly Detective Wilson has a point, added Hammond. Whatever small charm the man had disappearing once things were not going his way. This entire operation is an utter shambles. Before Bridget could respond, Burns popped her head in the open back door. I've sent my people out doing a grid search trying to find another warehouse or whatever. Have they said anything else? Phil held a headphone to his ear with one hand and pointed the other at the laptop. They're doing some checks on these chips or something. Burns nodded. Okay. Well, that buys us a little time. Need I remind everyone what is at stake here? said Hammond his face getting redder. Those are real chips, worth millions, if not billions, to my company. If they are allowed to walk out of the country, it will be a catastrophe. You must... Shut up! shouted Phil. Excuse me! said Hammond, rearing back in outrage. Phil now had both the headphones on and was flapping his arms about. Shut up! How dare! Shut up! said Burns and Bridget in unison. Phil held his hands over the phones. They just said something. So, said Paul, because he couldn't take the tension any more. Does anyone know any good restaurants in Donnybrook? We could grab a Chinese after. Choi's stone-like expression somehow got frostier. Not that it has to be a Chinese, continued Paul. Didn't mean to be... We could go for an Indian. Loads of Indians in Donnybrook, probably. I mean, I'm guessing. Or tapas. Shut up, Danny, snapped Esther. You're doing that cocaine babble thing again. We're not even in Donnybrook. Paul tried to keep his voice steady when he spoke next and failed miserably. Luckily, guns were being pointed at people, so hopefully all present wrote it off as hoping not to get shot, related nerves. I thought this was Donnybrook. Bonnybrook, said Jung, looking at Esther. What is it with you and banging idiots? Esther shrugged. Ever screwed a nuclear physicist? Jung shook his head. I have, ironically, not a lot of bang. We're not actually... Paul started, but his heart wasn't in it. It was too busy hammering away at his chest like it was hoping to get out now before something very bad happened to the rest of him. Funny thing, said Paul. I thought when you said Bonnybrook, you said Donnybrook. Your accent makes it sound a bit... How is that funny? said Esther. You're right, said Paul. It's not funny at all. Joy turned to look directly down at Paul. Up close, it was hard not to wince in case it was the start of an avalanche of humanity. I hate tapas. Paul nodded. Right. Good to know. Bridget jumped into the driver's seat, which was tricky as Phil was already sitting in it. This meant he had no choice but to slide himself out awkwardly from underneath her. Luckily, Phil was a master at doing things awkwardly. Burns was firing bursts of orders into the walkie-talkie, and Hammond was loudly pontificating, but nobody was listening to a damn word he said.
Bridget threw the van into first gear and slammed her foot down hard onto the accelerator. For no explicable reason, the ice cream van had a lot more engine than it needed. It was a 2.2-litre fuel-injected something or other. If you ran out of flakes in the wrong part of Dublin, you needed some serious welly to outrun the angry mob. As the van hurtled forward, a whole lot of physics went on in the back. Bridget didn't even look around as there was a yelp and something thumped out of the back door. Jesus! screamed Wilson. That Hammond guy just rolled right out the back door. He'll be fine, said Bridget, throwing the van into third as she took the corner out of the car park and narrowly avoided several parked cars. Burns was screaming into her walkie-talkie. Bonnybrook! I repeat, Bonnybrook! The location is in Bonnybrook! I swear, Bridge, started Phil. Polly said... Directions, Phil? Right. Phil pulled his phone out and started googling. The van took a right turn so sharply that Wilson ended up on top of DSI Burns, with a German shepherd dog wedged between them, who issued a threatening growl. Sorry, boss, said Wilson. It was unclear if the apology was directed at his DSI or the dog. Burns pushed him off. Miss Conroy, should you be driving? Bridget swerved to avoid a cyclist. Are you armed, DSI Burns? No. Then you've no way of stopping me. Chapter 4 The Right Case Paul's mind was racing. He was painfully aware that now he had opened the case, his only leverage in this situation was gone. Esther was a stone-cold killer, set on covering her tracks, and him being alive had gone from a necessity for the success of the operation to an inconvenient detail she hadn't dealt with yet. Is this going to take much longer? asked Esther, sounding testy. Do you have plans, Esther? asked Jung. Yes, she said with a humorless smile. All this talk of food has got me rather peckish. Well, you never could control your appetites. Esther sighed. Is that what all this delay is about, Johnny? You're upset because we screwed that one time and then I ghosted you? Jung's playful tone dropped. Don't flatter yourself. It wasn't even that good. We both know that isn't true. Choi glanced at Paul, and they shared an awkward moment of solidarity. Two men trapped in a conversation they really didn't want to be here for. Choi's laptop pinged. Well? asked Jung. Choi stared at the screen for a long, drawn-out moment before nodding. Finally, said Esther. And now we can sort out your payment, said Jung. Unlike some, I stick to my promises. This petulance is an unattractive look on you, Johnny, replied Esther. This might be why you're on the one and done list. Yes, he said, looking at Paul. You have such high standards. Hey, said Paul. I happen to be gay. Leave me out of your sordid little whatever the hell this is. I apologize, said Joan. That's all right, said Paul, his brain whirring. His panicked mind grasped onto a passing thought. You're just checking the one chip? Cool. Jung looked up from opening his laptop. Yes, I... Why? No reason, said Paul. What? Ignore this idiot, said Esther. 
He's a glorified secretary. He knows nothing about chips. Jung looked at Esther, and then looked up at Choi. Check another one. Screw that, said Esther. I'm out of here, and I'm taking the case with me. Why, Esther? Have you got something to hide? Don't be ridiculous. It makes no sense for me to screw you. Paul could have sworn that Choi winced at her poor choice of words. Until this point, the man had shown no hint he had facial expressions. Paul had concluded that all he had was a massive face. Seeing him look suddenly uncomfortable was like seeing Mount Rushmore give a cheeky wink. Jung looked up at Choi again. Check. Another. One. Fine, said Esther, giving Paul the dirtiest of dirty looks. One more, and that's it. Jung nodded. Seniority has its privileges. When they'd hit a brief straight patch, Burns had moved her way up the ice cream van where she could stand wedged behind the front seat. The view out the front window also meant that she could anticipate the van's roller coaster journey. This was a mixed blessing, as it also allowed an unfettered view of Bridget Conroy's driving. If they survived this experience, she was going to have to arrest her for reckless, damn near everything. At one point, she'd leaned forward, compelled to check that Bridget did in fact have her eyes open. Burns was self-aware enough to know that she was a control freak and had never been comfortable in a vehicle someone else was driving. Still, she was pretty sure that the way she was feeling now had a lot more to do with basic human survival instincts. Watch out for the... With a screech, a lamppost freed the van's offside wing mirror from its earthly bonds. I saw it, snapped Conroy. Burns said nothing. The van could have really used a siren to warn people of its impending arrival and departure from their lives, but it didn't have one. Instead, as they mounted the pavement for the third time in the fifteen-minute journey, people looked around with a look of childlike glee as the dulcet tones of an ice cream van playing the Popeye theme tune brought them back to happy memories of their childhood, and then dived out of its way as the rest of their lives flashed before their eyes. Burns had given up extolling the virtues of slowing down or showing any regard for the rules of the road, as it was obvious Conroy was not paying the notion any attention. Beside her, Phil, the gangly sidekick, had his left hand firmly clamped over his eyes, while his right hand held out his phone, displaying an app showing a map. He'd started trying to pray, but it quickly became clear that he didn't know enough words to get all the way through one whole prayer. So he was now quietly reciting the lyrics to the Sir mix -a -Lot classic Baby Got Back, for reasons that nobody wanted to inquire about. He was doing all this while still wearing the headphones to listen to the goings-on in the warehouse. Bridget looked at the screen of Phil's phone, and then threw the van into a left turn, where at best two wheels stayed on the ground. Behind her, Burns heard a growl, and Detective Wilson yelped. Wilson, you all right back there? When she received no response, Burns turned herself to look around. Then she turned back and tapped Phil on the shoulder. He pulled one headphone away from his ear. Sorry to bother you, Sir mix -a -Lot, but it appears your dog has her jaws wrapped around my colleague's throat. Phil shrugged. I've problems of me own. Maggie, hollered Bridget, giving the first sign in several minutes she was aware of anyone else's existence. Put him down. Burns turned around again. That did it. That dog is a menace, squealed Wilson. She belongs in this van, said Phil. If you don't like it, you can get out and walk. 
Now, boys, said Bridget, while overtaking two lanes of traffic, much to the consternation of people driving in the opposite direction, who were forced to swerve frantically out of her way. No fighting, or I'll turn this car around. Bridget threw the van back into a lane that was at least on the correct side of the road, as she sent a couple of bollards flying. Phil, what's happening now? We could be wrong, but I think the madwoman and the Korean fella shagged. What? Now? asked Burns. No, said Phil. Before. Right, said Bridget. We're nearly there. Inspector, where is that armed response unit? It really said something for Bridget Conroy's driving, that despite high-performance vehicles, extensive training, and actual sirens and flashing lights, they were still several minutes behind an ice cream van being driven by an ex-nurse. About three minutes behind us, they... Whatever she was going to say was lost as the van collided with a curb, causing metal to screech and everyone to jump a couple of feet in the air. Burns' head collided with the roof, so she could add assaulting a police officer to the list. Paul watched as Esther swapped her gun from her right hand to her left. Holding it pointed at somebody's head got tiring after a while. The head it was pointing at was Choi's, although from the look she gave Paul, it was clear that she would much rather kill him. Choi, despite the understandable distraction, watched the screen of his laptop. As to Paul's uneducated eye, the tests ended up with the same results as the first time he had run them. Certainly the color scheme looked similar, which was all he had to go by. He had used the time he'd bought to unsuccessfully attempt to calm himself down. He had figured out that he'd given Phil the wrong location. He'd never been to Donnybrook before. Despite having lived in Dublin his whole life, Paul was only familiar with the inner city and bits of the north side. He'd never even heard of an area called Bonnybrook. He also had no idea how far it was from Donnybrook. That important piece of information might be the difference between life and death. His. He had considered and rejected the notion of casually trying to toss that question into the conversation, because nobody was seeming terribly chatty. Paul needed another way to stall for time. He couldn't let the Koreans leave with the chips, as that would be a disaster for Talina. He also reckoned Esther had always planned to kill him, and that was before he'd started being awkward. He had maybe a minute left of the testing. He'd considered trying to suggest they test all twelve, but he couldn't see that flying. Maybe he could direct the conversation back around to Jung and Esther's previous relationship, and they would shoot each other in a fit of jilted lover's rage, but he couldn't think of a way to do it. There was the fight-his-way-out option, which was only a toss-up as to who would kill him. Then there was... something. There must be something. Choi's laptop pinged again. He nodded at Jung. All right, said Esther testily. We good? Jung nodded. We are excellent. Both Esther and Jung slowly returned their firearms back to the holsters under their armpits. Better safe than sorry, added Jung. Yeah, if you want to spend more time in my company, Johnny, next time can I suggest flowers and chocolates? He laughed. Well, if you ever find yourself in Korea. Sure, said Esther. Choi placed the chip back into the case, and Paul closed the lid. As Jung fired up his laptop, Esther fired up her own. Paul's best hope now was for a bad 4G signal, so that the exchange couldn't take place. Come on, Aircom, don't fail me now. Choi reached forward to take the case. 
but Paul snatched the case away. Ah, ah, big fella, no offence, but money first. Esther nodded. Yes, my colleague has a point. They stood there, as Jung typed away on the laptop, Esther watching him work intently. So, said Paul, turning to Choi, do you mind me asking, but a big fella like yourself, how do you get about? I'd imagine air travel is a bugger. We fly private, said Jung without looking up. Really, said Paul, who didn't care, but was trying to find any kind of angle here. Do you still get them little bags of peanuts on those planes? Nobody answered. And you get a life jacket with a whistle? What's the deal with the whistle? Jung looked up. Are you trying to do a bad stand-up routine from the eighties? He looked at Esther. Seriously, this idiot must be great in the sack. For the last time, I am gay, hollered Paul. He didn't know why he was shouting. But seeing as he had nothing approaching a plan, and the only things he knew about air travel were indeed taken from 80s stand-up routines he'd seen on YouTube, this felt like the last roll of the dice. All right, said Esther. Calm down, princess. And you can stop calling me that. The level of homophobia present in this industrial espionage is completely unacceptable. That's it. The whole thing is off. Shut up, moron. No, I... Paul stopped talking, looked behind Jung, and put his hands in the air, a look of panic on his face he didn't have to fake. Shit, don't shoot! Jung twirled around, but Esther didn't buy the desperate bluff for a millisecond. She reached for her gun. Choi, being Choi, hadn't even begun to turn his bulk around. Paul had never in his entire life hit a woman. He wasn't wild about doing it now, but he felt, if ever there were the circumstances to do so, these were them. Besides, he didn't hit her. Technically, the case hit her on the side of the head, sending her sprawling to the floor. Paul ran towards the back of the warehouse. He dived to his left behind a fiberglass snowman just as its head exploded. As he darted between the various figures, he could hear Esther's voice. Could you not shoot at the twenty-five million dollars worth of tech? All the doors are locked and he's unarmed. Let's go find this idiot. Jung shook his head. Amateurs. There's the Starbucks, shouted DSI Burns. Now, we just need to find the... I'm heading down a road to a warehouse. There's a Starbucks up on the opposite corner, repeated Bridget. Burns scanned the far side of the street. That must be the... Her thought was interrupted by the squeal of protesting tires as the van came to an abrupt halt. Burns found herself on the floor again. At least this time... She was on top of Wilson, which was better, although the dog was below them both, which was worse. She could feel the vibration of the growl passing through Wilson's body, which really shouldn't be possible. She pulled herself back onto her feet. Okay, we need to... Burns looked into the empty front seat. Oh, crap! Come on, Wilson! Shouldn't we wait for thee? She didn't hear the rest of his protestation as she was out of the back door and running, her walkie-talkie in her hand. Location is down a laneway. Burns on sight. Going silent. With that, she turned off the walkie-talkie and ran towards the door that Bridget Conroy and Phil Nellis had just disappeared through. She almost got bowled over by the German shepherd that went bounding past her. Well, thought Burns, she had been saying recently how she wanted to get out of the office more. 
Chapter 5 The Cavalry This should have been easy. Johnny Jung held his Sig Sauer tightly. It was a straightforward payoff and acquisition job. All right, there'd been a little subterfuge involved. Esther had assumed, given his history, that the purchase was for the Koreans, and he'd let her think that. The great thing about the ongoing clusterfuck that was Korea is that you could never be sure which side someone was working for, and he had worked for both in a limited capacity at one time or another. In fact, it was because of this that he had to stay off of the Korean peninsula entirely, and as far away from either side's business as humanly possible. He had pissed off some very unforgiving people, and he was banking on not being considered annoying enough to get rid of. A couple of other governments had reason to dislike him too, but that was another story. This was why Johnny preferred the private sector. They didn't take things so personally. To them, business was business. And even if that business involved ending a life, hey, it was just business. Once they'd dealt with this Danny idiot, Johnny was considering dealing with Esther. She had messed this up in ways he couldn't even begin to understand. She was a lot of things, but until this point, she'd always been professional. That, and as it turned out, riddled. He'd not brought it up, but after their one night in Bangkok, he'd had to get a cream. The only thing that gave him pause was that she was former Mossad, and the Israelis were a little territorial. If one of theirs got taken out, even a former member, and regardless of the circumstances, they had a tendency to either officially or unofficially take an interest. Those were people you did not want to be of interest to. The warehouse was a big enough space to cover, but there were three of them. Besides, there was one door, and all other exits were locked and barred. He had a quick scout before they entered. As long as they kept this idiot contained, there was only one way this was going to go. It shouldn't take long to get the chips. Maybe if he found them first, that'd be that. If Esther did, then the deal was back on. Finders keepers, losers weepers. Wasn't that what the children's rhyme said? He drifted down the aisle between the weird fiberglass figurines. The massive shelves stretched up to the high roof. If this Danny idiot had got on to the higher levels, then it'd take a while to get him down. The place was creepy. Every way you looked, there were glassy eyes and wide smiles beaming back at you in the dim illumination offered from the fluorescent lights. He stepped through the reindeers, horses, and cows section, and into the dwarves. It appeared to be all of Snow White's little buddies, only mass-produced, and ironically, made six feet tall. There was a lot more than seven of them, though. Multiple clones of each stood before him. Perhaps this was the order that had killed the company? A giant battalion of unwanted dwarves? He knew some people who'd pay to be let loose in here with a baseball bat. It would be a fun way to release some rage. Speaking of rage... Come on, Danny, said Esther's raised voice somewhere on the other side of the warehouse. Just calm down, come on out, and we can complete our business. Nobody's mad at you. Yeah, right, thought Johnny. He'd lay good money that Esther would have this dumb bastard dead within the hour. He had known her back in her real hellion days. Under that calm exterior, the crazy bitch had got her rocks off on the darker side of the street. The time they'd worked together, they were dealing with a Turk who was trying to make both of their employers look like idiots. Johnny was fine with permanently disposing of the guy, but Esther... She had really got off on it. It freaked Johnny out. Not that he hadn't dealt with a stone-cold psycho before, but he'd not expected to add her to that list. 
On the way back, she'd gone from frosty ice maiden to wild animal. She could lie all she wanted. That had been one hell of a night. Even allowing for the subsequently required cream, it had been worth it. In his head, maybe he'd walked in here considering the possibility of a rematch, but that wasn't happening now. Probably. Johnny stopped. He spotted the toe of a trainer sticking out from behind a large crate near the end of the aisle. The fool was lying in wait, thinking he could jump him. Amateurs. He moved slowly towards it, keeping himself low. This Danny idiot was probably standing behind there, revving himself up to smash the case, or whatever other weapon he'd found, into Johnny's head. Like he would give him that chance. Johnny was going to shoot him in the leg, just in case Esther didn't know the combination to open the thing. He could get it out of him, and then she could do what the hell she liked after that. Five feet. Four feet. Johnny tried to loosen his grip on the gun. Easy now. Suddenly, Choi appeared at the end of the aisle, coming very close to getting his massive head some ventilation it didn't need. Johnny stopped and held up his gun, his pulse pounding in his ears. He glared at Choi, who stood there, the great lummox, shrugging back at him. He really was an electronics expert, with damn all in the way of actual street smarts. Johnny pointed behind the crate. He had meant Choi to sneak up from the other side. In hindsight, it was a stupid idea. Choi had never snuck anywhere in his life. It was like expecting a mountain to fly. Instead, he just stomped over to it. He looked down and then lifted up a pair of men's shoes. Johnny stood. God damn it! Choi pointed behind him. Johnny turned around and saw the face of one of the seven dwarves. Dopey, if he wasn't mistaken. It was on a fiberglass figurine that was slowly walking away from them. Johnny raised his voice. We've got him! The figurine stopped, and the socked feet that had been propelling it disappeared from view. It sat back on the floor, like they'd suddenly not be able to tell which one he was in. Where? said Esther's voice. First row! At this, Dopey sprouted legs again and started running. There were no eye holes in there, though, which was why it ricocheted off one shelf and then the other causing an Easter bunny to topple from the top of one of them and come crashing down like the grimmest of grim suicides. Dopey got himself straight just in time to start running down the aisle as Esther rounded the corner. She lowered her shoulder and sent the idiot hurtling backwards, where he messily wiped out a plethora of his fellow dwarves like bowling pins. Through a combination of kicking and whirligigging the briefcase around, Paul managed to bust his way out of the remainder of the fiberglass shell. It must have looked like a particularly traumatic hatching of a baby bird. He'd cut his arm on landing, but worrying about that seemed pointless now. He clutched the case to his chest. Okay, wait, wait, wait! Esther looked down at him. You are such an idiot. You know that? Damn cokeheads. Fried your own brain. If you'd just shut up and done your part, you'd be a rich man by now. Paul nodded. Sure. Dead, though, too. Let's not forget that. Johnny and Choi stood beside Esther and looked down at the idiot lying in the shattered remains of Dopey. Johnny nodded. He does have a point. Esther ignored the comment. Okay, said Paul. Remember, though, I've got the combination for this case, and I've swallowed the key of the handcuffs, too. Johnny Jung nodded. That's okay. 
Mr. Choi reached into his coat, pulled out an alarmingly sized machete, and handed it to Jung. I can take off the hand, or just go in and find the key. How do you want to play it? The blade caught what light there was. Oh, Jesus, said Paul. That won't be necessary. Even if I had swallowed the key, I've just shit myself. Paul reached his hand into his pocket, pulled out the key and held it up. If he had thought of it, he would have attempted to swallow it, so it was probably just as well that he hadn't. He moved in a deliberately slow motion and unlocked the handcuffs. Great, said Johnny. Now let's just shoot this dumbass and get on with our day. Paul started rocking back and forth on the ground, stomping his feet like a toddler going into full meltdown mode. No, 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 no. Johnny Jung shook his head. Dude, my advice is to man up. Try to go with a little dignity. No, hollered Paul. I'm not trying to go quietly. I'm trying to live loudly. Choi was the first to notice that the massive shelving unit behind them was tipping forward. It was therefore particularly unlucky for him that, as he turned around, the first of the Santas from the top shelf smashed into his face. It had taken all four of them, Bridget, Phil, D.S.I. Burns, and Detective Wilson, to tip the shelves forward. It wasn't a great plan, but seeing as they were unarmed, it was the best they had. If nothing else, the sight of a squad of skydiving Father Christmases raining down would stay with Bridget for the rest of her life, even if that proved to be a very short time. All four of the people on the other side were buried under an avalanche of festive fiberglass figurines. The shelving unit slammed into the one on the far side of the aisle, which also tipped. If it hadn't been for the corrugated wall of the warehouse, there could have been one hell of a domino effect. As it was, she and the others had needed to move sharpish to stop the bottom of the shelves they'd pushed over pinning them. Esther went down after a Santa caught her right in the back of the head. Choi staggered around, his hands clasped to his bloodied face, dazed as further figurines bounced off him. Johnny Jung held his arms over his head and kept his feet in the initial onslaught. Paul dived at his legs with a manic, desperate energy, sending him tumbling messily to the ground. He took a knee in his chest for his trouble, but he grabbed Johnny Jung's right hand, the one holding the gun. Jung's free hand pushed into Paul's face as they rolled around on the ground, clawing, looking for an eye to gouge. The gun went off once, twice. A sneezy statue, inches from Paul's head, taking a gut shot that he'd never fully recover from. Paul held on as tightly as he could, attempting to twist and turn Jung's fingers. The gun fired another couple of times, spitting wild shots into the air. Jung jabbed Paul in the windpipe with his left hand, and suddenly he couldn't breathe. He reflexively put his hands to his own throat. Paul watched in horror as Jung's hand turned the gun veering inexorably in his direction. He closed his eyes. He could breathe again, which wasn't much comfort given the lack of use he would get from that facility. And then Johnny Jung screamed, causing Paul's eyes to open. The gun flew from his hand and landed somewhere amidst the mosh pit of fiberglass figurines, loosened by the furious German shepherd that was attached to the man's weapon-wielding arm. Maggie dug her teeth in deep. Jung yowled with pain, and then slammed a fist into her face, once, twice, three times, causing Maggie to release him with a yelp. He turned around and got on his knees, looking for his gun. Then he stopped moving, keeping perfectly still like a man trying to outstatue the statues. The reason for this was that a dog had attached her jaws firmly to his crotch area. 
Johnny looked down between his legs at Maggie, and then back up at Paul. His voice came out in a whisper. Help me. Paul sat back and tried to regather his breath. He looked at Maggie. He was so happy to see her that he felt the urge to go in for a hug. He didn't. Maggie did not like to be touched at the best of times, and she was clearly busy right now. Instead, he looked back up at Jung. Dude, my advice is to man up. Maggie growled again. Phil Nellis was not a great athlete. His limbs, while long and thin, had never figured out how to work in harmony to achieve a goal. Any goal. Even if that goal was walking across a room without doing damage. His one trip to a china shop had gone badly. Back in his days as a player in the St. Jude's under-12s hurling team, his main contribution had been an unerring ability to get in the way of things. Balls, opposition players, and once, memorably, a referee, which had resulted in Phil getting sent off. He had only been rushing to the sideline because he'd forgotten to go for a pee at half-time and he was bursting. That explanation had not gone over well with the referee. Oddly, the following two weeks had been the best in Phil's admittedly mostly unhappy school days. For a fortnight, he was mental Phil, referee killer. Then he turned his own face blue in science class, and that had been the end of his unwarranted hard man phase. The point being, despite how many fights he had been in throughout his life, Phil Nellis had never gone into one expecting to win. He still went charging in, though, as, in his experience, it was better than walking slowly or running away. In Phil's admittedly unusual philosophy, catching a beating was better than giving whoever was the latest in a long line of bullies the satisfaction of seeing you scared. The big lad, Phil, had heard him referred to as Choi over the surveillance, was massive, a sheer wall of humanity. Phil was tall but rake-thin, and while he liked the word sinewy that he'd read in a book once, he was more accurately described as a lanky string of piss. That exact combination of words had been written on his school report card one year by his P.E. teacher, Mr. Gregg. That was the year when Mr. Gregg went away for a while and came back several months later talking about Jesus a lot. This Choi fella, in stark contrast to Phil, was immense in all directions. He was an enormous slab of muscle, topped with a shaved bowling ball-like head. Phil didn't care. He just needed to stop Paulie getting killed, and whatever else happened, happened. At least this way, in the Nelissian logic by which he lived, nobody could say he'd lost a fight that he could be expected to win. Yes, he had a piece of wood. It was a good piece of wood. It was like the two-by-four which that WWF wrestler Hacksaw Jim Duggan had used when he was a kid. He'd been Phil's favourite, mainly because he was batshit crazy. Still, there was a little method to the madness. Phil had found the two-by-four as he ran around the tipped-over big shelf thing. It was a handy size, and in Phil's limited experience of weapons, it felt like it might be useful. He held it above his head as he ran, screaming like a berserker. Choi was paying him no attention. He held a hand to his bloodied face and gawped down at the Santa Claus that had smashed into it. Then he looked at his own blood-covered hand. He glanced up just in time to see Phil Nellis charging at him. Then, stumbling over a supine Santa, and instead of the cracking blow to the head Phil figured was his best chance, Phil ended up poking Choi in the belly with the piece of wood before he collapsed to the ground. Phil got to his knees and looked up. Choi's eyes were wide as they stared down at him. This was bad. Phil sighed and placed one hand over his mouth and the other over his nether region. Then, to his utter disbelief, 
Choi collapsed backwards onto the ground, landing with a mighty thump on his large posterior. He and Phil looked at each other. Choi started crying. Esther was running. This may have gone to hell in a handcart, but she could still get out, regroup, reassess. They had trained her to handle a crisis, and that's what this was. Panic did nobody any good. She could head for the coast, find a boat, leave this godforsaken country once and for all. She had lost her gun in the chaos, which was bad, but on the upside, she held in her hand a case with twenty-five million dollars worth of happily ever after in it. At least, if she could get it to safety and find another buyer. She was fifteen feet from the door. She knew how to disappear. She could do this. It was as she was passing the large T-Rex statue that someone came crashing into her. A woman. They fell to the floor. Esther turned her body to throw the woman off. She had been a legend in her training days back in the Midrasha, the woman whose hand-to-hand -hand combat skills surpassed most of the men. She glanced at her opponent as she got to her feet, a brunette in her thirties. The woman's eyes held a furious anger. Esther took a step towards the door when another assailant crashed into her. This time Esther kept her feet. Forewarned by the woman helpfully shouting, Stop, police! as they came together. She rolled her hip and used the woman's momentum against her, sending her spinning through the air in a perfectly executed judo throw. The door. All that mattered was getting out. Arms wrapped around her right leg and teeth dug into the flesh of her calf. Esther screamed, as much in rage as pain. The brunette had sunk her teeth into her. Esther brought her free foot around to stomp on her when the second woman rejoined the fray, tackling her to the ground. The three of them ended up in a heap on the floor. The key thing when fighting two opponents was to make it into one opponent as quickly as possible. The biter, having released her grip, was now attempting to wrap her legs around Esther in some form of hold. The blonde policewoman grabbed Esther's left arm, but released it when Esther jammed a thumb into her right eye. She screamed. Esther turned her attention to the brunette, squeezing her arm in to try to break the hold. She swung a punch at the woman's face, but her opponent turned her body just in time, and it bounced off her shoulder. Esther reached for the knife she always carried strapped to her unbitten left leg and pulled it out. This rabid bitch was going to get sliced open. The leg grip was released as the woman tried to pull away from the knife. Esther jabbed it towards her and... Suddenly the world was pain. Something hard slammed into Esther's face, dazing her. Blindsided, she tasted blood in her mouth. She glimpsed a man standing over her, and then she felt other hands on her, flipping her over onto her front and cuffing her wrists together. From her vantage point on the cracked concrete floor, Bridget looked at DSI Susan Burns, sitting on the back of Esther Levy, Detective Wilson standing over them all, hands on knees, panting. The DSI's left eye was held shut. Mad bitch poked me right in the eye. She was about to stab me, replied Bridget. All right, said Burns. It's not a competition. Burns looked up at Wilson. So, Dunica, you kick women in the head now? Wilson looked horrified. Boss, I... she had a knife. Burns nodded. I mean, yeah, but still, it's the look of the thing. Oh, fuck off, boss. Excuse me? Burns looked at Bridget, and while it was hard to tell due to the woman's still closed eye, she could have sworn that Burns winked. This will all be going in my report, Detective Wilson. Oh, God! Burns shook her head. Christ, Wilson.
You really are a bit dim sometimes. You saved the lives of a senior officer and a... Burns looked at Bridget. Consulting detective? Ha! she barked. Nice try, Sherlock. A member of the public. There might be a special commendation in this for you, Wilson. Oh, said Wilson. We'll have to send you on a training course too, though. Let's not make this hitting women thing a trend. They turned as the door of the warehouse slammed open, and heavily armed men started pouring in. Ah, excellent, said Burns. Just in the nick of time, lads, as always. She pointed over at the first aisle. Two men over there, at least one armed. Bridget stood. Shite! Paul! Phil! Paul! Paul came around the corner, a sight for sore eyes, or eye singular, in Burns' case. He held a gun up in the air. We're okay. Are you? Bridget nodded and sat back, relief washing over her. Phil walked around the corner looking shell-shocked as he dragged a plank of wood behind him. The armed response unit rushed by them. Be careful, lads. My dog has one of these boys in a very compromising situation. Whatever you do, don't upset her. What about the other one? asked Burns. Choi, said Paul. Phil dealt with him. Phil nodded. On his own? asked Bridget, incredulous. Phil nodded again. You okay, Phil? Not really, to be honest with you, Bridge. The big lad started bawling his eyes out. It was dead upsetting. I only poked him. First time in my life I've ever won a fight. Didn't enjoy it at all. At all. You was all okay? Bridget nodded. This is all a massive misunderstanding, said Esther. Is it? said Burns. Which part? The bit where you're on tape, selling stolen technology? The bit where we've got you threatening our undercover operative's life? Or the bit where you resisted arrest and then attempted to stab two people? I want a lawyer. Oh, I'd imagine you'll be wanting several, and they'd better be world class. Speaking of which, I am arresting you on a charge of assaulting a police officer with, spoiler alert, other charges to follow. You are not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so, but whatever you say will be taken down in writing and may be given in evidence. She looked up to see the armed response unit marching Johnny Jung and his large associate out of the building. The big guy was still blubbering like a baby. Jung looked at Esther as DSI Burns lifted her up from the floor. Esther, you stupid bitch! Hey, said Wilson, moving towards him. We will not have that kind of language directed at women around here. Burns shook her head. Oh, boy. It'll be weeks of Wilson reasserting his chivalrous credentials. I'm already bored with it. Before Burns could move off, Paul stepped in front of her and Esther. Before you go anywhere, Esther, I just wanted to properly introduce myself. My name is Paul Mulcrone. Esther sneered at him but said nothing. I'm not a cokehead. I'm actually a private investigator. Also, while I have many gay friends and I'm totally, you know, fine with all that, I'm rampantly heterosexual. Burns raised the eyebrow over her working eye. Well, thank you for clarifying that, Paul. In fact, Paul turned around, grabbed Bridget, spun her in his arms, and attempted to snug the face off her. Burns shook her head. Oh, Lord. Phil looked at his feet and offered, He's taken a few wallops to the noggin, by way of an explanation. Paul stood up again, leaving Bridget gasping for air. Rampantly, 
he repeated. Just wanted nothing to do with you, you lecherous old hag. Ah, here, language, said Wilson. Save it, detective, said Burns. He's earned that one. Paul, alarmingly, seemed to be picking up steam. He jabbed his finger at Esther. You cannot go around grabbing people's asses. You, you, you. Paul looked around, trying to find words. Bridget patted his chest. Okay, easy, tiger. You've made your point. Burns pushed Esther towards the door. I think we're all done here. Paul, his whole body still gyrating as if adrenaline was rocketing around his system, turned to watch Esther go. And, and, we will be having lots and lots of sex tonight. Loads of it. Tons of it. Bridget looked up at Phil, embarrassed. Phil looked down at her. He'd better be talking to you. I'm a happily married man. Burns didn't look back as she threw a wave over her shoulder. Well, I'll include that in my report. And not to spoil the fun, but you'll all be getting checked out by medics and then giving statements. So don't go starting your engines just yet. Paul took a big breath. Bridget grabbed him. Sweetheart, you say one more word and the plan you just laid out isn't happening. And I... started Paul before catching himself. Oh, right. Sorry. Paul's face reddened as his brain caught up with his runaway mouth and male ego. It's just... being treated like an object like that. You've no idea. Bridget sighed. We will pretend that you didn't seriously say that either. But you're now officially out of get out of jail free cards. Paul nodded. Yep, right, sorry, soon as I said it. Stop talking. Stopping talking. Bridget gave him a peck on the cheek. Good boy. I'm just relieved you're okay. That was... It wasn't my fault, said Phil, sounding panicked. Paul raised a hand. I know. It was mine. Who knew Bonnie Brook was a thing? They started walking towards the door. Still, said Bridget, this is the final straw. We seriously need to get more staff. We're overstretched. We can't keep getting lucky. Well, said Phil, from what Paul was shouting, you're definitely getting... Shut up, Phil. Sorry, Bridge. Chapter 6 A Special Garment Bridget looked at herself critically in the full-length bathroom mirror. Paul's voice drifted in from the bedroom. Will this be much longer? Bridget turned to the door. It takes as long as it takes. She winced at the edge to her own voice. Sorry. I mean, said Bridget, modifying her tone to a more appropriate, playful one. Patience is a virtue. Paul's tone matched hers. After six weeks, if I'm expected to be any more patient, I might have to start without you. But then you'll miss out on the special garment. Bridget was only halfway in the special garment in question. She had bought it a few weeks ago on a whim when she'd passed one of those shops up off Grafton Street. It was the first proper bit of lingerie she had ever owned. Well, that depended on the definition. She had pants and bras, many of which matched and some of which even had frilly bits, but they were, to a greater or lesser extent, still practical pieces of clothing. This thing wasn't practical in any way, shape or form. In fact, for something so small it had a remarkable number of straps, zips and buttons. 
While doing her best to dampen her feelings of mortifying embarrassment in the shop, she had tried it on. It hadn't fit, but it had almost fit, and she'd bought it. The shop assistant had been rather intimidating, and asked quite a few questions that Bridget hadn't known answers to. She didn't want to say it didn't fit, as there'd have been more questions and more options. Besides, she had been intending to lose a bit of weight, seeing as she'd have free time to go to the gym with Paul being away, so it would be fine by the time of the great unveiling. She had then walked out of the shop and bumped into the parish priest from her hometown who was in Dublin at a conference. She'd stood there making awkward small talk as the assistant had rushed out after her because she'd forgotten her umbrella. It had been quite the moment. So, now it was time for the special garment to charge into action. Only, slight miscalculation, she had not gotten around to losing the weight. The trips to the gym had veered more towards eating takeaways while she watched property show repeats on the digital channels. In hindsight, the boring nature of cooking for one had perhaps led to the odd pizza, washed down with the odd bottle of wine. In short, the bloody thing didn't fit. Added to that, in one of the brief late-night chats she and Paul had enjoyed over WhatsApp, she had mentioned it. It had become quite the talking point. Shite! There was something inherently ridiculous about lingerie. It cost a bloody fortune, and it was the only form of clothing where the better it was, the more likely it was to be taken off quickly. Well, maybe lingerie and those rip-off trousers that male strippers wore. Bridget had only seen such a thing once at Kira's Hendu, and she'd found the whole experience hilarious and yet somehow depressing at the same time. She looked at herself in the mirror again and spoke softly. Just relax, okay? Relax. What? Nothing, she said more loudly. She really had got too used to living alone. Do you want a hand? No. Okay. It had been a stressful day. There'd been the stakeout. There'd been the sickening realization that the stakeout had been outside of the wrong building. The wrong postcode, in fact. Then there'd been the race to the correct location. DSI Burns, wearing a temporary eye patch, had pulled Bridget aside as she'd left Garda HQ and explained that she had managed to make several complaints regarding her driving go away, given the circumstances, but to please try not to hit anyone on the way home. Then there'd been the rescue of Paul, the attempt by that Esther bitch to stab her, and all that followed. She and Paul were checked out by an ambulance crew, and given begrudging clearance to go home, or at least to spend ages giving an interminably long statement at Garda HQ. In the midst of all that, Bridget had spoken to their client James Hammond, who oscillated between rage at his unceremonious exit from the ice cream van and Bridget's refusal to come back and pick him up, and relief that, despite the complications, the operation had been a spectacular success. They'd earned a handsome payday, and while he huffed and puffed, she didn't think even a pompous arse like Hammond would sue them for his bruised coccyx and pride. They had, after all, saved his company a fortune and made him look great in the process. Still, in the briefer, calmer moments she'd enjoyed, Bridget had kept going back to how close they had come to disaster. It wasn't Phil's fault. He was a bit peculiar, but you couldn't question his effort or diligence. Paul had done incredibly well to get them to where he had, even if his inability to decipher the difference between a D sound and a B sound in an Israeli accent had nearly got him killed. Bridget had been working every hour God sent to keep on top of all the other cases the company had on their books. They'd tried to get more help several times over the last year, but it had proven very difficult. They'd had two ex-coppers on the payroll briefly. One quickly decided he didn't fancy the work, and the other had not been keen on taking orders from a woman. 
dinosaur. They'd another licensed female P.I. who it turned out was going above and beyond on certain surveillance jobs. In fact, she'd been using their gear to catch anyone she could having sex, not just the people she was supposed to be watching. Welcome to the 21st century, where women could be perverts too. They desperately needed someone with a full private investigator's license, or the relevant time served in law enforcement. They'd got that initially due to the presence of Bunny McGarry, newly released from the Gardashir corner. He was gone now, and while the private security authority had been understanding given the circumstances, they needed someone to fill the role. It annoyed Bridget to no end that despite all they'd been through, neither she nor Paul qualified for a full private investigator's license yet. She needed to sort it quickly, though as Phil, due to his record, shouldn't have been on the payroll at all. If someone came looking, that could get them in all kinds of trouble. There was one person she'd already approached for the role twice, and he'd turned them down, and that was before his recent loss. Bridget had received a call about that, which she must return soon. In the bedroom... Bridget heard Paul's ringtone of Daydream Believer by the monkeys ring out. Um, should I take this? Be quick, she responded. Right. Bridget gave her makeup one last check. All good. The slight bruise from where she'd tackled that Esther cow to the ground was well concealed. Besides, Paul had several bruises too, although... Bridget had to shamefully admit to herself she found them kind of sexy. Speaking of sexy, she hoiked the special garment into position. Oh, Jesus! She couldn't breathe in the bloody thing. This was a nightmare. Okay, Conroy, hold it together. She just needed to get to the bed, and the thing would be coming off pretty damn fast. She could play off the inability to speak properly by doing one of those sexy voices she found so embarrassing. Besides, one advantage of a garment such as this one was it limited the need for conversation. Paul wasn't the best at picking up the subtle clues, but this wasn't subtle. She slipped her feet into her high heels. Again. Why? And made her way to the door. Here I come, tiger. She said it in a breathy voice, all she could manage in the circumstances. She leaned against the bathroom door in a way she must have seen somebody do in a film, and walloped the alluring up to maximum. There were a couple of reactions she had been expecting, but this hadn't been one of them. On the bed, Paul sat looking at his phone held in his hand, tears running down his cheeks. Jesus, what's wrong? He looked up at her, a look of incomprehension on his face. It's Dorothy. She's dead. Bridget rushed over to the bed to hug him. He sobbed into her chest. As he did so, a button pinged off the back of the special garment and ricocheted off a ceramic pig on the windowsill. Chapter 7 Meet the Muckers The woman on the door directed Bridget to a seat at the back of the room. A little piece of card sat on the chair with her name on it, which was odd, seeing as Paul was the one they'd contacted. They had been called to a place called Gochran House, which was a leafy, stately home-type spread that looked like it got extensive use as a conference centre. Really nice conferences. Management only. Nobody was letting the ordinary staff into a facility with this much brass and mahogany in evidence. Out the window, Bridget could see the grounds of the estate. There were some deer knocking about. She hadn't been sure what to expect, not from the venue so much as the event. The message given to Paul was that poor Dorothy had passed away, and that his presence was requested at 10 a.m. the next day. He had then rung Dorothy's house and spoken to Pang Lee, who'd been her longtime housekeeper come carer. 
Paul had listened numbly as Pang Lee explained how Dorothy had taken a spill and fallen down the stairs. It had happened on the night that Pang Lee and her husband Charlie had been away for a couple of days to celebrate their first anniversary. Paul had consoled her. The poor woman was racked with guilt at having not been there. Dorothy had been many things. Chief among them was being cantankerously and defiantly independent. She had steadfastly refused to have someone else stay or even pop around to check in on her. Bridget looked over at Pang Lee, sitting in the corner, dabbing her eyes with a handkerchief as Charlie wrapped his arm around her. While almost everyone present was dressed appropriately for a mournful occasion, it was noticeable that Pang Lee was the only one who gave any impression of being in mourning. What was also notable was that the other mourners seemed to be in groups of three, and restricting themselves to talking entirely to the people they had come in with. Whatever this was, it was an unusual way to mark a death. She'd half expected that it might be awake, and was relieved when they entered the room to not find a body lying in state. There was, however, a large framed photograph of a younger Dorothy with a man, who was clearly her husband, standing beside the door of the conference room. It struck Bridget that Dorothy had been quite the looker in her day, not in a Disney princess way. Even in the photo, she wore a cheeky grin and gave off an air of infinite capability for independent accomplishment. Bridget wished that she had got to know her better in life. The picture was placed near the door, as there was a massive screen dominating the middle of the room, flanked by two large TVs on each side, and all bound together with enough cabling to tie down Godzilla. There was also a very stressed-looking blonde Asian girl running about and rechecking everything. People had been trying to get a hold of Paul for the last few days. Working deep undercover, he hadn't had his phone with him. He had left it behind when he had assumed the identity of Danny Byrne. Bridget had locked it in a drawer and paid it no attention. Paul had no family, and his circle of friends was limited, mainly to Phil. Johnny Canning and Decky, who collectively helped Paul manage the St. Jude's under-12 hurling team. Several of the parents of the team had the number two, but that was mostly it. The three other lads had been handling team affairs in his absence, which had proven a contentious state of affairs. Bridget had ordered Phil not to go ringing Paul just because there had been some heated discussions about who should play midfield or anything like that. The team had not made the county final, and there had been repercussions. Not from the kids. They'd shrugged their shoulders and accepted that they'd given it a good shot. It was the supposedly grown men who didn't know how to cope with it. So Bridget had put the phone away and let his voicemail fill up. She didn't check it because, well, even allowing for the circumstances, she didn't want to be the girlfriend who checked her boyfriend's voicemail. That felt invasive. Still, though, the St. Jude's family hadn't been the only people who had Paul's number. One other person did. Paul had explained his absence to Dorothy before he'd gone undercover. Bridget remembered that the woman had tried to get Paul to take one of the alarming numbers of antique guns she owned with him. Mind you, she gave him one for his birthday every year, too, all of which he'd given back. When he'd taken his phone out to charge it last night, he'd mentioned that he needed to ring Dorothy, and how he'd pop around later in the week to see her. Then, her number had appeared on his phone. Only it hadn't been her. Bridget's attention was drawn to the conference room's door, where a voice she recognized had just issued a brisk, Fuck a duck! Nora Stokes, her friend, legal representative, and permanently exhausted bundle of nervous energy, had just banged into the large framed photo on the easel. Between Nora and a woman who looked like she worked for the hotel, they'd saved it from smashing on the floor and preventing what would surely be a lot more than seven years of bad luck. The duo wrestled the portrait back into position. That obstacle finally negotiated, 
nor returned, and, ignoring the disgusted looks from the rest of the room, made a beeline for the back seats. She dropped into the chair beside Bridget, labeled Paul Mulcrone Legal Representative, and spoke in an urgent whisper. Shit the bed. That was awkward. Thanks for coming, said Bridget. I hope it wasn't too much hassle to move stuff about. Paul had only received the second call this morning, informing him that he should bring a lawyer. Maybe they'd said it the night before, too. He'd not been taking that much in. Nora waved Bridget's words away. I didn't like working for that bloke anyway. He had breath of a similar paint-stripping quality as I'd imagined the three-headed dog who guards hell has. Speaking of hell, my son has taken to stealing my shoes and hiding them. I'd to bribe the little monster with chocolate this morning to locate two heels that matched. I've a sneaking suspicion he'll be one of those guys who go weird for feet in later life. Bridget didn't really know what to say to that. All kids were weird, but it was getting harder to make the case that Nora's little fella wasn't the weirdest. So, said Nora with a waft of her hand, what is going on here? I'm not entirely sure. Where is Paul? He's in the loo, replied Bridget. He just needed a moment. He had nipped in for a couple of minutes just to pull himself together, although he'd been in there a while. And this, I mean... Nora pointed at the picture she'd nearly taken out as she'd made her entrance. This is because that old lady he used to play board games with has died. Bridget nodded. Paul's relationship with Dorothy was, well, complicated, I suppose. Do you remember how when I met him, he was doing sort of community service by visiting Alzheimer's patients in hospital? The granny whisperer stuff, said Nora. Yeah, nobody's forgetting batshit mental stuff like that. Well, he got hired to pretend to be Dorothy's grandson. Really? Yeah. Her asshole grandson, Gregory, assumed she was dying and wanted to make sure he was in the will. He paid Paul to visit her and say he was him. Bridget wasn't 100% certain, but she pegged him as the guy sitting front right with the leggy blonde on one side of him and Toad of Toad Hall in human form on the other. And she had Alzheimer's. No, said Bridget. She'd had a stroke. She was confused for a while, but made a full recovery. That's not uncommon for stroke victims. The brain repairs itself. And then she presumably realised Paul wasn't her grandson. Yes, but they both sort of... kept playing along. Nora grabbed Bridget's arm. He kept pretending to be her grandson. She looked around the room suddenly nervously. I don't want to worry you, but sitting in this room right now are some of the most highly priced solicitors in the country. If this is about to get ugly, then I needed a lot more of a heads up than this. Relax, said Bridget. They both pretended, but she knew who he really was. Believe you me, Dorothy was as sharp as they come. She might have looked like a little old lady, but she had a mind like a steel trap. The two of them played board games every Monday evening, and more often than not, she kicked Paul's arse, and he definitely wasn't letting her win. And, oh yeah, she shot a hitman sent after us that time we were hiding out in hers when Jerry Fallon was trying to kill us. Nora nodded. Christ, of course! Yes! How'd I forget that? This woman was a badass! Yep, agreed Bridget. She was also the closest thing Paul had to a family. How is he taking it? asked Nora. Hard. Bridget felt bad, because while she'd liked Dorothy, and had known how much she and Paul enjoyed their time together, it never really dawned on her how important the woman was to him. In her defense, Paul probably hadn't realized it either. He was an orphan, and Dorothy was his, well, 
whatever name you gave it. She was his family in the realest sense of the word. His only family. He'd grown up alone since his mother's death when he was twelve. And much as she loved him, Bridget was more aware than anyone that Paul had some abandonment issues. This coming so soon after Bunny disappearing from their lives for good, it had hit him hard. Poor guy, said Nora. And who are all these people? Nora indicated the other people sitting down. Apart from Pang Lee and her husband, there were nine other guests present. Now that Nora had pointed out the lawyer thing, suddenly it made a lot more sense. She was looking at three couples, each with a lawyer riding shotgun. Outside of the man she'd pegged as Gregory, the arse who'd hired Paul to pretend to be him, she vaguely recognized a couple of the people present, too. They were famous in that most modern of ways, that wasn't linked to any form of achievement or ability. I'm assuming they're Dorothy's actual family, said Bridget. Nora pointed at the man with the long black hair who was wearing a battered top hat and leather pants. Hold the phone. Isn't that, what's his name, the rock star? Tristan Arturo. I think rock star is pushing it. Well-known fuck-up might be a better word for it. The man in question was sitting slouched across two chairs, staring up at the ceiling with a vacant expression. Between him and the uncomfortable-looking woman in a business suit and a sour expression, who was obviously his lawyer, sat a portly man with a beard that made him look like one of the dwarves from Lord of the Rings, and a ponytail that made him look like a man who didn't own a mirror. The beard was irritably jabbing at his phone. Is he related to Dorothy? Tristan, I guess, said Bridget. I know that contestant number two is Tristan's sister, so that'd make sense. Bridget pointed in the direction of Charlotte Macon, nay Graham, and her husband Gavin. Christ, said Nora. I've seen those two on something, haven't I? Doesn't she sell people ten euro water for a living while spending four hours a day getting her nails done? Yeah, basically. Man, said Nora. The people in this room make my exes look like a bunch of high-achieving go-getters. What a collection of... Bridget grabbed Nora's hand as Paul finally entered the room. Shush! Here he comes. He looked around, and before joining Bridget and Nora, took a brief detour to express his condolences to Pang Lee. They embraced, and then Paul turned and headed down the aisle, sitting beside Bridget. Nora reached across and patted his knee. Sorry for your trouble. He nodded back. Bridget leaned in. You okay? Yeah, fine. Bit weird seeing all these awful people in one location. Present company accepted. Nora turned in. So, what is the deal with the family? Family is the wrong word, said Paul in a whisper. The word parasites is a better description. Dorothy couldn't stand any of them. Right. The door opened, and a woman in her seventies wearing a bright red dress walked in. A short man, who was presumably her lawyer, followed in her wake. Christ, said Paul. Speaking of which... That's the ex-wife. The who? said Bridget. Dorothy's late husband, Gerald. He was married before her. That's his ex and... Paul waved his hand about. Those are the three grandkids. Dorothy's step-grandkids. The ex-wife nodded briefly towards two of her grandchildren, and then sat in a front-row seat. Fuck me! This is somewhere between Jerry Springer and the final episode of Dynasty. It was lucky, thought Bridget, that Nora was good at the law, as bereavement counsellor would have been a terrible fallback gig. Which one is? 
Nora got cut off by a man in his late fifties walking in. Holy crap! Conrad Dockery! That'll be all the highest paid lawyers in the city in one room. You only see that at an awards ceremony or a funeral. Nora looked over at Paul. Shit. Sorry. He waved her apology away. Conrad Dockery stood at the front and swept his gaze around the room before speaking. He was a trim man with black hair speckled with grey and intense green eyes. As he spoke, he stood perfectly still. Bridget had seen a TV program about this. Almost everyone fidgeted, but not Conrad Dockery. He had the ironclad poise that Bridget guessed people followed into battle, and juries followed wherever it led them. Thank you all for coming. I apologize for the short notice, but we had some trouble contacting all relevant parties. He looked around at the screens. This morning will be unusual. I would appreciate your indulgences. Well, I think it is probably best if we just proceed and deal with matters as they come up. He nodded at the blonde Asian girl who sat behind a laptop near the window, a look of intense concentration on her face. That lady over there is Miss Sharma. She has been engaged in the slightly unusual process of preparing Mrs. Graham's will, as it contains what you could call an audiovisual element. So, without further ado, he took a seat to the side of the large central screen and nodded at Miss Sharma. In your own time? The girl nodded and started typing, the big screen bursting into life. From the speakers, they were treated to thirty seconds or so of what Bridget was fairly sure was Meatloaf's Bat Out of Hell. And then the music stopped, and Dorothy appeared on the screen, looking directly down the camera, beaming a wide, gleeful grin. Hello, Mother Muckers. I'm back. Chapter 8 Where There's a Will Paul took a firm grip of Bridget's hand as Dorothy's smiling face beamed down at them from the screen. It was the weirdest of feelings. He'd spent the last twelve hours getting used to the idea that she was dead. And then here she was, live and in technicolor. The distinctive jam jar glasses making her sharp eyes look all the bigger. Seeing her now felt like a jab in the stomach, a harsh reminder of what he had lost. She sat in an armchair that towered over her small body. Paul recognized it as her favorite one from her lounge. Her voice came out of several speakers placed around the room, crystal clear, so the edge of excitement in it was there for everyone to hear. Paul had zero experience of the reading of wills but he was fairly sure the deceased rarely looked this delighted about it. Dorothy adjusted her glasses. I would say thank you all so much for coming, but let's be honest, quite a few of you are only here as you've not got a grave to dance on yet. It's a shame we can't turn greed into electricity, as there's enough in this room to power the entire city. Still, I'm dead, and you, muckers, appalling as it is, are the closest thing I have to family. As if being spoken to by a dead woman wasn't peculiar enough, Dorothy slowly looked around the room, as if looking each person who was there directly in the eye. Muckers, whispered Nora. Bridget leaned in. She swears like a docker, but sticks M's in to be polite. Dorothy's image, having finished its staring contest with the rest of existence, smiled expansively. Paul recognized the look. It was the one she gave right before she moved a piece and ripped your metaphorical heart out. So, let us get on with the reading of my will, then. 
shall we? Objection! shouted the lawyer sitting with Gregory. Conrad Dockery stood up with a sigh and nodded at Miss Sharma, which resulted in the image of Dorothy's face freezing on the screen. Objection? said Dockery, with a subtle undertone of contempt. You realize, Philip, this is not a court of law. Nevertheless, I shall make sure the judge that isn't here notes your outburst. Now, if you... Thank you, Conrad, I am aware of the location. Still, this, he said, pointing at the screen, is not a valid legal document, as it is not properly witnessed. Thank you, Philip. It has been a while since anyone has lectured me on the law. It is most refreshing that you would do so. Well, I... Might I suggest you let Mrs. Graham get more than two lines into proceedings, and you can then make a more informed judgment? Or you and your client could leave now, but I assure you, this is happening with or without your presence. Toady looked at his client, who gave a curt nod. He adjusted his waistcoat and sat back down. I just wanted to get my objection on record. Wonderful, said Dockery, with a slight smile. There is no record, but I'm sure the rest of the room feels better for knowing your feelings. Miss Sharma, if you'd be so kind. The picture unfroze, and Dorothy resumed speaking. Now, given the propensity of all my dearly departed Gerald's descendants to sue everyone, including each other, I'd imagine the room is rammed with mucking lawyers. So, without further ado, gentlemen... Dorothy waved her hand, and the four TVs that surrounded the big screen sprang into life. Each one showed a different distinguished man, staring uncomfortably into the camera. I present to you the Dorothy Graham isn't a mucking loon backing singers. I'm sure you all know them, each a distinguished so-and-so in their field. But so there is no doubt. They are. Dorothy pointed off screen to her left, and the bald and rather jowly gentleman on the far left spoke. Professor Richard Darnall, brain surgeon, MBBCH, FRCS, SN. Dorothy pointed to the right, and the man on the far right screen spoke. Paul Dannel, consulting psychologist, MBBCH, BAO. M A M S C D C P M or C Psych H Dip. Back to the left. Hugh Bracken, Professor of Law, Trinity College, LLB, LLM, Lund, FTCD, Barrister at Law. And right. Malcolm Clark, Mrs. Graham's GP for over thirty years. M D. Thank you, chaps, said Dorothy. And all chaps, annoyingly, just shows the mucking disparity in the professions, even now. Ludicrous. With that, she picked up what looked like a baton and held it triumphantly in the air. Paul knew that it was in fact a wand. Dorothy had gone through quite the Harry Potter phase a couple of years ago, and he'd got it for her as a present. He and Pang Lee had secretly hoped that Dorothy might carry it about in her housecoat, instead of a loaded firearm, but it hadn't taken. And now, continued Dorothy, waving the wand in the air dramatically, if you would all be so kind. She tapped it on an invisible lectern. A one, a one, a one, two, three, four. The four men started speaking in almost perfect unison, as Dorothy waved both hands in the air, as if conducting a choir. The date is February 28th, 2019, and I... Dorothy, in full conductor mode, pointed at each of the screens in turn, 
as each man said his name again. Then they all rejoined the chorus. Do solemnly swear and bear witness that this video will of Dorothy Graham recorded on this day is being completed after a thorough examination in which I have assured myself that she is in good health and mentally competent. This I do so witness. Thank you, boys, said Dorothy, giving a brief bow of her head. Take five, and we'll come back and start running through that rendition of For the Longest Time. The backing singer screens went blank, leaving Dorothy on her own again. Bless em. They're not the greatest of the harmonies, but they have skills in other areas. Disconcertingly, Dorothy then looked down at exactly where Dockery was sitting and spoke to him. So, Conrad, dear, would you like to take this moment to deal with any moaning muckers in the room? Dorothy picked up a cup of tea and sat there enjoying it, as Dockery stood and looked around the room. Paul guessed he wasn't wild about being part of this whole show, but Dorothy was a woman of incredible willpower matched only by her financial wherewithal. Trying to talk her out of something she had set her mind on was nigh on impossible. Dockery sighed. Let us go around the room. He glanced at Toad of Toad Hall. Seeing as we've already heard from you, Philip. He pointed at the diminutive lawyer who sat at the front, beside Gerald Graham's ex-wife. Arnold? The man spoke with a pronounced lisp. How do we know this tape has not been edited in any way? Thank you, said Dockery. That is a fair question. Each of the four men you've just heard testimony from have a copy of the full recording on a... Dockery looked at Miss Sharma for a moment. What is the... Data stick, she said. Thank you. A data stick. It was given to them on the day, and they are all happy for anyone to verify it. Any other queries? The man gave a curt shake of the head, and Dockery moved his attention on to the lawyer who was sitting beside Tristan Arturo and his hairy companion. Miss Stripe? She looked across at her client, who waved his hand nonchalantly. No, I love it, man. Multimedia. Groovy. Thank you, said Dockery. He moved his gaze onto Nora first, and then the bald man who sat with Charlotte and Gavin. The lawyers each shook their heads in turn. Finally, he looked back at Toadie. This is most irregular, he said. I agree, said Dockery. Paul was guessing these two didn't spend much time hanging out at the weekends. But seeing as irregular is not a legally defined term, or a cause to deny the providence of a legal document, it will never stand up in court. I see, said Dockery. Do you doubt the credentials of the witnesses, or do you believe they might all be lying? Paul glanced at Nora as she made a bad attempt at suppressing a giggle. Well, I... I wouldn't say that. No, said Dockery, given as I have checked, and you have used three of them multiple times as expert witnesses in court. I imagine you wouldn't. In his peripheral vision, Paul saw Nora gleefully miming somebody delivering a killer blow to a fallen opponent. Well, said Toady, I have also been asked by my client to express his wish that we move seats. We are sitting in direct sunlight, and his wife... Dockery shook his head. The seats have been allocated, as should be clear. Mrs. Graham has put a lot of planning into this presentation, even down to the seating. I suggest, if you'd like to be elsewhere, stopping needlessly objecting would move things along. Toadie's client whispered something in his ear. 
The lawyer sat back and folded his arms huffily. Very well. Dockery turned to look at the screen. He stood there awkwardly as Dorothy ate a chocolate hobnob and finished the rest of her cup of tea. Then she looked at her lawyer. So, Conrad, are we finished? Yes. He glanced at the rest of the room. She insisted that we have a scripted... Right, said Dorothy, interrupting Dockery from beyond the grave. Let's crack on, then. Dockery sat back down self-consciously, like a man who dearly wanted to be elsewhere. So, said Dorothy, let's deal with the easy stuff first. Pangley? She looked around the room. Pangley, are you here, girl? Stand up, dear. Nervously, Pang Lee stood. Dorothy looked at the pre-allocated seat where Pang Lee was located and smiled. You and your new husband, Charlie, who I have grown to tolerate, Pang Lee laughed nervously, are not part of this family. She made the bunny ear quotation marks in the air to emphasize her point which is to your unending credit. I hired you several years ago as a maid, and you have not fulfilled that role. Pang Lee's face dropped. No, said Dorothy. Instead, you have become a friend, loyal companion, and a constant comfort to me. While heaven knows... Taking care of a cantankerous old munt like me must have been hellish. You did it with a plum, girl. You took care of my house as if it was your own. Well, it is now. Congratulations. You are the proud owner of an eight-bedroom pile surrounded by dreary, rich, mucking mastards. Pang Li held her hand to her mouth in shock. Gasps and exclamations issued from the rest of the room. Dockery stood and raised his hands for quiet. Sell it, keep it, turn it into an Airbnb, continued Dorothy. Do whatever the hell you like with it. You're a rich woman now. My one piece of advice to you would be to learn to give zero mucks what anyone else thinks. You are now in the position to do so. Pang Lee looked at her husband, her eyes watery. Oh, and Charlie, said Dorothy. Charlie stood up beside his wife and touched her arm. As I've made you fully aware, I don't consider you good enough for my Pang Lee. He nodded. Paul had discussed this several times with Dorothy. But she is insistently fond of you, and as a friend pointed out to me, Paul could have sworn she glanced in his direction. I don't think any man is good enough for the role life has blessed you with, so I'm going to trust you to make her blissfully mucking happy for the rest of her life. Fail to do so, and rest assured, I shall haunt you for all eternity. He nodded and smiled. Good, said Dorothy. Pang Lee, if you'd like to punch out any of Gerald's awful descendants, I have left a further provision in my will that says we will cover all your legal costs from doing so. Pang Lee looked around the room, embarrassed. Dorothy looked at Conrad Dockery. I am now obliged to point out that Mrs. Graham really has left detailed instructions regarding just that. He held up a document. Objection, said Toady. It also covers counsel, said Dockery pointedly. Holy crap, whispered Nora. I think I bloody love this woman. 
Paul found himself laughing as he looked up at the screen, where Dorothy was sitting with a big grin. Go on, my girl, knock some mother mucker out. She threw a right hook at the air. Pang Lee shook her head, embarrassed, and sat back down. I know she probably didn't do it, added Dorothy, but nobody is perfect. By the way, Conrad will represent you on my dime if any of the awful people present sue you in an effort to take what is rightfully yours. Go well, sweet girl, and thank you for all you have done for me. Pang Li nodded at the screen again from behind the tissue she was now using to soak up tears of joy. Moving on, said Dorothy. I requested that Victoria, my dearly departed Gerald's ex, to be present. I do so hope she is. Paul noticed the woman in the red dress stiffen. Her hatred for me is matched only by mine for her. But she needs the money, and she knows Gerald, God rest his soul, was as soft as Mahit. Before we get into that, though, we should really run through some family history. This was greeted by a groan that Paul couldn't attribute to any one person. It was more like the room collectively expressed dread. Gerald and Victoria were married in 1962. The screens sprang into life, showing pictures of a grandiose-looking wedding. She was sort of rich, but Gerald, well, the Graham family were mucking filthy rich. Is this necessary? chimed in Victoria's lawyer. Dockery, clearly getting fed up, shrugged at the question and pointed at the door. They had one son, Connor. A picture of a fat child of about six months, with a red face, appeared on screen. Victoria heroically stayed home to raise him, with only a small team of servants, while Gerald joined the family business and worked hard under the guidance of his elder brother, Terence. A picture of a large factory that Paul vaguely remembered from his youth appeared on one of the side screens. It had been abandoned when he'd known it, and it was now long gone, replaced by apartments. The first Gerald knew of the company's problems was when poor Terence played terminal tonsil hockey with a shotgun. It turns out his big brother hadn't been the businessman he pretended to be, and they were up to their ears in debt. Gerald had been left holding the bag, which was empty. Within three months, the business was bankrupt, and Gerald had lost everything. Well, almost. Dorothy stared daggers at the seat Victoria occupied. Although he lost the rest when his wife ran off with an Italian count. The screens now showed pictures of Victoria standing with a heavily tanned man on the deck of a yacht. She even managed to get the marriage annulled thanks to the count in question having some pals in the Vatican. And all Victoria had to do to seal the deal was to trash her former husband's reputation with the most horrible of lies. As awkward moments went, sitting in a room with the video image of a dead woman glowering down at the woman who had destroyed her husband was fairly high on the icky factor. Paul shifted in his seat. Victoria defiantly stared back at the screen. The only person present who seemed to enjoy this was Nora, who looked like she wished she'd brought popcorn. Dorothy looked back into the camera and smiled. Gerald, bless him, took to walking around Stephen's Green of a day, looking at the flowers, a lost soul. One day, he met a girl from the bookkeeping department of Regan's, and they got to talking. He was a sweet, 
sweet man, who could spend hours talking about flowers. He'd been this way from a young age, spending his free time following the family's gardener about, endlessly peppering the poor man with questions. Three months later, the bookkeeper and the broken man married in a low-key ceremony. The screens now showed a young Dorothy, arm in arm with Gerald. The wedding, a noticeably more humble affair with a few friends. They didn't get a honeymoon, as they took the tiny amount of money they could scrape together and opened up Ireland's first garden centre. He did the plants, she did the books. Dorothy's eyes misted over, as if she was now speaking to the past rather than to her audience. A picture appeared on the screen, showing the happy couple with arms full of potted plants. And they were happy. By God, they were happy. Successful, too. Soon, they needed a bigger sight. Then two, four, thirteen sites. People of all walks of life now could own their own houses, and it turned out they all wanted a nice garden. And so it was, the new and improved Mr. and Mrs. Graham were back in the high life again. Dorothy gave a wide smile before adding, The old Mrs. Graham, or Mrs. Arturo, as she was now known. The screens changed to show a picture of the smiling man shown earlier, being escorted down steps in handcuffs, surrounded by a braying mob. Well, it turns out that the Count was found guilty of tax evasion. Screaming headlines in Italian filled the screens. Victoria was now having a terse, whispered conversation with her lawyer. In Italy, continued Dorothy with relish, do you have any idea how hard it is to get convicted of tax evasion? It's like their national pastime. We object most strongly to this, said Victoria's lawyer. Yes, said Conrad Dockery. I'd imagine you do. And so it was that Victoria returned to Ireland, tail between her legs. Gerald, faced with the woman who had left him and then tried to destroy him, agreed to support her. That was the kind of man he was, forgiving to a fault. Despite it all, incredibly, Victoria still acted like she was ashamed of him. The venom in Dorothy's words was there for all to see. Still, Gerald financed her, even stated as part of his will that she should still be supported with an allowance even after poor Connor had left us. He's... started Bridget. Yes, said Paul quietly. He died in a car crash a few years ago. And despite it all, Victoria bats her eyelashes and pushes a version of events that makes her look like a cross between Jackie Onassis and Princess Grace. Fucking diabolical! said Dorothy. Everyone noted the lack of an M in that last statement. Victoria's lawyer stood up this time. Can we forward past the character assassination and half truths? Conrad Dockery just pointed at the screen in answer. So, said Dorothy, now that I'm dead... She's no doubt wondering what she gets from the Graham family estate. Dorothy said the last line oddly loudly. The reason for this became clear as the door flew open, and four men, dressed in full garden gnome outfits, complete with beards and fishing rods, marched in. You have got to be kidding, said Nora, not even attempting to lower her voice. The four men came to a stop in front of the screen, Dorothy looking down on them like a benevolent god. 
the first of the quartet, took a whistle out of his pocket and blew it. The others started harmonizing with it. They all took a knee and extended a hand in Victoria's direction and started singing in four-part harmonies. Victoria, 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 Victoria! They stood, hand on the shoulder of the man in front, classic barbershop quartet choreography, and swayed as they sang. Behind them, Dorothy was once again waving the wand like a baton. We are gathered here today because we've something big to say. Dorothy wants you to know you can sling your hook and go. Hope you saved a few bob, or else you'll have to get a job. The message here is really clear. Our words are oh so, so sincere. What we're trying to say, things have not gone your way, because you are about to get F U C K. They held the note of K for a very long time. Paul had never seen a barbershop quartet before, but these guys seemed to be pretty good. Fuck all. Your income is about to fall, fuck all. You've gone and lost it all, fuck. It was at this point, Victoria got up and stormed out, pushing the picture of Dorothy and Gerald to the ground on her way past. The quartet looked at each other, unsure if they should continue. The sound of shattering glass had rather put them off. Behind them, Dorothy was still waving her wand in time with the music. Victoria's lawyer stood, his face now beetroot red with rage. This is an absolute disgrace, he pointed at the nearest singing gnome. And we'll be suing you as well. The lawyer stomped out after his client and slammed the door behind him. The female member of hotel staff, who had helped Nora earlier when she'd nearly knocked the framed photo over, a foreshadow of what just happened, now stepped forward and placed an identical picture in an identical frame on the easel, standing proudly above its shattered twin. Paul looked at it, and then back at the screen. Dorothy had always been masterful at planning several moves ahead, but she was really outdoing herself with this. On the screen, Dorothy waved her baton for a few more seconds, and then, with a final flourish, put it down. Ladies and gentlemen, the fine harmonies of the four horsemen of the acapella lips. They're available for parties. One of the four horsemen took business cards out of his pocket, looked around the room, and decided against it. Nora stood and delivered an enthusiastic ovation, complete with wolf whistles. Incredible! Bridget dragged her back into her seat as Conrad Dockery looked at her. Yes, thank you, Miss Stokes. The a cappella gnomes looked around the room awkwardly. Gentlemen, said Dockery, nodding his head towards the corner. The gnomes nodded and disappeared behind the screen. As they did, Dorothy started speaking again. So, how far did she make it through the song? I really hope there is an afterlife, so I could have seen that. Anyway, as for the rest of you, as you know, my Gerald stated in his will that he wished the family fortune to go to a blood relative. I've decided to accede to that wish. So if you want to get your grubby little hands on the Graham family fortune, it's very simple. Three of the singing gnomes re-emerged from behind the screen, each holding a gnome in their hands. Each of the grandchildren is about to receive a gnome. I make my own gnomes, as, of course, none of you knew. Most of the time, I just give them away as presents. Paul had three. Dorothy 
not being one to ever see a garden gnome as anything but an excellent gift for someone who lived in a third-story flat. But these gnomes are more than just gifts. They are your invitation to a competition. Dorothy's smile was ear to ear as she spoke. It starts tomorrow, and the winner of it will get the lot, the whole kit and caboodle. Enter, don't enter. Entirely up to you. The gnomes were handed out, accompanied by a great deal of heated discussions amidst the various trios. Paul watched with a sinking sense of dread as the fourth member of the four horsemen of the Acapellalypse reappeared, holding a gnome in his hands. Along with everything else it represented, they really didn't have the shelf space for another gnome in the flat. You shall be joined in that competition by Paul Mulcrone. At this point, the lawyers for each grandchild were on their feet screaming, Objection! In a display of synchronicity, even the four horsemen would have appreciated. Dockery stood again and held his hands out. Ladies and gentlemen, please. That man is not part of this family. Gregory turned and jabbed an accusatory finger at Paul. He's a charlatan and a fraud. Either side of him, Bridget and Nora were on their feet. How dare you, said Bridget. Yeah, followed Nora. Particularly ironic, given your recent history. You were actually charged with fraud. There was a clamour, as everyone spoke at once, until a loud wolf whistle of a piercing volume caused everyone to turn back to the screen. Dorothy looked to the camera again. Again, I'm only guessing, but I bet there's a lot of squabbling going on now. She glanced at where Dockery was standing. Conrad? Dockery ran a handkerchief over his brow, and then, holding his hands out to appeal for calm, he spoke. All three of you are involved, as you are the last descendants of the Graham family lineage. Toady went to speak, but a look from Dockery stopped him in his tracks. However, there is also the matter of Dorothy and Gerald's son. He isn't, started Gregory. They never had a... Silence, barked Dockery, out of patience with the whole thing. They did, in fact, have a son, Andrew. He was born prematurely and died two days after his birth. Bridget turned to Paul and spoke softly. Did you know? Paul shook his head. He hadn't. At the time of the will, Dorothy was Andrew's only living blood relative, and so she nominated someone to represent him on her behalf. She has chosen Mr. Mulcrone. This was met with grumbles. Complain all you like. Mrs. Graham is within her rights to leave her wealth to anyone. She is under no actual legal obligation to give it to any of you, so now... He was interrupted by Dorothy speaking again. So, all four of you, if you want the prize, get to nominate somebody else to join you in a team to compete in my humble little competition. And fair is fair. They get half. She spread her hands in a fan as she spoke and Paul recognized the gleam in her eyes. This time, she looked directly at him. This is my dying wish. One final game for all the marbles. The fourth horseman moved down the room and handed Paul a gnome. He took it while numbly looking up at the screen. Dorothy's grin was once again that one she got when she had you right where she wanted you. She clapped her hands once, like the Roman emperor she could well have been in a past life. Let the games begin! Chapter 9 And Another Thing The following hour was a heady mix of awkward social situation blended with legal wrangling. 
and watching Nora hitting on the four horsemen of the acapella lips, who she was old enough to have at least babysat for, if not quite given birth to. Paul and Bridget stood out of the way at the far end of the hallway, as various lawyers took turns angrily pointing in Paul's direction, while Conrad Dockery explained the same basic points again and again. As far as Bridget could tell, the main thrust of his argument could best be summed up with the phrase, It's Dorothy's money. She can do what the hell she likes with it. Pang Lee and Charlie had stayed for a while, mainly to talk with Paul. The funeral was scheduled for the following Sunday. Dorothy had left detailed plans. Of course she had. Dorothy had seemingly been planning her own death for a large part of her later years of life. This is all very... said Charlie. Then he stopped, stumped for how on earth to describe this. Pang Lee gave a sad smile. This is all very Dorothy. Paul nodded. It really is, the mad old bat. She placed an affectionate hand on Paul's arm. How are you doing? Oh, you know. It must be hard, though, having only found out about her passing last night. Paul shrugged. It's all a bit unreal, I suppose. And now you're in this competition. Paul shifted uncomfortably. I don't want Dorothy's money. I might not do this thing. Pang Lee nodded. Right. Only... What? She glanced at Bridget before speaking. Nothing. Only... Come on now, said Paul. Don't make me quote Dorothy about the importance of speaking your mind. Well, it's just... Pang Lee looked around and lowered her voice. The reason Dorothy put you in this competition is she doesn't want any of her step-grandchildren getting their hands on the inheritance. She hated them. She hides it well, Bridget chimed in. What I don't understand, said Charlie, is if she hates them so much, why is she giving them the chance to win it? Paul nodded. She wants to prove a point. The woman loved to prove a point more than anything. Well, that and winning. Pang Lee nodded again. I'm guessing the point was that those awful people think that they're better than everyone else, and she wants them to lose. Paul sighed as he finished the thought. To a working-class fella who was given none of the advantages they got in life. Ah, crap. I have to do this, don't I? It was Pang Lee's turn to shrug. It is up to you. We should go. The four of them exchanged hugs, and then Bridget and Paul were alone. He looked out the window as some deer ran by. I have to. No, said Bridget. You don't. I really don't want her money. Then don't take it. You could just not do it. Or you could do it. Win and give it away. That'd piss the parasites off more than anything. It's up to you, though. Bridget placed a kiss on his cheek. What was that for? She smiled. I don't need a reason. Let's just hope we can leave here soon. Conrad Dockery had asked them to stay so he could have a chat once he had dealt with the hissy fits and histrionics of the Graham family tree and their legal eagles. Nora walked back over to them. So, said Paul, happy to have something else to talk about. You seem to be getting on well with the whatchamacallits. The four horsemen of the acapella lips, she said gleefully. Well, as it happens, I'm a big fan of vocal harmonizing. In fact, 
I once had a dream about a barbershop quartet where— We don't need to hear about that, interrupted Bridget. Prude. Not to be, you know, all clienty, continued Bridget. But should you not be over there fighting Paul's corner? There's no need, said Nora, softly punching Paul on the arm. Mr. Mulcrone here is in that competition, whether they like it or not, and everybody knows it. So why are they all arguing then? asked Paul. Because, said Nora, everyone over there is paying their lawyers an eye-watering hourly rate and they're trying to prove to their clients that they're not being ripped off. By having a pointless argument, said Bridget. Welcome to the wonderful world of law. Some arguments you win, some you lose, but you fight every one that's billable. You aren't, said Bridget. You're paying me way less, said Nora. And if that tenor rings me, I'm not going to charge you for this at all. Oh, said Bridget. Thanks, I guess. Don't mention it. If the baritone rings, I'm paying you. Please, said Paul. Let's not discuss your sex life in front of the gnome. They all looked at the garden gnome that Paul still held in his hands. It was an ordinary, if very well-made one on first glance, that is, until you noticed it was winking and carrying a six-shooter. She had her own kiln, or whatever they called it, he said. She designed the moulds, got them specially made. Charlie would do the clay bit, and then she'd paint them. She liked doing them as when she and her late husband were just starting out. They'd work twelve-hour days and then come home and do gnomes to relax. A look from Bridget stopped Nora making the joke she was about to. Bridget patted Paul's arm. Well, said Bridget, it's a nice way of remembering her. Memorable. Not compared to the rest of this, said Nora. I know you two have not been to many will readings, but it may surprise you to know they aren't normally this interesting. Really? said Paul. What bit was out of the ordinary? The dead lady's video presentation? Or the slamming of the X through the medium of barbershop quartet? Nora never got the chance to answer, as Conrad Dockery waved at them and signalled for them to follow him back into the conference room. They sat at the front this time, the room being empty save for them, Conrad Dockery, and Miss Sharma. Thank you for waiting, said Conrad Dockery. I appreciate it has been a long day. He glanced at his watch, and it isn't even lunchtime. As I'm sure Miss Stokes has informed you, should you so desire, you will be in this competition. Despite the protestations, nobody can prevent you from being so. I should inform you... Gregory Graham is about to report you to Angardashiakona for fraud. Bridget grabbed Paul's arm. Conrad Dockery raised his hand for quiet, as all three of them went to speak. Please relax. I have a signed affidavit from Mrs. Graham, clarifying that she always knew exactly who Mr. Mulcrone is, and that he has never asked her for money. In fact, I can personally attest he has turned down the offer of money on at least three occasions, to my knowledge. Bridget and Nora both looked at Paul, who could feel himself redden. I never wanted her money. She was my friend. Conrad Dockery nodded. And Mrs. Graham was clearly very fond of you. In fact, she left another message for you. Before we get to that, though, I should formally ask. Each of the four eligible participants may name someone to be on their team for the competition. Do you want to— Bridget, said Paul. 
He turned and looked at her. Ah, hang on. We don't even know anything about this competition. Doesn't matter, said Paul with a smile. Who else do you think I'd rather go through this with? She smiled back at him. Okay. Then she looked at Dockery. What can you tell us about this competition? Almost nothing. You'll be based here for a few days. Bring a few changes of clothes and any medication you require. You shall not be allowed to leave here unless as part of the competition. What is this? asked Bridget. The Hunger Games? The... Conrad Dockery, for the first time that day, looked unsure. I'm sorry. I don't know what that is. It's a book and a film. Ah, I see. It has passed me by. Nevertheless, I can't tell you any more about what is to come, although I can say that Mrs. Graham was very keen that you enter. Paul nodded. Okay. We're in. Excellent. That then brings us to... I'm afraid this is awkward. Mrs. Graham left a second message, specifically for yourself and Miss Conroy. About the competition? asked Bridget. Dockery bobbed his head from side to side a little. Tangentially... I think it best if you see it first, and then we discuss it. He stood up and went to the door, checking outside to make sure nobody was standing nearby. Once done, he nodded at Miss Sharma, who pressed a few buttons, and the main screen sprang to life once more. Dorothy sat there, only this time dressed in one of her ordinary housecoats, and the air of demented glee wasn't there. She cleared her throat. Hello, Paul, and I'm assuming, Bridget. If you're seeing this, then not only am I dead, but you've just sat through the reading of my will. Her face lit up briefly. I hope it properly put the wind right up those awful mucking parasites. Her face darkened. If you're seeing this, well, I'm leaving whether or not you do up to Conrad. But obviously he felt you should. I may be a paranoid old loon, but... She glanced around herself. Something isn't right. For the last few days there's been... Well, there's been movement in the shadows. Somebody is up to something. I'm sure of it. I went to a funeral, and we were followed. Then at home, well, I've seen them. I have. I'm being watched. I don't know who it is, but somebody is on my trail. She looked into the camera with the kind of devilish intensity that even now Paul found it difficult to look at. Maybe I'm a mad old duffer, but something is rotten in the state of Denmark. She sat upright. Mr. Mulcrone? She only referred to him by his second name when they were debating a rule. Assuming much hasn't changed, I am ahead in Risk and Scrabble, while you lead in Gin Rummy and Monopoly. Let us call it Tide, shall we, for the sake of simplicity? She smiled a broad smile. It was to be that this game, my humble little competition, was to be our final one. For us to decide once and for all on a winner. Paul felt his eyes well up as Dorothy smiled at him. However bonus round. With the assistance of the fair Miss Conroy, I would like you to find out who killed me. 
Nora swore under her breath. I know, continued Dorothy. Maybe I'm a mad old biddy and nobody bumped me off. But if I'm right, then you're about to spend several days in the company of the only people with a motive. I do love a good murder mystery. She nodded at the camera again, and repeated herself, softly this time. Let the games begin. Dorothy froze in the picture. Paul and Bridget looked at each other. Now, said Conrad Dockery, I have informed the police of Mrs. Graham's suspicions. They have assured me that there is no suggestion of foul play in her death. It appears that she tragically fell down the stairs in her own home, which was locked up and alarmed. I also brought this up with Mrs. Walker and her husband. Who? asked Bridget. Pang Lee, said Paul. Yes, said Dockery. And she said that while Mrs. Graham was very nervous and paranoid recently, they checked and rechecked and they couldn't find any evidence of anything. Mr. Walker drove them to that funeral, and he further stated that he didn't see anyone following them when she said it. The Guardi have informed me that the CCTV system, which covered every entrance into the property, had been on all night, and the recordings show nothing untoward. Bridget folded her hands in her lap. But? Conrad Dockery gave her an assessing look. Why do you think there is a but? Because, replied Bridget, you wouldn't have shown us this if you were 100% certain that her suspicions were baseless. Dockery gave her the briefest of nods. It is a matter of timing, really. Mrs. Graham used the services of Ms. Sharma for all of her recordings. As you have seen earlier, Paul looked across at the girl who blushed and nodded solemnly. She contacted her to record this message, and Miss Sharma came over that very day to do so. Conrad Dockery shifted in his chair, and then looked Bridget directly in the eye. That was the day before she died. Fuck a duck, said Nora. Yes, said Dockery. Quite. Paul looked at the lawyer's somber expression, and then back up at the screen. Dorothy sat there, frozen in time, looking back at him. The grief that had been gnawing away inside him shifted, turning into something else. Even if there was a chance. He gripped Bridget's hand, and spoke to no one in particular, or maybe... Someone who was no longer there. Challenge accepted. Chapter 10 Flowers D.I. Jimmy Stewart retired, stared down at the flowers. His wife didn't like flowers. She hated the idea of a beautiful thing being pulled out of the ground and given to her so she could watch it die. She'd only confided this to him, though, as the kids would give her flowers every Mother's Day and every birthday. Each time they were greeted with flapping and cooing about how lovely they were. Jimmy knew that his children considered him to be terminally unromantic because he never got their mother flowers. What they didn't know was that on anniversaries and birthdays, or just because. He would often nip into a garden centre and buy her a pack of seeds. The woman loved to grow and nurture things. Nobody else knew Jimmy did that because it was none of their business to know such things. It was private, between the two of them. Still, he looked down at the flowers. 
It seemed somehow rude of him to move them, even knowing what he knew. People felt they needed to bring something, leave something, as they wanted to show their respect. The woman had been loved, no doubt about that. The funeral had been large, and the tears had flowed. A lot of the people in attendance he'd not even known. It just brought home to Jimmy how full the years she'd been given had been. As well as raising four kids with a largely absent workaholic husband, she'd led a busy life, working in the community, helping out, just being someone who cared. The woman loved to grow and nurture things. I'm supposed to... Jimmy stopped and looked about himself embarrassed. This was a stupid idea. He'd said as much, but then the lady had insisted. He needed to start processing, apparently. He stood alone in the graveyard, at least when it came to people. There were two dogs running about the place, seemingly ownerless. A poodle and what looked like a mongrel with a bit of cocker spaniel in it. He'd been told by his daughter Sharon that they didn't say mongrel anymore. It was supposed to be a mix or crossbreed. Jimmy didn't get that. He understood that language changed, and he didn't want to ever be someone who used the wrong words for people. But dogs? Who were you offending? The dog didn't bloody care. It just wanted feeding and a rub on its tummy. Besides, Jimmy had always considered himself a bit of a mongrel. He took pride in it. It had been quick. A blur, really. Two weeks before they were supposed to go away on the trip of a lifetime, she'd not felt well. The diagnosis had been as fast as it had been bad. Cancer. She'd taken it with the good grace with which she had greeted all of life. She'd pulled the kids together and calmly explained it to them. They had taken it the ways you'd expect. Sharon, histrionics, panic, looking for the magic potion. Denise, practical, emotions held in check. What's the next step? Cahill, calm, quiet, buttoned up, ever his father's son. Veronica, just quietly holding her mother's hand. Not that he thought any less of them for it. Grief wasn't a simple thing. He himself had not slept for three days. He'd read pretty much everything on the Internet. Then he'd hit the library. Then he'd gone to the doctor with her and asked questions. He'd gone back without her and asked even more questions. There had to be a way. There had to. She started chemotherapy two weeks later. She'd reacted badly to the first treatment and passed the next day. It happened sometimes. Sharon had wanted to sue the hospital, but Jimmy had known enough to know. Life being unfair wasn't their fault. It just was what it was. He'd been sitting holding her hand when she'd passed. Still, he had a hard time believing it. When they'd had the wake, it all felt surreal, absurd almost. That body wasn't his wife. Why were they having to pretend it was? She had been life and energy and laughter. Whatever that was, it wasn't her. He'd gone through everything. Shaken all the hands, nodded at all the kind words, patted the tearful faces on the shoulder. He knew it disconcerted the kids that he hadn't cried. Not that he was holding it in. It just hadn't happened. He wasn't going to force it. Grief is a personal journey, and he wasn't willing to take directions off anyone else, regardless of how well-meaning they were. When it had all been done and dusted, 
All the rituals followed and kind words said. He'd found himself sitting alone in his kitchen. He realized it wasn't his. Not just the kitchen, but the whole house had been hers, filled to bursting with her energy, her love. Now it felt as empty and meaningless as that body had. She had been his home. He'd been out of ideas. Until the age of sixty, he had been a copper, and that had been what defined him. Once they'd taken that away, he had been his wife's husband. They were supposed to be making up for lost time. He had always known that his dedication to the job had cost her as much as it had him. Now was supposed to be the payback. The kids had tried to get him to go on the trip they had planned, but Jimmy had straight up refused. Walking down the beach without her, seeing the Basilica in Rome, the pyramids in Egypt and the Taj Mahal, those had been her dreams. He'd been happy to go with her, to enjoy her joy. Without her, it would have felt like a cruel joke. No. He stayed home. Sharon had argued a refund out of the travel agent because that was another of her skills. He'd felt a bit sorry for them. His daughter was ferocious when motivated in a terrifyingly logical way. It was like getting ravaged by a calculator. Absent of any idea as to what else to do, he'd started watering his wife's roses and reading up on them. She had loved her garden. Her rose bushes had won an award. She'd pretended to be uninterested and embarrassed by it. But the trophy was still up there on the mantelpiece. And so Jimmy had taken on the task of trying to keep alive the life she'd left behind. It was not going well. The whole thing had the feeling that he was playing all the right notes just not in the right order. He had no feel for it, no matter how hard he tried. A gardener, he was not. Jimmy didn't have hobbies. He didn't really know how to make friends. He was sixty-two now, and dogs made him sneeze. What the hell was he supposed to do with his life? He noticed the poodle heading his direction. Go on, shoo. Get out of it. He looked around and then back at the grave. So, they told me. Well, this woman that our Sharon made me go see. She said I had to come and talk to you. I feel ridiculous. I thought talking to graves was just something they did in films. Feels like a lazy device, to be honest. But this woman, Cassandra, said I had to. Cassandra. Just hearing the name, you can tell she likes them dangly earrings, can't you? You'd have liked her, though, I suppose. You liked everybody. He glanced up to see the two dogs, standing three rows of graves over, watching him. Maybe they were wondering what the weird old man was doing, talking to the ground. Jimmy shrugged. They probably had a point. He was only here because of the thing. Stupid, really. Everybody was overreacting. He'd been driving little Catherine home from playgroup to help Sharon out when some dipshit in a BMW had pulled out right in front of them. Jimmy had hit the brakes and hopped out of the car. The wanker had zoomed off, and he'd stood there shouting after him. Only he'd not stopped. Long after the beamer had disappeared over the hill and was a memory, he'd stood there shouting invectives at it. Screaming, really. He didn't remember a lot of it. A couple of the mums from the playgroup had approached him and got him to take a seat on the curb. Somebody must have called Sharon, because she turned up. Jimmy didn't know how long he'd been there. His only firm memory from the whole thing 
had been the terrified look on little Catherine's face. Sitting in her car seat in the back, looking scared because she didn't know what was wrong with Grandad. He tried to brush it off, but they weren't having it. All the kids had ganged up on him, even Cahill, and he'd agreed to go see this Cassandra woman, grief counsellor. That was what it said on her door. He'd considered not going, but Jimmy was still Jimmy. He'd built a life on doing what he said he'd do. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. So he'd gone and talked. And Cassandra had talked. She said he'd been difficult, and he had agreed. He'd been considered an awkward sod throughout his life, and he doubted he'd mellowed with old age. Just because the world didn't want him any more didn't mean he didn't get to have an opinion on the world. She'd latched onto that, though, hadn't she? Not wanted by the world? What made him say that? He'd been through thousands of interrogations in his time. Therapy was the same principles applied in a slightly different manner. She'd thought she'd got him on that one all right. This Cassandra woman, said Jimmy. This'll shock you. She says I'm the most exhausting patient she has ever had. Jimmy laughed. Fair play. She's probably got a point there. Remember when Jacobs said that time how I seemed to want to make it my life's work to be an awkward sod? I guess he had a point, right enough. Jimmy looked up. Go on, piss off! Jimmy looked down at the grave again. Sorry, love, that wasn't aimed at you. There's two dogs over there and they're sniffing at each other. It's a bit distracting. Jimmy glared at them. He gave a head faint, but neither of them moved. Cocky sods. He did, however, feel himself getting woozy, the world swaying slightly, as if he was on a boat and the seas had just got a bit choppy. Jimmy took a couple of steps back and placed his hand on the gravestone of the plot behind. He took a few deep breaths and then stood up again. Don't be worrying about this. It's just a thing. Doctor says I've got something called labyrinthitis. It's a balanced thing. Means I get dizzy. I'll be fine. I'm on tablets for it. Daft, really. Of course, Cassandra says it's all in my head. Says it is stress and all that. It's a middle ear thing. That shrinks for you, though. When all you've got is a hammer, everything is a nail. I bet if she was a chiropodist, it'd be because I've not treated me bunions properly. Jimmy looked up at the darkening grey clouds above moving his head slowly so as not to set himself off. Honestly, love, people just need to leave me alone. You more than anyone know that I don't enjoy being told what to do. Jimmy smiled to himself. Well, by anyone except you. You always got a free pass on that one. Still, though, do I want to join this organization? That group? Bridge? Bridge! Why the hell would I want to go playing bridge? Jimmy lowered his eyes. Ah, here, get out of it! Jimmy stepped towards the two dogs, and then on instinct bent down to find a stone to throw. Feck off, you little! His balance deserted him, and his legs buckled causing him to crumple down onto his knees. Feck's sake! He kneeled there, his hands crushing one of the bigger floral displays that festooned his wife's grave. He picked it up and hurled it toward the dogs. Piss off! Jimmy closed his eyes and just knelt there, breathing hard, trying to right himself. Sorry, love. Sorry. Them dogs. 
They're over there shagging. Seems inappropriate. Jimmy put his hand to his mouth and burst out laughing. When he started, he couldn't stop. Tears rolled down his cheeks. Eventually, he regained control of himself, running the sleeve of his jacket across his face to wipe the tears away. Would you look at the state of me? Can't stand up, talking to a grave, and hollering at a couple of dogs who are trying to get their ends away. Ain't this a picture? He looked at the gravestone, only then admitting to himself that he had been avoiding looking directly at it. I guess they're right, huh, love? I don't seem to be dealing too well with all of this, do I? I guess... I don't know. I guess I just always thought we'd have time, but, well... Now you're gone. How am I supposed to... I mean... Jimmy glanced to his left again. Jesus, they're really going at it now. God! Do you remember that couple from Kilkenny when we'd gone to West Point for that holiday with the kids when they were young? I nipped out for a ciggy and saw them at it. Then the next night, same thing happened. We had to keep the curtains closed because the dirty sods enjoyed being watched. I remember you said, if he was so keen on being seen, you'd think he'd shave his hairy back. I wonder if these two dogs are the same. He glanced across at them again. Maybe it's reincarnation. Go on, feck off back to Kilkenny, you hairy back pervs. Disconcertingly, the poodle dismounted and ran off, leaving the mongrel sitting there, giving Jimmy an admonishing look. Well, said Jimmy, that was weird. He looked back up at the sky again. I should probably get out of here before it starts raining. I've got to call a taxi and you know what they're like. Jimmy sat back on his haunches and looked at the soil under where the wreath had sat before he'd launched it. Do you think when they told me to come and talk to you, do you think I'm supposed to, like, hear something back? He'd never been the most spiritual of people. In fact, he'd always considered himself an atheist, although he'd kept away from that thought since she'd passed. He was an atheist, but, you know, still Catholic. The kids had all been baptized and all that. She'd gone to Mass, but that was more of a social thing than anything else. On a weekday morning, the local parish priest could rattle it out in under twenty and she'd be outside for an hour catching up. Jimmy sighed. To be fair, it's not like we don't both know what you'd say. Get on with your life, Jimmy. Look at the state of you. You've always been a fighter. What are you doing giving up now? That's not the man I married. He ran a hand through his hair and noticed the first drops of rain starting to patter down on the flowers in front of him. I know all of that. I just... I don't know how. I had a couple of offers to do something, but I... I mean, I'm not the private investigator sort. If we wanted to catch people at it, well, we could have got the chalet beside that dirty Kilkenny couple. I'm a copper, and I'm your husband. And I'm not saying I was great at either, but at least those were the only two things I wanted to get better at. Now, I just don't know, love. What use am I to anyone now? Jimmy felt the phone buzz in his pocket. Oh, hello. Who can this be? Even's odds it's Sharon ringing up for one of her three daily check-ins. Denise, unlikely, not in work hours. Coggle, he usually rings Sunday. Veronica, not unless she needs money. And then, well... Jimmy stopped talking as he looked at the screen on the phone. 
Then he looked up at the grave. Jesus, love. You used to be a lot more subtle than this. He looked at the screen again, his finger hovering over the green button to answer. The name on the display said, Bridget Conroy. Chapter 11 An Inspector Calls Bridget looked at her flip chart and then she looked at her watch. Almost 7 p.m. Jimmy Stewart struck her as the kind of man that would be on time. She was a little nervous. She was about to brief a proper policeman. All right, well, at least a retired proper policeman. A detective inspector, no less. They'd first met just over three years ago in an interrogation room, when she'd been a nurse giving a voluntary statement about the death of one of her patients. She'd also been an obsessive fan of crime fiction with a secret desire to become an investigator in her own right. And now she had. She was running a private investigation agency, MCM Investigations, and damn it, she was good at it. It already handled some big cases, not least of which was stopping a massive industrial espionage incident from happening the day before. She kept reminding herself of all of this because, well, Jimmy Stewart intimidated her. Paul had driven out to pick Jimmy up as he couldn't drive himself because of the labyrinthitis. Bridget was worried about Paul, too. All that had happened was an awful lot for him to take in. Oddly, that was something he and Jimmy had in common. Bridget had met the Stewart children at the funeral of their mother. Sharon, the eldest, sought Bridget out. She had known about Bridget's unsuccessful approaches to Jimmy to join MCM Investigations, and pulled her to one side in the church hall where the post-funeral reception was held. You need to hire my dad. Excuse me? Dad. You need to hire him to join your investigation company thing. He's already turned me down twice. Keep asking until he says yes. Bridget had been lost for what to say to that. Sharon all but pinned her into a corner, and she was clearly emotional. Look, Dad is a wonderful man, but he's going to need something to do with himself or... Well, I don't know what'll happen. Bridget felt awkward. I mean, obviously, if he changes his mind, we'd love to have him. Don't take no for an answer. Bridget looked into Sharon's face and saw nothing but earnest concern looking back at her. Okay, but I can't make him. You can. You have to. I'll push him. You pull him. We can get it done. Right, said Bridget, because more than anything in that moment, she'd wanted to say anything to stop Sharon looking at her like that. The woman had a ferociously intense energy that made Bridget feel like a rabbit in the headlights of an oncoming articulated lorry. She was a teacher, and Bridget would have laid good money that nobody ever pissed about in the back of her class. And so it was that two weeks later, Bridget rang and offered Jimmy the job again, and was turned down again. She'd rung again this morning, and managed to get Jimmy to accept the offer by essentially not making it. She was in dire straits. She and Paul had to report back to Gochran House at 9 a.m. the next day, and from the limited information they had, they would be held there for at least the rest of the week doing God knows what. Admittedly, they'd be there with the three main suspects in the possible crime they would be investigating, but still, they'd need somebody out and about looking into the crime itself. They had Phil, and he was great, but a man who excelled at certain tasks. He was a master of surveillance, possessed of a zen like ability to spend however long it took following someone until he got the pictures he needed. What he wasn't was a leader. She couldn't send him out to actually investigate something. 
Jimmy huffed and puffed. He couldn't drive because of his balance issues. Not a problem. Bridget had the perfect man to drive him around. In fact, Phil had been dropping a lot of hints about getting training. Or at least, he'd thought he had been dropping hints. Phil didn't really get subtlety, so his idea of a hint was saying loudly to nobody in particular, I should get some training. His status as being technically a non-member of the MCM investigations team meant it was tricky, very tricky. It wasn't like they could send him on a course. Phil couldn't get a license to be an investigator due to his criminal record. All minor stuff when he'd been a young man, and from what Bridget had heard, he'd been terrible at it. Some people aren't cut out for a life of crime. He was, however, remarkably good at certain aspects of the investigator life, even if they had to list him as driver. Still, working with Jimmy Stewart, that'd be the best on-the-job training he could get. Phil hadn't seemed enthusiastic when Bridget explained all this to him, but it was hard to tell. Enthusiasm wasn't something Phil Nellis really knew how to pull off. He had the perpetual demeanour of someone who was expecting to get smacked in the face at any minute. Their previous attempts at recruitment not sticking meant that Phil was all she had, if herself and Paul were out of the picture. Hence why she'd twisted Jimmy's arm. Bridget had kept meaning to get around to finding somebody else, but, ironically, with Paul working undercover for the last few weeks, She'd been far too busy to do it. Jimmy at least agreed to come into their office to be briefed on the case. She'd just have to impress on him that P.I. work wasn't all chasing cheating hobbies and getting proof of fraudulent insurance claims. Speaking of being impressed, she had to hope that the children would behave themselves, in particular the two in the reception area. She opened the door of her office and carried the flip chart out. Hello, Bridget, said Phil. Hello, Bridget, said Decky. She hired Decky against her better judgment four months ago. He'd lost his job at a bakery because of what he described in the interview as a yeast-based disagreement that we'd rather not go into. They just needed someone in the office to answer the phones and take messages. How hard could that be? As it turned out, quite hard. Bridget had been out of the office most of the time, so it took her a while to realize that Decky had been turning down cases he didn't like the sound of, not to mention offering a great deal of unsolicited advice. This came to a head when a friend of Bridget's sister-in-law Mentioned trying to hire MCM investigations, only to be told that if her husband was cheating on her, she'd want to just perform some amateur surgery on the gentleman in question to solve the issue. Bridget had wanted to fire Decky there and then, but Paul talked her out of it. He'd had a word. There was an improvement, but Decky was still more of a hindrance than a help. His issue was that he appeared to be full to bursting point with opinions, and oblivious to how frequently and emphatically these opinions were proven wrong. The man had the kind of self-confidence that could stop bullets, or at the very least convince him to walk into the path of one, in a state of absolute conviction that it would. Bridget could not fire him while Paul was undercover, and so, instead, after extensive negotiation, as, again, Decky wasn't capable of getting his head around the idea that someone else was actually in charge, he finally agreed to take messages and not, under any circumstances, offer opinions, advice, or guidance of any kind. Decky had recently taken to expressing the opinion that having him stuck behind a desk in the office all day was a bad use of resources. That, Bridget actually agreed with, but not in the way Decky meant it. Then there was the other thing. Bridget 
plonked the flip chart down. No, I'm grand. No need to help, but thanks for asking. Bridget turned around to see Decky and Phil staring at each other. Bridget sighed loudly and pointedly. Really? We're still doing this? Could you maybe talk to each other like grown-ups? I have no wish to speak to the receptionist, said Phil. Office manager, said Decky. You can't just make up your own job title, says the driver. Right, said Bridget. I'm so sick of this shit. Both of you, shake hands, and for the love of Christ, start behaving like professionals. Not until he apologizes, said Phil, not for the first time. For what? said Decky indignantly. You know what? It took all of Bridget's self-restraint not to throw something. Oh, for... Do the two of you even remember what you're arguing about anymore? Well, said Phil, we were having a meeting to select the team for the... It was a hypothetical question, Phil, said Bridget, the anger in her voice finally causing him to break eye contact with Decky. Oh, right. Sorry. Do you know what his problem is, boss? So help me, Decky, do not finish that thought. Phil jabbed a finger at him. You say it. I dare you. I double dare you. Both of you, shut the hell up now. Decky looked up at Bridget from his position behind the desk, and then back at Phil. He has no understanding of the fundamentals of... Get him off me! said Decky. Chapter 12 Briefed Paul looked across the roof of the car at Jimmy Stewart. Are you all right? Jimmy gave a terse nod. Just give me a second. The balance goes funny, particularly if I've been sitting down for a while. Sure, said Paul. Jimmy was breathing in deeply and standing with his eyes closed. Paul took out his phone and looked at it, trying not to look like he was waiting. After a few more breaths, Jimmy nodded. Okay. They started walking out of the car park. So how long have you had this? Too bloody long. It's irritating as all hell. As they walked, Paul could see the sway in Jimmy's gait. If you didn't know better, you'd think he was pissed. Only Jimmy Stewart didn't drink. As they made their way around the corner out of the car park, Jimmy placed his hand against the wall for balance. Paul wasn't very good at small talk. But it was that or awkward silence. How long do they reckon it'll take to clear up? Few weeks. Right. Paul placed his fob by the reader on the main door and pushed through. The offices of MCM Investigations were up on the first floor, above the offices of Wilkes Architecture, which was already closed for the evening. Paul heard a crashing sound from upstairs. He jumped the steps two at a time and pushed open the door. What the? He was greeted by the sight of his girlfriend and the company's only two employees rolling around on the floor in the reception area. Decky and Phil were attempting to have a fight, despite neither of them having the first clue on how to do so. What they were effectively doing was having a really aggressive hug. What the hell is going on here? Jimmy Stewart was one of those people who had been born in control of the situation. At his own birth, he'd probably thanked the nurses for all their hard work, instructed his father to put that cigar away, 
and then taken care of cutting his own umbilical cord. You couldn't teach the tone of voice he used. It was just something you had. It wasn't a shout. It didn't need to be. It cut through all surrounding noise and spoke directly to that part of the brain that kept track of how much trouble you were in. Phil and Decky disengaged and pointed at each other. Both of them opened their mouths to speak, but Bridget cut them both off. Right, both of you, out of here. What? said Phil. Go home, right now. But I'm supposed to be here for the briefing. Yes, Phil, you were. Then you and this other idiot started wrestling on the floor, and now you're both getting out of my sight by the time I count to five, or so help me, you'll not have a job by six. But, started Decky, now. Decky and Phil filed past Paul and Jimmy and stomped down the stairs. Bridget forced an embarrassed smile at Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. Is now a bad time? Sorry, the lads have a bit of a personal issue. Yeah, I can see that. I haven't seen a fight that vicious since me daughters fell out about a dolly when they were six. Bridget cringed. Well, you know, always good to have some muscle on hand. Cup of tea? Not that they could have got worse, but things improved considerably once they'd all taken a seat, and Bridget had started her briefing. Jimmy had produced a notepad and taken copious notes as Bridget had spoken. She had gone through who Dorothy was and her rather complicated relationship with Paul. To his credit, Jimmy had just raised an eyebrow and nodded. Bridget had then briefly mentioned Pang Lee, explaining her role as caregiver come housekeeper. Jimmy raised his hand. So this Pang Lee lady, she was given Mrs. Graham's house? Yes. Right. Jimmy started writing in his notebook. Paul leaned forward. Just to be clear, she's not a suspect. Why is that? said Jimmy. Well, she wouldn't have killed Dorothy. As I understand it, there's no evidence anyone killed Dorothy. Right, said Paul, looking at Bridget. And it's very possible nobody did. But if it did happen, it definitely wouldn't have been her or Charlie. Says who? Jimmy turned the page in his notebook and licked the tip of his pencil and waited. Well, I mean, I do. Why? Paul looked at Bridget. Well, because... Or let me put this another way, said Jimmy. Okay. Qui bono? Why is he talking about Bono now? Bono, said Bridget, not Bono. It means who benefits. Bridget had read more than enough crime novels to know that phrase. Jimmy nodded. Exactly. A woman got a house. That's motive. But she, started Paul. I get it, said Jimmy. You think she isn't the suspect. Respectfully, if I'm investigating this, then I'm investigating this. Everyone is a suspect until they're not. But... Jimmy looked up at Paul. If it's any consolation, you're a suspect too. Why am I a suspect? Qui bono, repeated Jimmy. I really wish you'd stop saying that. Bridget stepped in. I think what Jimmy is saying here, Paul, is that he has to keep an open mind. That's why we're bringing him in. Fresh pair of eyes and all that. Paul's brow wrinkled. Well, yeah, but exactly that. We're bringing you in. 
Why would I agree to bring somebody in to investigate if it was me? Jimmy counted on the fingers of his left hand. One. Bridget doesn't know you did it, and you can't arouse her suspicions by objecting. Two. You're hoping I'll push attention elsewhere. Three. You're so arrogant you think I'll never catch you. Four. You're assuming that I'd like you enough to ignore if you were involved. Paul tried to jokingly interject. I'd have misjudged that badly, apparently. Jimmy shrugged. It's not personal. It's process. He extended his thumb. Or five. You're just mad in the head. I once worked a decade-old missing person case. Wife kept demanding we find her husband. Kept pushing. Wrote to politicians, the commissioner, even Kay Bourne, screaming for justice. Turned out he was buried in her allotment the whole time, because that's where she'd put him. She all but led us there. People are mad. Okay, said Paul. Well, now I'm starting to think I did do it. Bridget laughed. I get your point totally, Jimmy. But obviously, Paul, he isn't really saying you're a suspect. Jimmy looked at Bridget. You're one, too. Why am I one? Qui bono. Stop saying that, said Bridget. But... Jimmy closed his notebook. Look, if you'd rather not do this, that's fine. I've got a jigsaw puzzle on the go. No, no, said Bridget quickly. We absolutely want you to investigate this, and you can do it any way you want. Jimmy nodded. All right, then. So you were going to tell me about these three grandkids? Bridget looked at Paul, and then back at Jimmy. Right. Yeah. Chapter 13 Morning Has Broken Bridget yawned. She wasn't much of a morning person. To be honest, she didn't really understand what one was. Being chirpy and thrilled to be out of bed at 7 a.m. on a bitterly cold March morning wasn't natural. As far as she was concerned, being a morning person was an undiagnosed form of mental illness. The seven other people sitting around the long table in the nondescript meeting room in Gochran House didn't have a great deal in common. But they all at least appeared to not be morning people either. The whole experience was more than a little weird. Bridget had been briefing Jimmy Stewart on these people just the previous evening, and now here they were sitting around her. Not that any of them were talking. They sat in the kind of cold silence that could keep meat fresh for a very long time. Of the eight people present, Tristan Arturo, real name Terence Graham, was the most relaxed, what with him being unconscious and snoring loudly. He was wearing a top hat, a leather waistcoat, and leather pants. He looked like he'd come dressed as Slash from Guns and Roses, but he just couldn't carry it off. There was a baby-fat squishiness to the face and a lack of chin that made him veer away from the bad boy look he was going for, and more towards bad date. When Bridget had researched Tristan, there had been an abundance of material. He was quite the tabloid darling. All this despite having released one and a half poorly received albums over a twelve-year career. He was the youngest of the Graham grandchildren, and the enfant terrible of the Irish music scene, although he was getting a little long in the tooth to keep claiming that title. Now in his thirties, Bridget reckoned the word man-child was really more appropriate. He had moved briefly to L.A. and London, before quickly returning to Dublin both times as, according to press interviews, that was where his muse spoke to him. More than one observer had noted it probably had a lot more to do with nobody in either city giving any kind of a shit who he was. 
infamy hates anonymity. His most noticeable musical achievement had been the featured vocalist on a track called Headcase by DJ Movement, which had become a surprise summer smash in Ibiza a couple of years ago. Tristan had rambled for three hours into a mic high as a kite, and the producer had found a few key phrases and looped them over a beat. Somewhere the dead members of the Beatles were revolving so fast in their graves there was every chance they'd have a reunion at the centre of the earth. Beside Tristan, his manager sat stabbing at his phone, just as he had been the day before. He held it up and wafted it around. Bridget had already noted that the reception here was dreadful. The Beard introduced himself as Manny P., Tristan's manager. Bridget had been the only one to shake the offered hand, despite her dislike of anyone who made their second name an initial. The accent had been Australian. The hand had been sweaty. Bridget was taken aback that Paul hadn't been civil, but she let it slide. He was wound up every which way. Grief at Dorothy's death, mixed with her assertion that she had been murdered, had left him taut as a coiled spring. On the far side of him sat the second of the Graham grandchildren, Charlotte Graham named Macon. She seemed to use both names at different times, as well as the odd double-barreled appearance. She hadn't been short of media presence either when Bridget had gone looking. While Bridget had known already who she was, and was dimly aware that she was related to Tristan Arturo, she hadn't realized that either of them were related to Dorothy until yesterday, if you could even call step-grandkids related. Charlotte was an influencer, a thoroughly twenty-first-century phenomenon where someone's value was linked to their social media following. She had anointed herself as a lifestyle guru espousing minimalist living, yoga, and all manner of other health kicks. Seeing her up close, Bridget would have bet money that her ageless complexion, some basic maths showed she must be pushing mid-thirties by now, was not all down to healthy living. Credit where credit was due, her plastic surgeon had been worth however much she'd paid for him. Charlotte denied ever having gone under the knife. Her nose had apparently got smaller all by itself. She sat there, unenthusiastically sucking on some kind of shake that smelled utterly foul. Beside her, guzzling down a double dose of the same concoction, sat her husband, Gavin Macon. His massive frame squeezed into the chair. He had the body you only got by spending hours a day in the gym. A former rugby player. His career had come to a crashing halt following the ignominy of being the first Irish player to fail two drugs tests. He had been a beast in the school's game, his power and bulk making him a man against boys. Then, from what Bridget had read, he'd graduated to the professional ranks, become a man amongst men, and struggled mightily. His response to being picked on by someone his own size was to bulk up. The initial failed tests, and the second one on the stalled comeback, had both been furiously denied. Just last year there'd been a write-up in a sympathetic magazine about how Gavin now knew that supplements he'd unknowingly taken had killed his promising career. Others had been considerably more sceptical. Still, his marriage to Charlotte had received extensive coverage in the glossy magazines, and had turned them into an Irish power couple. Never mind an envelope. They'd turn up to the opening of an email, if there was the hint of a camera being in attendance. The papers had a lot of space to fill, and they photographed well. The press had jokingly given the couple the Brangelina-style nickname Chavin, only for the couple to adopt it. They'd even had a logo made and registered it as a brand. Chavin, Inc., now had two gyms open with several more on the way, all of them built around the Chavin TM philosophy of combining healthy living with meditation and exercise. 
All of this came with products that would help to achieve this Zen state of enlightenment and physical perfection. Things like a specially designed yoga mat, which couldn't be as remarkably similar to every other yoga mat ever made as it looked, as otherwise the price tag would have been ludicrous. Bridget had received a bottle of the Chavin TM perfume a couple of years ago in the Secret Santa at work. It smelled curiously like cat's piss. And then there was Gregory. He had the vibe of a man who was permanently pleased with himself, despite there being no evidence indicating why he should be. He gave the word smug a bad name. He, too, had recently got himself in the papers, although unlike his estranged siblings, he'd not gone looking for it. Quite the opposite. They had caught his company doing some very dirty and highly illegal deals screwing pension funds out of their rightful returns by shifting shares around between funds, so that the right ones made the most profit. Gregory had only avoided jail by being the first rat off the ship, giving his associates up to the authorities as part of the bargain to save himself. Bridget assumed this had resulted in him being ostracized by the former set he had run with. But who knew? Maybe that level of cold-blooded self-preservation was admired. Physically, he had more than a passing resemblance to Prince Andrew, although maybe that was just the whiff of scandal that surrounded him. His wife, Irina, on the other hand, was tall, blonde, and striking. A Russian national, she'd been a model before branching out into interior design and philanthropy, at least according to Wikipedia. Bridget wondered if the woman was now thinking she'd backed the wrong horse, given Hubby's recent missteps. She was staring at a plastic potted plant in the middle of the table, like she was expecting it to blink first. Bridget wouldn't bet against it. The woman had the air of a velociraptor in killer heels. Arena caught Bridget looking in her direction, and Bridget tried a polite smile that was met with a piercing stare from brilliant blue eyes. She felt sorry for the potted plant. Thankfully, before Bridget could burst into flames, the doors opened and Conrad Dockery walked in, flanked by a man and woman in sharply tailored grey suits. He stood at the top of the table. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. Can I just state started Gregory. No, said Dockery, without even looking in his direction. Your solicitor has made your numerous objections crystal clear. That you are here does rather indicate that you realize they have no legal basis. In response to this, Gregory's mouth flapped open and closed in outrage, like a fish that had just been slapped in the face with another fish. Dockery looked at the dozing figure of Tristan at the far end of the table. It really would be beneficial if everyone was awake for this. Mr. Arturo? Tristan didn't stir. Manny sighed. All right, I'll wake him. Just give him a bit of room. He can get a bit flaily. Manny, looking like a dog that expected to be hit, sidled closer to Tristan, and began to whisper, Tristan? Tristan, buddy? Wake up. Come on now. Manny squealed and dived to the floor as Gavin slammed his meaty fist onto the tabletop. Tristan calmly awoke, bleary-eyed, and looked around the room trying to place where he was. <sighs> what I miss? Manny clambered back into his seat. Nothing, Trist. It's all good. You just had that thing about your granny's man. Manny stopped himself and glanced around. You read that thing about your grandma. All right. Heavy. Tristan nodded, sat back in his seat, and then, remembering himself, readjusted himself until he was sitting in a cooler position that offered poor back support. Excellent, said Dockery. 
Moving on. You have all been assigned rooms in the hotel. Gregory's hand shot up. They are entirely identical in every way. It came back down again. You can expect to be here for the next four days. During that time, you and your partner will be asked to compete in a series of physical and mental challenges that have all been determined by the late Mrs. Graham. You shall be awarded points for these endeavors, and the three teams with the highest scores, once all seven challenges have been completed, shall compete in a final event to determine the winner and recipient of the entirety of the Graham family fortune. Dockery referred to a card in his hand. These challenges shall be filmed and put on a YouTube channel with commentary provided by... He wrinkled his nose. Mickey and Spanner? He turned to one of the grey suits. Is that correct? The suit nodded. Really? said Bridget. Sorry, said Charlotte. But Gavin and I must insist on complete control of our media output through all channels. Gavin nodded. I understand, said Dockery. I'm sorry to hear you won't be competing. What? But... Charlotte looked around. I mean, who even are those guys? Mickey and Spanner, said Bridget. You know the two guys. They do those videos, like the one with the blind bull trying to get on the cow. The entire table looked at her blankly. You know, she continued, realizing attempting the voice was a terrible idea just as she started. Jesus, Mickey, he's mounting the tractor. The blank expressions shook their heads. Bridget turned to Paul. You've seen it, haven't you? Paul shrugged. I guess it must be more of a country thing. They're massive, said Bridget. You must have seen it. It's been all over social media. She looked around. A room full of faces, stretching from incomprehension to indifference to outright indignation, looked back at her. She shook her head before adding under her breath, Fecking dubs. To continue, said Dockery, you will receive a briefing before each individual event, but prior to that, you will be obliged to complete the indemnifying waivers my colleagues are about to hand out. Gregory's hand shot up again as the two grey-suited minions began distributing paperwork. A copy of it has been sent to each of your solicitors, and you may speak to them between now and midday to discuss any concerns you have. But I assure you, as the person who drafted them, these contracts are both fair and comprehensive. Gregory's hand came down. Paul's went up. Dockery nodded at him. Yes, Mr. Mulcron? Sorry, I just... If Bridget and I are going to be on this YouTube thing, we occasionally have to work undercover. Ah, yes, said Dockery. Mrs. Graham thought of that. She did? Dockery nodded and opened his briefcase. He took something out of it and tossed it down the table. Bridget looked at the two luchador-style Mexican wrestling masks that sat on the table in front of her. One was in the green and gold of Leitrim, where Bridget was from, and the other in the dark and light blue of Dublin. You're kidding. No, said Dockery. Take it from me, Miss Conroy, that I am not a man given to levity. Mrs. Graham left some remarkably detailed and, let's say, unusual instructions. Paul picked up the blue mask and laughed. She did love the wrestling. Apparently so, agreed Dockery. Speaking of which, 
She also left instructions as to what your names should be. He looked at the grey-suited female. Queen Bee and Sidekick Boy. Yes, said Dockery. But. You've got to be kidding, asked Paul, already knowing the answer. He looked pointedly at Bridget, who did her best to hide a smile. Don't look at me. She was your friend. Paul's grumbles were drowned out by Gregory. Excuse me, sorry. Why do those two... He managed to inject more invective into the words those two than Bridget would have imagined possible. Get to have their identities protected, and the rest of us don't. A murmur of agreement greeted this point. Well, said Dockery, I'm only speculating on Mrs. Graham's motivations here. But I'd imagine the nature of their work, as previously stated, was a factor. Then there's the fact that the rest of you being related to her is a matter of public record. But honestly, I don't think we should rule out that she enjoyed the idea of humiliating you all in public. This was met with an increase in her rumfing. Now, if there are no further questions... You will be shown to your rooms where you may read through the paperwork and phone your legal representatives. We shall reassemble down here at twelve sharp, at which time your phones, laptops, tablets, electronic devices of any kind shall be taken off you for the duration of the visit. This time Charlotte's hand shot up. Sorry, but sorry, but no, I can't possibly. I have a responsibility. We asked you to clear all work or social commitments for the week, responded Dockery. Yeah, but... Dead air. Do you know what that means to my Insta-following? Charlotte looked like she'd just been informed the loss of a limb would be required. I'd like to speak to the manager. This got a raised eyebrow out of Dockery. I'm sorry. I want to speak to your manager, repeated Charlotte, Gavin nodding in support. I see. I'm afraid in this situation, I am the manager. Charlotte shook her head. Your boss, then? The only boss I have here is Mrs. Graham, and she is unavailable. But... Charlotte looked close to tears. No, I'm not doing it. That is fine. To be clear, if any of you wish not to take part in the competition, that is entirely your choice. Charlotte looked around the table, searching for support that wasn't coming. I've not even got a phone, said Tristan. Oh, piss off, Terence! replied Charlotte, throwing real venom into the word Terence. If we may get back on track, said Dockery, when we reassemble, all electronic devices will be confiscated, and you shall not be allowed to leave Gochran House until the competition has been completed, or you have been eliminated. At this, Tristan sat upright. Wait, what? No. I need to... I have some things I need to sort out. He looked at Manny, who, if anything, looked even more freaked out. My client has some very specific medical needs. Duckery nodded. If you have medical requirements, then they will be accounted for. Once you provide verification from a doctor. Tristan ran his hand up and down his arm, twitchily like he just started going into withdrawal. Yeah, said Manny. It's not really a doctor type of thing. Well, if you do have a doctor type thing, there will be an on-site GP available to all of you 24 hours a day, said Dockery, keen to bring this to a close. 
Now, if there are no other complaints, the staff will show you to your rooms. Manny reached across and grabbed Paul's hand. Dude, have you got any signal? Chapter 14 How to Win Friends Jimmy Stewart was edgy. He looked at himself in the mirror and tutted. He didn't know why he was wearing a tie, except ever since he'd been out of uniform, he'd worn one every day he'd gone to work. Now, for the first time in two years, he was going back to work, and he'd been standing around for half an hour deciding what to wear. If his Moira could see him now. The family joke had always been that the kids could guess exactly what he was wearing by which day of the week it was. He was a man of habit, and one who paid very little attention to the superficial, beyond making sure it was all neat and tidy, because Jimmy Stewart was nobody's slob. He ended up wearing the tie because not wearing one felt odd. He'd then tried a few combinations and ended up plumping for a suit to go with it. He felt stupid in it, but uncomfortable out of it. It would feel unnatural anyway. He'd spent a restless night thinking about it. He would have to remember to resist the urge to arrest anybody. Not that the need arising seemed likely. This whole thing felt like a fool's errand. He'd been asked to work a case where an old lady had left a message saying if she died, she believed that somebody might have killed her. As cases went, it was almost certainly a fiction invented by an overactive imagination. In Jimmy's experience, and he had plenty of that, people invariably thought their own lives were far more dramatic than they were. Still. He could do this for a week. It'd get him out of the house and get the kids off his back for a while. The doorbell rang. Jimmy took his time coming down the stairs. He'd had a fall last week after feeling dizzy while getting up off the toilet, having been caught short without toilet roll. That had been an ignominious state of affairs and no mistake. The bell rang again while he was still making his way down the stairs. All right. All right, I'm coming. Hold your horses. He took his coat off the hook and opened the door, to be greeted by the sight of an empty doorstep. At the end of a drive, an unusual-looking black van sat with the driver waiting behind the wheel. This would be his promised lift. A chauffeur-driven service, as Bridget Conroy had half-jokingly billed it, Jimmy locked the house up before walking out to meet him. He climbed in the passenger side door and gave a nod. How are you? Jimmy Stewart. He'd had to catch himself. Two years later, he'd still nearly given his rank. The big fella nodded. Phil Nellis? Yeah. We met briefly last night, but you were busy rolling around on the floor with your buddy. That was a personal matter. I'm sure it was. Apologies for not getting to the door as fast as you liked. I've got a bit of an issue. Yeah, Bridget said. You've got laryngitis. Labyrinthitis, corrected Jimmy. It's an inner ear thing. Affects balance. Phil shrugged. Well, we've all got stuff. Right, said Jimmy. Am I detecting you're not wild about this assignment? I've been with the company over a year now. Don't know why you come in and you're in charge straight away. I was a guard for forty years. Bridget said she needed somebody with experience and this. This was met with an unintelligible grumble. If it's any consolation. I'll only be here for the week, most probably. Phil nodded and said nothing. Do you mind if I open a window? It's cold, said Phil. Right. Only your van stinks. No, it doesn't. Phil looked outraged. I'm afraid it does. Smells like a wet dog. 
Ah, oh, right. That'll be the wet dog. What are you talking? Jesus! Jimmy jumped as he noticed the German shepherd sitting in the back of the van. Why the hell is there a dog in here? That's Maggie. She works for the company, too. Really? said Jimmy. What does she do? The accounts? Well, have you know, Maggie is an invaluable resource, so she is. She's helped solve several cases. Is she a sniffer dog? Amongst other things. Jimmy looked at the dog, who stared back at him. Well, she stinks. She has some digestive issues. Great, said Jimmy. Could you leave your dog at home tomorrow? She's not my dog. She's Polly's. And she has been with the company even longer than me. Technically, she outranks both of us. That's not how rank works. Says who? Says everybody. You can think what you want. I'm not taking orders from a dog. Do you not like dogs? Not ones that stink and think they can give me orders. I didn't say she was giving you orders. I'd not expect her to take any from you, though. Well, there's my chance at Cruft's gone. Jimmy looked around the van. Is that... Is that an ice cream machine back there? Yeah. What kind of Mickey Mouse operation is this? Phil bristled at this. We are doing fine, thanks very much. We sorted out a big industrial espionage thing there a couple of days ago. I know. Bridget explained. You were lucky nobody got killed. It wasn't my fault. Who the hell has ever heard of Bonnybrook? Bonnybrook? said Jimmy. Out near our town, there on the north side. Phil turned his head to look out the window. All right, said Jimmy. I think maybe we've got off on the wrong foot here. Let's start this again. He extended his hand. Hello, I'm Jimmy Stewart. I appreciate you coming out to pick me up. Phil looked at Jimmy's hand for a second before shaking it. Phil Nellis, Associate Investigator. Right, said Jimmy. Pleased to meet you. Nellis is an unusual name. You're not related to Paddy Nellis, by any chance, are you? Phil nodded. Yeah, he was my uncle. Jimmy nodded. He was also a thief. Says who? Well, the justice system for a start. He only went to prison the one time. I know, said Jimmy. I was the man that put him there. The two men locked eyes and stared at each other for a long time. A part of Jimmy's brain was aware he was being a bit of a dick. To be fair, so was the other guy. The tension was eventually broken when the dog farted loudly. Phil Nellis started the engine and spoke in a coldly robotic voice. Where do you want to go? Jimmy said nothing. Phil turned to look at him and raised an eyebrow. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you were talking to me or the dog. Chapter 15 The Power of Tea, Part 1 Paul sat in the leather chair and sipped his cup of tea. This was the power of tea. He could sit there, watching the world go by, and nobody would question his motives because he was having a cuppa. It required no other explanation. What he was really doing other than drinking the most expensive beverage he'd ever enjoyed in any form. Gochran House was crazy expensive. Thankfully, all of said expenses were not being covered by him. 
was watching a very particular section of the world go by. Namely, the Graham grandchildren and their significant others. Paul had taken up station in the corner of reception to watch the comings and goings across the shiny marble floor. It was nearly noon, and over the last couple of hours the place had been busy. Gregory's lawyer, red-faced and sweaty, had turned up just after ten, and the two of them had gone into a side room for a solid hour. Neither man left looking at all happy. Judging by the body language, Gregory had been informed that there was nothing he could do other than play along with Dorothy's wishes. And Paul would lay good odds that the advice got the lawyer fired. As he passed, Gregory shot Paul a dirty look, which he returned with a grin and a tip of his cup. Paul despised Gregory but he also knew that nothing would annoy him more than Paul being cheerful. Charlotte Graham's lawyer had also showed up, but she and Gavin had their chat in the middle of reception. Charlotte wasn't happy. Gavin stood about looking pissed off, too, although that may have been because his T-shirt was so tight it was cutting off his blood circulation. That meeting was cut short by the arrival of a red-headed woman carrying a handbag you could put Paul's car in. The three went into a huddle, while their lawyer noticeably went to the bar. Paul would bet this was their PR woman. There was a good chance Charlotte would be seen with her hair in a mess over the coming days, and that would need to be carefully managed. Paul didn't know much about YouTube, and nothing about these Mickey and Spanner fellas, but Bridget assured him they had a big following. This thing, whatever it might be, was starting to feel like it might be news. Dorothy did not suffer from a lack of imagination, and she'd seemingly been planning this thing for a long time. He knew better than anyone that the woman could think strategically. She had kicked his arse in more than enough board games over the years for him to know that. He'd taken his phone out during a lull in the action and watched a couple of Mickey and Spanner's clips. They consisted of them doing commentary on, well, anything. There was the footage of the blind bull Bridget had mentioned, but they'd also commentated on a fight in a chip shop, a kid's tug of war, and a drunk fella trying, unsuccessfully, to lean against a wall. He had to admit they were funny. Not global phenomenon funny, as far as he was concerned, but then... It was pretty much impossible to tell what the Internet was going to decide it liked. As well as all the other comings and goings, it had been amusing watching Manny, Tristan's diminutive manager, as he hung off various things, before eventually getting mobile reception while standing on top of a bench on the lawn outside. Clearly, he was on the wrong network. The hotel staff offered him the use of a landline, but he'd declined. Paul guessed the people he was ringing didn't take calls from unknown numbers. Given the time of day and the location, he was struggling to get anyone to help him with his predicament, judging by the amount of gesticulating he'd been doing while on the phone. Eventually, a guy turned up on a motorbike and gave Manny what was very clearly a large bag of drugs. Manny almost collapsed with relief, and then hurried upstairs to reassure the talent. Paul had spent little time in his own room, unpacking and quickly heading back downstairs, leaving Bridget to ring Jimmy Stewart and Nora with updates on the latest developments. He'd known she wanted to talk to him, but he wasn't in the mood. Paul surprised himself by chuckling. It was all very Dorothy. Queen Bee and Sidekick Boy. A final joke. Movie-obsessed as she was, she had always loathed how women were more often than not stood about while the men got on with it. Only good for filling the role of romantic interest. He remembered one of her more vehement rants. Like a mucking girl can't be of interest for any other mucking reason. Their one job is to get kidnapped so they can raise the stakes. 
The only thing worse than being the wife or girlfriend in a Hollywood movie is being the mucking daughter. God help you if your daddy is the leading man. You might as well tie yourself up and just wait. Your one necessary skill being the ability to cry your mucking eyes out until a man comes and saves you. Ridiculous! Every time Paul thought of Dorothy, his stomach twisted in knots. She meant a lot to him. He'd tried to tell her once, and she'd shut it down. Neither of them was great with the emotional bit. He hoped she knew. He felt angry at himself for not being there when she needed him, at her for dying, but more than anything, at the idea that somebody might have killed her. Paul didn't care about the money. In fact, even the idea of it made him deeply uncomfortable. He felt queasy at the thought of trying to win it. But even worse at the thought of one of the three leeches, as she'd called them, getting their hands on it. Dorothy had been his... The word friend didn't do it justice. There wasn't really a word for it. Before he'd gone undercover, she'd been helping him with something. It was telling that she was the only person Paul trusted enough to talk about it with. And now she was gone leaving behind an unfillable space. Bridget had tried to get him to open up. He knew what she was doing, and he knew she was probably right. He just wasn't ready. Instead, his anger would be fuel. In honor of Dorothy's memory, he'd do everything he could to win this competition, whatever the hell it ended up being. It was a challenge, but also... She was depending on him. Dorothy didn't want her money going to any of the shower of ingrates she was technically related to. Then there was the even more important part. Maybe it was all in her imagination. The product of a mind with too much time on her hands. But even so, if he found that any of these pompous arsehats had anything to do with Dorothy's death, he would nail them to the wall. He might not be great at grief, but he was very good at anger. Jimmy Stewart was supposed to be good. He'd better be, as this meant way more to Paul than any other case. Chapter 16 The Power of Tea Part 2 Jimmy Stewart suppressed a sigh as he watched Phil Nellis decline the offer of a cup of tea. In all honesty, he'd have preferred it if the guy had stayed in the van, but that appeared to be a non-starter. It had taken some negotiation for the dog to stay there. They'd driven to the address in Black Rock in silence, or at the very least, in the total absence of conversation. Instead, they'd listened to a podcast where Experts discussed the latest developments in ghost-hunting technology. Jimmy had bitten his tongue to prevent himself pointing out that the thing these people needed to develop was a sense of reason. He let it slide, as he had already been less than diplomatic about how he'd been the man who'd arrested Phil's uncle. Some people on the force had a weird almost admiration for Paddy Nellis and his ilk. They saw him as a gentleman criminal, a man who robbed through the application of intelligence instead of violence. Jimmy didn't see it that way. Crime was crime. Just because they didn't shoot anyone, it didn't mean they didn't use the threat of it, and to Jimmy's mind, that was still a type of violence. Despite all of this, he was aware that telling the nephew he'd been the arresting officer who'd locked up his dearly departed uncle wasn't the best of starts to a relationship. If he and Phil had got off to a better start, Jimmy would be explaining to him later that you should always accept the offer of the cup of tea. It's basic psychology. If someone gives you a cup of tea, then you control the length of the interview. 
They might want to get you out the door as fast as possible, but basic manners means they can't get you out until you've finished. Having a cuppa in your hand was like being the one holding the conch. You had control of the room. In Ireland, more so than anywhere else on the planet, the cup of tea was powerful. Not that any such control looked like it would be needed. The walkers sat hand in hand opposite him on a sofa in the front room of what he noticed they still referred to as Dorothy's house. The place was well furnished but cluttered, a sure sign of an elderly resident. No matter how much space you had available, life had a way of filling it. Such a house was usually filled with pictures of children, grandchildren, nephews and nieces taking up every available flat surface. From his own experience, he knew his wife had agonized over where such photographs should be placed, keen to be seen to be showing no hint of favoritism. That didn't appear to be a problem in the Graham household. The hall was lined with hunting trophies, and the front room filled with photographs of animals. Apparently, Mrs. Graham's late husband had been from a family of keen hunters, while she had been a lover of animals remaining alive. As Jimmy looked around while the tea was being prepared, he noted that it appeared she'd adopted more animals than Noah had managed to get on the ark. Yet still, she left the trophy heads up in the hall. Quite the juxtaposition. Jimmy had been subtle, but he'd been watching the reactions of Pang Lee and her husband Charlie carefully since they'd arrived. If there wasn't genuine grief there, then they were very good at acting. There was nervousness, but unless Jimmy was way off, it felt more like the natural guilt felt by someone who has lost a loved one rather than the guilty perpetrator sort. Still, that was an impression. There was a place for impressions in investigative work, and that was way behind facts. Jimmy took a sip of his tea and then placed the cup back down on the saucer resting on the coffee table beside a framed picture of adopted wolves. He smiled as he casually pulled his notepad from his inside pocket. Ah, that's a grand drop of tea. So, where were you on the night it happened? Jimmy made the abrupt turn in conversation deliberately. It was a good way to throw people. Charlie, the husband, spoke up. We were down in Castle Bar for the night, at the Regency Hotel. He glanced at his wife. It was our one-year anniversary. Yes, said Pang Lee. I tried to convince Miss Dorothy to let someone from the service come in. I'd even booked them to do so. But she wouldn't have it. Her accent was one of those peculiar mixes. She was from Malaysia, but had lived in Dublin that long, that you got Irish phraseology, filtered through the prism of an entirely different part of the world. The service, asked Jimmy. Fina Home Care. They come in to assist with elderly people? Did Dorothy need assistance? asked Jimmy, taking down a note to verify that the service had indeed been booked and cancelled. Not as far as she was concerned. She didn't like having strangers in her house, and the carers weren't comfortable with... What? Pang Li glanced at Charlie. Well, you know, Dorothy, God rest her. She was a bit... What is the... She looked to her husband. Eccentric. Pang Li nodded. Yes, eccentric. The guns. The carers didn't like the guns. Right, said Jimmy. She walked around carrying a gun all the time? In her housecoat. She wasn't... It wasn't dangerous. She would never use it. Right. 
Didn't Paul explain this? He did, said Jimmy. And it hadn't made a great deal of sense then, either. Jimmy had briefly met Dorothy Graham a few years ago, around the same time he'd come into contact with Paul and Bridget. On that occasion, she'd just shot an armed intruder. So Jimmy was taking the Dorothy Graham wouldn't hurt a fly angle with a pinch of salt. He had assumed after the incident that Mrs. Graham's guns would have been removed from the house. Her lawyer must be very good. And how was she? asked Jimmy. How do you mean? Health-wise. Pang Lee nodded. She was good. For a woman her age, I mean. Mentally sharp. She had sciatica and rheumatism. Her knees and back hurt, but overall she is in good health. Pang Lee caught herself and winced. Was. She was in good health. Sorry. Easy mistake to make, said Jimmy. So she would normally have been okay on the stairs? Pang Lee's eyes started to well up as she nodded. Absolutely. Jimmy took a note and nodded. Thanks. I know this is difficult for you. Where's your jacks? asked Phil. Jimmy failed to keep the irritation from his face. Excuse me? said Pang Lee. The bog, the toilet, where is it? There's one at the end of the hall, said Charlie. Right, said Phil. Is there one upstairs too? Charlie nodded. Three, actually. It's a big house. Right, said Phil. Jimmy's annoyance with Phil turned to frustration with himself. It hadn't occurred to him until Phil blundered into it. Maybe the lad wasn't as dim as he looked. I think what my colleague is getting at is, why would Mrs. Graham have been coming down the stairs if there was a bathroom upstairs, where her bedroom presumably is? Phil stood. What? No. We've just got me morning load to deliver and downstairs bugs never have the flushing power. Excuse me. Or maybe even a stopped clock is right, occasionally. With a nod to Pang Lee and Charlie, Phil left. Jimmy gave a tight smile. Sorry about that, he's... Jimmy left that hanging, nothing but truth popping into his head. So why would Mrs. Graham have been coming downstairs? Pang Lee shrugged. I don't know. I wondered that too. She has a TV in her room, and I made sure she had water for her tablets before we left. Charlie nodded. I mean, there's the kitchen. But Dorothy didn't eat much. We had to remind her to eat half the time. She wasn't the midnight snack sort. Jimmy nodded. I see. He turned to the page. I believe Mrs. Graham's lawyer, Mr. Dockery, has informed you about the recorded message she left regarding her death. Charlie and Pang Lee nodded in unison. She picked up a cushion and hugged it to herself. What were your first impressions upon hearing it? Well, said Charlie, I mean, it's... She did say. She thought people were watching the house. Really? When, exactly? A couple of times. She said she'd seen a man lurking about, but when I'd gone looking, there was no sign. We also went to a funeral a couple of weeks ago. I drove her. She started saying we were being followed. Charlie shrugged. I mean, I looked, but... She kept saying there was a blue gulf behind us. Thing is, she was right. I spotted four of them. I googled it after. It's like the most popular car in Ireland. Pang Lee nodded. 
Miss Dorothy had an active imagination, and the funeral was for Professor Mulligan, someone she had gone to see only a week before. So I put it down to her being upset and letting her imagination run away with her. And were you here all the time? Yes, she said. I mean, every day except, you know, when it happened. I'd go out occasionally, but Charlie would always be here when I did. Not that she minded being in on her own. She was always telling us to go out to the cinema or a meal. I think she felt bad thinking we were staying home because of her. We didn't mind, honestly. Jimmy turned to look directly at Charlie. And how did you get on with Dorothy? Charlie paused, trying to find the right words. Pang Lee stepped in. Dorothy liked Charlie. He looked less sure, but she placed a reassuring hand on his knee. She did, eventually. She was very protective of me. You see, I have no family here, and so Dorothy, she... I guess she saw it as her job. Charlie gave a sad little laugh. She was tough, but I didn't mind. She loved Pang, and I can respect that. So what did you do around here? Gardening, mostly. This place has a large grounds, and odd jobs. I know my way around a screwdriver. I installed the cameras last year. Jimmy nodded. He'd noticed them on the way in. Is it a good system? Oh, yeah. One of the best money can buy. She wanted all the grounds covered, you see. We've got fourteen cameras outside. Fourteen? That's a lot, isn't it? asked Jimmy. Pang Lee interjected. She had a look Jimmy recognized. The one someone wore when trying not to speak ill of the dead. Miss Dorothy, you have to understand, she was... She watched a lot of films. She would see this one film, and then the next day we would get cameras. Then she would watch something else, and we would get a VR kit. VR, said Jimmy, genuinely not understanding. Virtual reality, said Charlie. Mrs. G loved technology. She didn't use it that much. It made her dizzy. You see, continued Pang Lee, she had the money, so she... If she saw something, she got it. Jimmy nodded. To be honest with you, said Charlie, she wasn't worried about getting robbed. She mainly used them for tracking a neighbor's cat. Pang Lee held a hand to her mouth her face somewhere between sadness and laughter. Oh, heavens, that cat. She would ring the bell at all hours, watching the cameras on the TV in her room, calling Charlie out of bed, making him go out and chase the cat. Charlie smiled. That cat is... was her nemesis, and by extension mine. That mucking cat! quoted Pang Lee, tears in her eyes. Charlie gave her hand a gentle squeeze. Jimmy smiled. She could see the cameras from upstairs. Oh, yeah, said Charlie. It's all linked into the Wi-Fi. She had a feed to her TV, but you can get it on your phone, too. I've got an app. So does Pang. So, said Jimmy, searching for the right words. Sorry to ask this, but is there footage of her fall? Oh, no. There are no cameras inside, you see. Why is that? said Jimmy. Charlie looked at Pang Lee, who looked slightly embarrassed. Charlie had them installed, but Miss Dorothy saw another film where somebody had... She looked at her husband. Hacked, he offered. She nodded. 
hacked the cameras. She took out all the ones inside after that. Covered all the ones on laptops, too. Right, said Jimmy, making a note. It sounds like she was very concerned about security. Charlie sucked on his teeth. She sort of was, but again, like Pang said, she watched a lot of TV. I had to hire a guy to build us a firewall when she watched that Mr. Robot show. You need to understand, though, it wasn't just security. God rest her. She loved a gimmick or a gadget. There was no stopping her when she locked onto something. She has her gnome workshop in the garage. Gnome workshop? She made garden gnomes, said Charlie. Oh, said Jimmy. It really was just what it sounded like. Pang Lee pointed over at the dining table, upon which lay a sprawl of paperwork. Recently, she had become obsessed with looking into the family history. Can I take a look? said Jimmy. Sure. Jimmy stood up, and then had to grab onto the arm of the sofa to steady himself. Are you all right? asked Charlie, leaning forward, ready to grab him. I've just got a bit of an inner ear thing. He took a breath, steadied himself, and then crossed the room. The table had printouts, a couple of books, and a framed black-and-white photograph. It showed about a dozen men in suits. Eamon de Valera. She was related to Dev. No, said Charlie. That's Harry Boland, too, isn't it? And Jim Larkin? There'd been a lot of documentaries on the television to celebrate the hundredth anniversary of the 1916 Easter Rising, and Jimmy always had a good memory for faces. Yes, said Charlie, sounding impressed. It is. This is like a who's who of the Irish Revolution, said Jimmy. Charlie pointed to the back right, at a tall man wearing spectacles, whose face was half covered by someone else's hat. You can't see him too well, but that is Padraig Graham back there, her father-in-law. He fought in the Rising? No, said Charlie. He was in America for quite some time before it. He'd gone off to make his fortune, ended up working for a building company in New York doing the accounts. This picture was taken in New York in 1920, when Boland and de Valera were on their American tour. This is them meeting the delegation from the newly formed Soviet Union. Oh, yeah, said Jimmy. The crown jewels thing. That's right. It was a well-known story. The Irish and the Soviets had both been in America looking for support. Only the Irish raised a ton of money, five million or so, and the Soviets were getting nothing. So the Irish lent them twenty grand, and they put up a bit of the Russian crown jewels for collateral. I remember reading all about it. Harry Boland had returned home just as the civil war that followed the treaty had broken out. That was how the Russian crown jewels ended up hidden in his sister's chimney for a long time. Such was the legend. Boland died in the war, and, in accordance with his wishes, his sister only handed them to the Irish government when de Valera came to power. It had subsequently returned them to the Soviets, and the loan was repaid. So Mrs. Graham's father-in-law was involved in all that? Sort of, said Charlie. From what she told me, when they were raising all this money, he was the accountant who kept track of it. Jimmy nodded. Doesn't matter how well it is done. Admin is never getting your face a statue. Yes, agreed Charlie. That professor she hired looked into it, but there wasn't really that much to tell. Padre Graham didn't return to Ireland until the end of the twenties, when he set up the rubber business with the big factory out in Swords. 
Jimmy nodded. Fascinating. Speaking of family, did she see much of the grandchildren? asked Jimmy. No, said Pang Lee. Definitely not. She had nothing to do with them. She was always calling them leeches. Doesn't sound like the happiest of families. No. Phil re-entered, banging the door against the sideboard. Jesus, this place is massive. Nearly got lost. Can I just say, your bog roll is only spectacular. Pang Li looked confused, which Jimmy was beginning to realize was a default state of being when conversing with Phil Nellis. Oh, um, thank you. Oh, no, thank you. It's soft, yet strong. Feels lovely against the skin. What ploy is that? I don't really know. I can check for you. That won't be necessary, said Jimmy. Seriously, Jimmy, you want to treat yourself to a dump? It's like your arse is going on holiday. Jimmy attempted to glare at Phil, but Phil was too focused on the somehow complex task of sitting down on the sofa. The man appeared to consist almost entirely of legs. The coffee table rattled as he tried to reposition himself. Giving up, Jimmy turned the page in his notebook and tried to refocus himself. One last thing and we'll be out of your way. The camera's outside. Did they show anything on the night in question? Charlie shook his head. There's a function where it shows you any movement they picked up over a certain period of time. There was nothing to see. Well, almost nothing. Almost, said Pang Li, her brow furrowing as she looked at her husband. Well, he continued, addressing Jimmy, the motion sensors aren't the smartest. On a windy night it goes mad, nothing but trees waving about. Was it windy that night? No, but... Charlie shifted about. To be honest, I only just thought of this when we mentioned it a minute ago. The only thing on the recordings is, just after midnight, you can see that bloody cat on our lawn. Pang Li gasped. Oh, God. She was coming down to shoo off that bloody cat. Charlie moved over to his wife's side, laying a comforting hand on her shoulder. Would it be possible to get the footage? asked Jimmy. Sure, said Charlie. I put the last couple of weeks of it onto a data stick for the Gardaí, but they didn't bother taking it. Jimmy closed his notebook. Well, thanks very much. I think I've got all I need. He gave them a smile. First morning and he already had a suspect. The cat would be tough to get a confession out of, though. Chapter 17 For Those About to Die Bridget had been on a stage twice before in her life. Once, as a kid, she'd performed in her hometown's entry in the Tops of the Towns competition. She'd been in a choir of children who sang a medley of Christmas songs in June. Everyone had told them they were great, but then... Everyone told eight-year-olds they were always great. Thinking back, Bridget was fairly certain they'd been terrible. The town's failure to get anywhere rather backed that up. They'd also declined to enter again the next year. Bridget's second time on stage had been when her friend Monica convinced her to be part of her three-woman dance troupe for the school talent show. Late at night, when her brain was being a grade-A arsehole, she would get flashbacks to that performance. It always played in slow motion. In the memory, Bridget could see every sneering, leering face in the crowd as Monica's big finale, when she jumped into Bridget and Anne's arms, 
went horribly wrong. Bridget unfailingly woke up in a cold sweat just as Monica landed in the orchestra pit, breaking Sean Coyne's right arm and clarinet upon landing. He'd not been able to write, and had to stay back a year to do his exams. It had been quite the thing. Still, Bridget was sure that this moment might surpass that one to claim the number one spot on her brain's playlist of horrors. They were on a large stage in a massive marquee that had been erected behind Gochran House. It was an appropriate venue, as this was turning into quite the circus. There were several camera operators running about, not to mention all manner of lighting rigs. There was also a balding man called Nigel, with a very theatrical twang to his English accent, who appeared to exist in a perpetual state of exasperation. Bridget hadn't seen one up close before, but apparently a director's job consisted primarily of shouting abuse into his megaphone, while nobody paid him much attention. Is your mask itchy? asked Paul. He was standing beside her. They were decked out in pink jumpsuits, which clashed terribly with the masks they were wearing. They'd also been provided with boots that looked military issue, except for the fact that they, too, had been spray-painted pink. Bridget was grateful for the masks, as God forbid anyone should see her being part of this debacle. Having said that, Yeah, this mask is an itchy bugger. Good to know. Queen Bee. Ara, shut up, sidekick boy. Beside them on stage stood the other three teams, all looking very unhappy with their lots in life. Bridget would have preferred being the green, blue, or gold team, but she guessed none of them would be up for swapping. How much do you think all this is costing? asked Bridget. We've no clue said Paul. But I guess if you actually could take it with you when you go, this would be a much smaller affair. Oh, don't look now, but here come your celebrity crushes. Bridget looked in the direction of Paul's nod to see Mickey and Spanner making their way down the line of teams, shaking hands. They had been officially introduced earlier when the director gave them their briefing. Look, I know this is only going out live on the internet, but please, let's keep the fucking swearing to a minimum, all right, loves? Some of us would like to have a career when this shit show is over. And just a note, as part of the paperwork you signed to be in the competition, you have waived your right to sue anyone involved, OK? Lovely. Gregory's hand had shut up and been entirely ignored. Instead, Mickey and Spanner said their brief hellos, before being rushed away for a discreet chat with Nigel. Bridget had been surprised. She'd seen a picture of them before, and had automatically and, as it turned out, incorrectly assumed that the deep voice belonged to the short fat one with the squint, and the high-pitched rat-a-tat machine gun delivery was the tall guy's. They made their way along the line, like the Queen at an awards ceremony, although Bridget was fairly sure the Queen got a more enthusiastic response than they were getting from the Graham progeny. Jesus, said Mickey, he of the machine gun delivery as he reached them. This'd be the Mexican team then, would it? We're not actually Mexican, said Paul. I know, said Mickey. And Spanner here isn't actually a jet pilot, but he still says it to the girls down on Leeson Street in the hope they'll have a jump on it. Spanner, the tall one, blushed. Don't mind him. He's all excited that we get to do something live. I am, admitted Mickey. RTE won't even put us on the Late Late Show. Tis a feckin' disgrace. If you were from Dublin, I bet they would chipped in Bridget. Mickey's face lit up. You're not wrong, you're not wrong. Where are you from yourself? Leitrim. Leitrim, Jesus, Spanner. A proper country rose amidst all this Dublin shite. Fucking hell, came the holler from Nigel. 
We're live in 40 seconds. Can we all get onto our marks, please? All right, hollered Spanner. Keep your hair on. He turned back to Bridget and Paul. Well, the best of luck to you both. The two men sauntered off, their casual body language in stark contrast to Nigel's flailing arms, directing them to their spot. While not that easy to see through the mask, in the corner of her eye, Bridget caught Paul smirking at her. What? Oh, Mr. Mickey, he said. If you were from Dublin, you'd have your own TV show. Well, it happens to be true. Whatever Paul said next was lost, as the opening notes of Alzo Sprach Zarathustra, also known as the music from 2001 A Space Odyssey, to those who had not been on the school quiz team with poor broken arm Sean Coyne, and forced to learn the proper name for every bit of classical music ever featured on an advert. There was a moment of sudden darkness, followed by beams of red and blue lights rising from every corner of the marquee. Artificial smoke billowed out of a vent behind them. Bit much, said Bridget, waving a hand in front of her face. Spanner's amplified voice filled the room. Four teams, one massive pile of money. Who will win, and who will be left with feck all? Ladies and gentlemen of the Internet, stop fighting with each other on Twitter for five minutes and get ready to see some people make a right show of themselves for the sake of filthy moolah. Welcome to the Money Games. On cue, a logo for the money games appeared on the huge screen that stood opposite the stage. Bridget wondered how this looked on the live feed. It seemed to have ridiculously high production values, even if she could feel the lawyers of whoever owned the rights to the Hunger Games getting excited. The logo dissolved to leave Mickey and Spanner talking to the camera. I'm Mickey. This is my amigo Spanner. And you're welcome on board for what's sure to be a wild ride. You can tweet us and Facebook us and everything else, or just tell your friends the old-fashioned way. But before that, a word from the woman who made all of this possible. The screen dissolved to a shot of Dorothy sitting in her front room, as she had been in the earlier videos. This must have been cut across the live feed as Nigel screeched, For fuck's sake, what did I say about swearing? Too late now, hollered Mickey gleefully. Dorothy gave the camera that twinkly-eyed smile. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dorothy Graham, and there are three things you need to know about me. One, I am mucking loaded. Two, my only living descendants are three ingrates who I'd rather I than give my money to. And three, if you're watching this, I am dead. If one of these muckers is going to get my money, I will not make it easy. They will have to complete a series of seven tasks that will earn them points. At the end of the third day, the top three teams will go into a final race to gain the ultimate prize. I guarantee you, to get those points, they will have to show courage, determination, and hard work, something none of them has ever previously displayed. She threw her hands out and a broad grin spread across her face. Let the games begin. Then it threw back to Mickey and Spanner. Right so, said Spanner. Why don't you introduce us to the teams then, Mickey? Delighted to. First, the blue team. Gregory and Arena filled the big screen. He is a disgraced waste of space whose company robbed ordinary Joe Soaps of their pension. 
She is a fine-looking woman who has married for money, as she's way out of that arse hat's league. It's Gregory and Irina. Gregory's outraged objections were lost under the sound of canned applause that filled the marquee. Irina's face didn't move a muscle, which even allowing for the Botox was scary. They were replaced on the screen by Tristan and Manny. Up next, the red team. Manny tried to plaster on a smile, like a cow pretending he was enjoying his trip to the abattoir, whereas Tristan looked off into the distance, enjoying the light show. He is Tristan Arturo, or Terence Graham to his family, if they ever actually spoke to him. He's considered a rock star despite having as much musical talent as a farce in a wheelie bin. The Aussie short arse with him is Manny Pagonis, his manager, and the poor bastard whose job it is to push around the wheelie bin. More canned applause played before they moved on to Charlotte and Gavin. On to the pair of gold-plated plunkers that make up the gold team. She is Charlotte Graham, self-styled influencer who sells bottled water to idiots, and is that vacuous you have to be careful when she opens her mouth not to get sucked into the black hole that is her soul. He is Gavin Macon, the only man to get caught taking performance-enhancing drugs twice despite achieving no improvement in performance. Bridget watched Gavin's face as he tried to work out exactly how insulting this was. And then finally... Bridget tried to smile as the camera picked out her and Paul, standing there in their pink jumpsuits and ridiculous wrestling masks. They are our mysterious wildcard team. She is the magnificent Queen Bee, proudly representing the fine county of Leitrim. He is sidekick boy from Dublin, somewhere, probably, together. They are Team Pink. Bridget gave an awkward wave before the camera mercifully cut back to Spanner and Mickey. Both men started moving towards the camera, forcing the cameraman to walk backwards to keep them in shot. Eight contestants. Four teams. One massive prize. One couple will go home with the lot. And the rest leave with feck all. Strap in, folks. You're about to see some rich pricks make a holy show of themselves. Mickey grabbed the camera and screamed into it, his spittle hitting the lens. Let's get ready to rumble! Yeah, thought Bridget. This will definitely be worse than the Sean Coyne's arm incident. Chapter 18 Family Money Jimmy took a deep breath. You're staying in the van. I'm not staying in the bleeding van. They were parked in a space off Marion Square, a steady flow of traffic chugging by them, the spring afternoon sun briefly breaking through the clouds to dazzle drivers on their way up the street. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you... Jimmy stopped himself. For Christ's sake, we're starting to sound like one of those ventriloquist routines. What? You know... Jimmy raised his voice to an irritating squeak. Get in the box. I don't want to get in the box. Get in the box. Jesus, said Phil. We really hate them. So did Jimmy but some part of him didn't want to agree. It's the dummies, continued Phil. They've got them weird eyes, creepy as anything. Yeah, agreed Jimmy. I don't like dummies either. On an unrelated note, you're staying in the van. Who put you in charge? Bridget, your boss, remember? She covered it in the meeting last night that you weren't in because you got sent home for fighting with your own receptionist. 
office manager, replied Phil, folding his arms. And then she said it again when she rang this morning. They'd got the call from Bridget, just as they had been leaving Mrs. Graham's house. She'd brought Jimmy up to speed on the morning's developments, and he'd filled her in on his provisional findings at the house. Namely, how a cat in need of a shoeing was the closest thing they had to a suspect. Then Phil had demanded the phone, and asked for a clarification on the command structure, as he'd put it. From what Jimmy had caught, Bridget had diplomatically told him the lay of the land. Phil had spent the drive through mid-morning traffic sitting in a huff, making random tutting noises to himself. Well, said Phil, she also said I'm supposed to be learning from you. How am I supposed to learn if I'm in the van? You can't come with me for this bit. I'm going to see my financial expert who is doing some digging for me. Phil looked suddenly triumphant. Bridget said we can't go hiring people without her approval. That's an agency rule. After that time, Paul hired that mariachi band. I'm not hiring anyone. I'm... Wait. Hang on. What did Paul need a mariachi band for? Phil looked away haughtily. That's on a need-to-know basis. Right, said Jimmy. Well, like I said, I'm not hiring anyone. I've twisted their arm to do it for free. Phil's eyes narrowed. What have you got on them? Well, for a start, when she was sixteen, I didn't tell her mother, who'd gone to great lengths to cook her vegetarian meals for six months to support her lifestyle choices, that I'd seen her in McDonald's piling into a Big Mac. Phil's follow-up question was lost as Jimmy stepped down from the van and moved across the street. When he got to the far side, he grabbed a railing as discreetly as he could, and waited for the world to stop wobbling. Are you sure you don't want a cup of tea, Dad? Jimmy held a hand up. Honestly, I'm fine, love. Sorry for dropping in. I hope I won't get you into trouble. With who? asked Denise. I'm the boss, remember? Jimmy smiled. Even before you were the boss, you were the boss. Boss had been Denise's affectionate nickname as a child, one she'd pretended not to like, but it was far too apt not to stick. She was their second. The first was always highly strung. The second was always practical. That had been what someone had told them. He'd seen as many families that disproved that rule but it fit theirs like a glove. Jimmy had never been to her office before. The thing was massive. Her desk alone was larger than the dining table himself, Moira, and the four kids had eaten dinner around for twenty years. So, she said, how are you getting on with your new partner? He's not my partner. He's an idiot. Denise sat back. Oh, dear, here we go. What? Don't you want me, Dad? You know what. You are hypercritical. I am not. Really? said Denise. Do you not remember that guy that was around doing our gutters last month? Well, excuse me for wanting to make sure you were getting your money's worth. You sat outside on a deck chair, in freezing temperatures, watching the man work. He was so freaked out he forgot to come and get paid. Well, I saved you a few bob at least. And then there was that mechanic who was doing Mum's car. Jimmy pointed at the shelf in the corner. When did you win an award? Last year. Don't change the subject, Dad. I'm not. It's a nice trophy. Is that real cut glass? Denise didn't look at it. It better be. They make you pay for it yourself. Well, the company pays for it. Really? said Jimmy. Still an award, though. 
What's it say? Jimmy strained to read it. He was proud of his 2020 vision. So much so, he'd been actively resisting going to get an eye test to confirm his secret suspicion that he didn't have it anymore. Accountant of the Year. That's very impressive. Not really. I've won it the last three years in four. I'm the Merrill Streep of tax consultancy. How did I not know this? Denise picked up her pen and put it down again. I don't know. We sent you the press release. Now, back to your partner. He's not my partner. Right. Can I ask, have you made him cry like you did that mechanic? Now, that's not fair, said Jimmy. That bloke had some other stuff going on, and I don't just mean your ma's dodgy gearbox. Maybe this guy does too? Have you asked? What's his name? I forget. Denise said nothing, just folded her arms and stared at her father. All right, it's Phil. And have you taken the time to get to know Phil? I know he's an idiot. I see. And is he a married or single idiot? I think you can do better than him, love. Ha ha. You don't know, do you? The great detective has not shown any interest in the other person sitting in the car with him. It's not a car. It's a van. And there's also a dog in it. Really? Yeah. I'm sneezing my way through the day. It's a delight. Sharon did say you should get yourself a pet. Was that before or after she suggested yoga? She's not wrong. I've not got the toys for yoga. You need something, Dad. Jimmy nodded his head at the trophy. Where's the other two, then? What? The trophies for the other two years. Denise leaned forward. If you must know, one's at home on my mantelpiece, and the other is on yours. Really? Jimmy smiled, and then read Denise's serious expression. Oh, right. I thought it looked familiar. Denise shook her head. Sorry. Don't worry about it, but the point still stands. Maybe cut this Phil guy a bit of slack. For all your attention to detail, you do occasionally miss things that are right in front of your face, or at least on your mantelpiece. Fair point. What happened the year you didn't win? Denise did her best to hide her smile. Don't push it, or I'm giving this info to Phil. Denise pointed at the neat stack of papers in front of her. I hope it wasn't too much trouble. Denise waved his concerns away. Ah, to be honest, it was a lot more fun than the annuities meeting I'd got scheduled in. These people are... interesting, to put it mildly. And how are they financially? Also interesting, said Denise. I can't be sure, as I don't have access to bank records. But from what I've been able to find out, I'd guess none of them are fiscally solid. Or to put it in layman's terms, they're all broke. What? said Jimmy. All of them? Denise held her hands up. Like I said, I'm filling in a lot of blanks here, but let's see. Tristan Arturo, a.k.a. Terence Graham. He had a classic Bentley repossessed last year. He has at least one paternity suit outstanding, and, I kid you not, he's being pursued internationally for an unpaid bill from the fancy rehab place he went to in Malibu. I read about that, said Jimmy. He got thrown out for getting off his face and trying to have sex with a statue. Yes, said Denise. 
Apparently, they don't work on a no-win, no-fee basis. Got to feel sorry for their accounts department, trying to get payment out of junkies. All right, well, he's a screw-up. We know that. But the other two? Charlotte and Hubby Gavin, or Chavin TM, as they inexplicably like to be known, are painting the picture of being loaded, but, well, here's the thing. Turns out trying to look successful is very expensive. From what I can see, their outgoings significantly outweigh their income. I made some calls. The gyms they have, both locations, are a couple of months late on rent. Don't hold me to it, but I'm smelling a classic overstretch there. And the eldest? Gregory? Ah, yes, said Denise. The Irish financial world's blackest of black sheep. I met him once. Total creep. Tried to grab my friend Carol's arse. Carol? The boxer? Denise gave a big smile. Yeah, that didn't go well for him, slimy little toad. But he's still loaded, isn't he? Denise oscillated her left hand in the air. Maybe. Look, this one is the most guessiest of all the guesswork. He could have money hidden offshore, but I... She lowered her voice. I have a source in the central bank. It's all very hush-hush. Isn't that where Carol works now? As soon as he'd said it, Jimmy regretted it. Denise had been trying to impress him, and he should have just let her have it. She ignored the remark. When they were looking into his company's dodgy dealings, the ones he technically blew the whistle on, although only because he sensed which way the wind was blowing, they found a surplus of money in one of the dodgy funds. Eight million euro. Wait, said Jimmy. They found too much money. Well, yeah, in a manner of speaking. One of the funds that was making the highest profit. They've got the money in it, and the transfers had been routed through several non-cooperative countries, so the central bank can't trace it. Nobody has claimed it. A lot of their team reckon it might belong to Gregory Graham. But of course the little shit can't claim it, as then... He'd have to admit that he knew what the company was doing. Exactly. Anyone else could claim ignorance and ask for their money back. But not Gregory. I see. The theory is the weasel got greedy and shoved all of his money into their dirty little scheme. There are rumours that he's trying to quietly sell his house and his other house. He and the missus are looking to downsize fast. Interesting. Jimmy nodded. Well, thanks very much. So, was that useful? Yes and no. Denise tilted her head in that same way she'd always had. Jimmy got flashbacks to the chubby girl in pigtails, asking why the sky was blue. How so? Well, look at it this way. If Dorothy Graham's death wasn't an accident, and that's a big if, then someone would need a motive. The Graham kids would have reasonably expected to inherit money when she died. So we need to find somebody who needed the money badly and couldn't wait for father time to do the job for them. Any of these three might need the cash, said Denise. Well, exactly. Doesn't narrow the pool of suspects at all. So, who's looking most likely? At the moment, next door's cat. What? Never mind, said Jimmy, standing up. Like I said before, this is probably a fool's errand. At least it got you out of the house. Yeah, agreed Jimmy. Now I don't have to watch idiots on daytime TV. Now I can see them up close and personal. I've taken up enough of your valuable time, sweetheart. Thanks again. No problem, Dad.
And do me a favor. Jimmy sighed. All right, I'll try to get on with him, but I'm not promising anything. That's the spirit. Chapter Nineteen. The cat is magic. Jimmy opened the door of the van. The dog is in my seat. Actually, said Phil. The dog is in the seat she normally sits in. You were borrowing it. Well, can I borrow it again? Phil nodded at the rear, and Maggie jumped back. Would it kill you to say please? Jimmy clambered in. I'm not saying please to a dog. Manners cost nothing. No. But self-respect does. Arre, Jesus! I'll have dog hair all over my suit. He slammed the door shut and sneezed loudly. How did it go? To give you the big picture, said Jimmy, wiping his nose. All of the Graham kids are potentially broke, so they've all got motive. Right, said Phil. That's big, isn't it? Them having motive. Not really. Even people who have money still want more of it. In fact, they typically want it even more than poor people do. So motive here isn't much. We've not got means, which is the big one. Not unless they've somehow trained the cat to walk on a lawn and attract Mrs. Graham's attention. Even then. The woman fell down the stairs in an empty house. Phil nodded. I've been investigating the cat. Jimmy looked at Phil. It was hard to tell if the guy was joking. He permanently wore the same facial expression, like a dog trying to lick peanut butter off the top of its mouth. Are you being serious? Yeah. Phil picked up the laptop that was sitting on the dash. Seeing as I had to sit here with nothing to do, I started looking through that data stick that Charlie gave us with all the security camera footage on it. Right, and Phil turned the laptop around and held it out to Jimmy with a flourish. The cat is magic. Chapter Twenty. Horses for courses. The action had moved outside. The time it took to do so being covered by playing Mickey and Spanner's new music video. Bridget couldn't see the pictures, but from what she could gather, the song was about being drunk at a children's party. The dynamic duo were intent on a multi-platform assault on world domination. The March afternoon sun shone directly into their eyes. It was all light and no heat, leaving Bridget feeling cold in her jumpsuit. At least it meant she was getting a bit of air circulation around the mask. She didn't know how Mexican wrestlers managed in these things. She dreaded to think what it was doing to her hair. In front of them stood an assault course where various jumps and obstacles were laid out. At one end stood a finishing line. At the other sat a large dumper truck. As soon as they'd cut to the video, Nigel, the director, launched into an unironic, foul-mouthed tirade at Mickey and Spanner regarding their language, that seemed to entirely bounce off them. Bridget guessed they'd decided on their brand and were sticking to it. Amidst much whining and complaining, the four teams took their positions outside. All but one member. Paul nudged Bridget. Check it out. Big Gavin has decided he'd like to have a word with Mickey. They watched as Gavin moved towards where Mickey stood in discussion with Nigel, all outraged neck movement and muscles bulging, wanting to have a quiet word. Spanner had disappeared somewhere. Gavin got within ten feet when two even bigger dudes blocked his path. 
They were wearing black and white striped referee's jerseys, like they used in American sports. Bridget hugged her arms to herself, trying to generate a bit of warmth. Looks like Dorothy has planned for any objections people wish to lodge, legal or physical. Paul nodded. How long do you think she spent planning this? I've no idea. But count yourself very lucky you never pissed her off. Paul did a pirouette, his arms outstretched. I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm standing here in the freezing cold in a pink jumpsuit and a wrestling mask. Yeah, you might have a point there, sidekick boy. In lieu of an answer to that, Paul blew a raspberry at Bridget. Right, said Nigel to everyone and no one. We're back in thirty places, everyone. He clapped his hands together. One of the massive referees pointed Gavin back to where he was supposed to be standing. Do you think they know each other? Who? Your man Gavin and those other massive lads. Why would they? I don't know, said Paul. I've just always assumed that all ludicrously muscled people knew each other, like they all hang out in the same pubs. Bridget shook her head. You don't end up looking like that by hanging out in pubs. Yeah, agreed Paul. Looking like that, you end up standing outside of pubs, telling people they can't come in because they're wearing trainers. On Nigel's cue, Mickey looked down the camera. And now, viewers, it's time for our first challenge. For this, we will need each team to nominate one member. But what's the challenge about? Well, to find out, let's ask Spanner. He cupped his hands around his mouth. Spanner! Spanner appeared from behind the dump truck, riding a horse. As Bridget watched, she realized the word riding was inappropriate. Spanner was hanging on for dear life while the horse trotted around like he was an inconvenience. A cameraman ran beside him, gamely trying to keep up. Spanner, looking petrified, tried to deliver his link to the camera. That's right, Mickey. This challenge is called Horses for Courses, and all I can tell you is that it involves horses and the assault course you see behind me. He attempted a game show hand waft to illustrate his point, but nearly fell off in the process. Spanner reached where Mickey stood and pulled on the reins. Bridget guessed in rehearsals that's where they had planned for the horse to stop. Spanner's mount had other ideas. The cameraman spun around as the horse not only continued on its way, but picked up speed. Holy shite! Mickey laughed. Spanner, Spanner, come back, you idiot! Do you not think I'm trying to? The horse took a turn, and Spanner bent down and grabbed onto its neck to avoid falling off entirely. Ah, shite! Well, said Mickey, it appears Spanner's horse has decided to head back into the hotel for a stiff drink. Teams, you have twenty seconds to decide who you will nominate for this challenge. Uptempo music came from somewhere as Mickey danced around, doing a passable one-man flamenco. It'll have to be you, said Paul. Why me? asked Bridget. I know nothing about horses. You're from the country. Do you think I spent my days trotting around on horseback? Look, said Paul, my only experience of horses is that time the guard a horse kicked Phil in the head. That explains a lot, said Bridget. But... An aggressive hooter sounding interrupted her. This had the additional effect of spooking Spanner's untrusty steed as it bolted back the way it had come, heading straight for the contestants. Somebody grab that fucking horse! screeched Nigel. Mind your language! responded Mickey, 
as he dived behind one of the lighting rigs. Sorry, folks, our director has a foul mouth on him. They all backed away as the horse galloped through, unceremoniously dumping Spanner off its back before rocketing off towards the woods, free of its unwanted burden. Mickey came out from cover and leaned over his comrade. You are right, dear Spanner. No, I'm not. I think I've broken my arse. Mickey looked at Nigel, who was frantically waving at the contestants. Right, well, walk it off, big fella. So, teams, nomination time. The Blues? Gregory waved a hand at his wife. Irina is a superb horsewoman. I bet she is, replied Mickey. She certainly has the thighs for it. The reds? Tristan was still looking at the horse as it galloped off into the distance. He turned to Manny, an expression on his face that the word vacant was invented for. Look, a horsey. Manny patted his arm and looked at Mickey. Fine, yeah, it'll be me. Excellent. The pink team. Bridget gave Paul a sideways glance and raised her hand. I've never been on a horse in my life, but it will be me. That's the spirit. And finally, the golden girls. Gavin was trying very hard to give Mickey the evil eye. Bridget assumed that's what he was attempting. Either that or he was trying to do hard sums in his head. The level of intimidation this engendered in Mickey made Bridget pretty sure he was well aware of the two big lads in the background. Fine, said Charlotte huffily. I've not ridden for years, but I had a pony when I was a kid, so it'll be me. Mickey turned to Spanner, who was now standing up, although not looking too happy about it. She had a pony when she was a kid. Fancy that replied Spanner. That might be the least surprising thing I heard today. Mickey turned back to camera. Well, Charlotte, I hope you cleaned up after it too, because... Mickey gave an expansive wave of his hand, and fifty meters away on cue, the dumper truck dumped its load. Horse shit. Lots and lots of horse shit. That's right. As the kids would say, this shit just got real. Your first task is to transport a shovel full of horse hockey from one end of the course to the other. You have to complete the obstacles correctly, but if you drop your load, you've got to go back and start again. Yeah, said Spanner. Think of it like an egg and spoon race, only, you know, with shite. Bridget noticed on a nearby monitor that Nigel had framed it so that reaction shots from all four contestants' faces took up a corner of the screen. She looked the least upset by this turn of events. She'd been a nurse and was raised on a farm. She'd shoveled a whole lot more shit than that in her day. Bridget looked across the line at the three other competitors. They each held a large plastic shovel. As they waited for Mickey and Spanner to take their places up in the commentary position, she considered the challenge laid out before her. She could see three different sized fences to clamber over, a mud pit to wade through, a seesaw to go over, some barbed wire to crawl under, and then there was some weird-looking thing where a load of balloons and brightly colored ribbons were dangling down from a large wooden frame. It looked more appropriate for a children's party, and not a good one. Spanner's voice boomed over the PA. On your marks, get set, go! The following transcript of the commentary on the first challenge in the Money Games is taken from the subsequent court case of Nigel Reasons versus Blind Bull Productions.
And they're off. They're all in there, straight away, except for Charlotte, who is standing at the side, making retching faces and... Jesus, Mickey, the Russian one has shoved Queen Bee right into the mountain of shite. Is that allowed? I don't know, Spanor. Queen Bee has retaliated, though. She's grabbed Irina's shovel out of her hands, and she's chucked it over the top of the pile. The refs are in now. They're separating them. I tell you, Mickey, I know this is wrong to say, but I do love seeing two women going at it like that. I know what you mean, Spanor. It's that fresh son of excitement that at any time a breast could pop out. And I've just been told by Nigel, the director, that you can't say that. What should I have said? Tit? Boob? Wap? Num num? Jubbly? Nork? Knocker! Ouch! For fix's sake, get off me, you English prick! Um, sorry, folks. I'm afraid our director has entered the booth, and he and Mickey are having a bit of a wrestle over the microphone. Meanwhile, out on the course, Charlotte has finally got her shit together and picked up some shit. Queen Bee and Arena are out in front of her, having been separated by the refs, and the sly little Aussie devil Manny is in the lead. He's gotten over the fences and... Here, lads, calm down, would ye? I'm afraid the kerfuffle in the commentary box has begun to escalate. This dipshit poked me in the eye. Jesus, Mickey, no eye poking. I didn't. He... Ouch! Nigel has Mickey in a headlock now. Lads, we're doing a live broadcast here. Speaking of which, Manny is through the mud pit and... Wait a sec. He's over the seesaw. Look at that little hobbit go. Unexpectedly good balance. Go on, Frodo. Get that ring into Mordor. And, ah, for feck's sake, lads. Sorry, folks, but the fight in the commentary booth is getting out of hand. Could a couple of the crew come and split these two up? Oh, my God! Speaking of splitting things up, Nigel just landed a vicious boot into Mickey's knackers. That is a religion changer. You dirty English! Here now, Mickey, don't go making it nationalistic. Screw you, you ignorant Irish asshole! Oh, Jesus, I'm not having that. Sound of scuffling. Go on, Spanner! Nail the gobshite! Ladies and gentlemen, Spanner is on top of Nigel now, defending the honour of Ireland. Meanwhile, out on the course, Manny has reached the last obstacle. He's stopped. He's looking at it. He's wondering what all the ribbons are for. He's running through and... Yowser! What happened? The poor little Aussie fella just found out the ribbons are electrified. He spasmed and threw the horse shit all over himself. Oh, dear God. Look at the poor sod, covered in shit, nothing to show for it, and having to head back and start again. We've all had one of them nights out. By the way, viewers, if you're wondering, Spanner is currently sitting on top of Nigel. They say you can't keep a good man down, but luckily, he's not a good man. Well said. Meanwhile, Queen Bee and Irina, the Russian sex machine, have reached the mud pit. Watch what you say now, Mickey. What? We're just watching two women making their way through the mud, shovels in hand. Tis an athletic endeavour, like the Olympics. Only with more horse shit. I always thought that was something the Olympics was missing. And they're through. They're through the mud. They're at the seesaw. One seesaw. Two women. They can't both cross at the same time. Whoever gets over first has a massive advantage. But they leave themselves vulnerable. So now they're just staring each other down. Fuck a doodle do, this is tense. Tis like Bobby Fisher versus Boris Spassky. Jesus, Spanner, that's a very highbrow reference for you. I'm quite the Renaissance man, I'll have you know. Says the man sitting on the head of our director. Is he all right, by the way? 
He's grand, and he'll stay that way as long as he stops trying to bite my ass. Speaking of fine asses, Irina waves Queen Bee forward. She's not taking the bait. I tell you what, holding a shovel full of shite up for this long, it must be murder on the arms. What competitors these girls are. Irina is making a run for it. She's in the middle and... Oh, carnage! Spank my arse and see me Tuesday. Let's look at the slow motion replay. Irina runs, trying to make it over in one go, but the seesaw was too much for her. It swings up, wallops the pursuing Queen Bee in the face, simultaneously catapulting Irina off and flattening Her Majesty. There's shite everywhere and none of it on a shovel. Both women are staggering back to their feet, and they've got to turn around and go back to the start. Incredible scenes. Somebody ring and tell her pony, but Charlotte, a.k.a. Princess Charlotte of Shiteville, presently wading through the mud pit, is now in the lead. And don't look now, but it appears a couple of members of the crew who are loyal to Nigel are trying to get into the commentary box. Transmission lost. Transmission resumes 14 minutes later. Mickey, sporting a nosebleed, and Spanner with a black eye, address the camera. Sorry about that, dear viewers. We had a technical difficulty. Let's call it what it was. A mutiny. Anyway, we've all been threatened with lawsuits, and so Nigel is back directing, and we're fulfilling our contractual obligations. The good news is... The race is still ongoing. What a battle it has been, ladies and gentlemen. I hope some of the camera operators kept rolling as this action has been indescribable. So we won't describe it. Let's just say there's been a bit of everything, including that escaped horse putting in an appearance. Snowball, I can't stand that prick. Steady, fella. Don't take it out on the horse. Here's the state of play. Charlotte is sobbing her eyes out in the mud pit. Manny has somehow got himself tangled in the barbed wire and is being cut out by one of the referees. And incredibly, bloodied and exhausted, Irina and Queen Bee find themselves standing before the final obstacle, a.k.a. the shocker. Shovels of shite in hand. It's a gut check. Who wants it more? They've each got a shovel of shite and a dream. The dream of getting the ten points for a first place finish. All that stands between them and those sweet ten points is ten thousand volts of electricity. We've been told it isn't fatal, but it is eye-wateringly, pant-wettingly painful. Although we were told that by Nigel and I wouldn't trust him as far as... Leave it, Mickey. All right. I'm just... And here goes Queen Bee. She's going through. She's screaming. She's hollering. She's tripped. But the shite is still on her shovel. Here comes Arena. She tries to jump over Queen Bee and... Oh, no! That was a mess and a half. They're both on the ground now. Queen Bee is up on her knees and she's crawling forward. Go on, you good thing. She's through. She's back on her feet. But wait, here comes the Russian. Incredibly, they both held their shit together. As in, on the shovel. It's a straight sprint to the line. It's too close to call. It's a photo finish. Paul rushed over and picked Bridget up off the ground. Love, are you okay? Bridget spoke in pained gasps. Stupid question. Right, sorry. So much shite. Paul looked up at the screen and then shook Bridget. Oh my God! What? What? Look, he said, as he pointed up at the shot of the photo finish on the big screen, 
and the tip of Bridget's shovel touching the line. You won! You won! Yes! Bridget grabbed Paul and tried to kiss him. He pulled away. Sorry, Bridge, but you're covered in... Oh, shut up and kiss me! Chapter 21 The Case of the Disappearing Cat Jimmy sat beside Charlie Walker in what they referred to as the security control room. It was a converted closet, but it had three monitors, subdivided to show feeds from fourteen different cameras. There wasn't much room, and they rubbed elbows as Charlie manipulated the mouse. I'm telling you, Mr. Stewart, it's not possible. Call me Jimmy, and I'm sorry for bothering you again, Charlie, but humor me. Phil had shown Jimmy the footage in the van. While he hadn't told Phil this, there was a part of him that was a tiny bit impressed. It took a certain type of mind to even see it. The black cat, from next door, running across the lawn. You could see it going from one feed to the next to the next. Five cameras covered elements of the back lawn. Two on each side of the house, and five more at the front. 360 degree coverage or so Charlie Walker was convinced. Jimmy had watched the footage through four times before he'd seen it. And even then, it was a literal blink-and-you'd-miss-it moment. See? Phil had said. The cat is bleeding paranormal. Jimmy hoped that Phil was speaking hyperbolically, but given the podcast they'd listened to earlier on, that was not a given. And so he'd rung the walkers and asked if they could come back. Charlie explained that they'd just been informed that they'd have to leave the property temporarily, due to an injunction Gregory Graham had lodged with the court, contesting Mrs. Graham's will. Her lawyer, Conrad Dockery, told them not to worry, as he had been expecting this course of action and he assured them it had no chance of working long term. It seemed he and Mrs. Graham had anticipated the litigious nature of her grandchildren and gone to great lengths to make sure her will was unbreakable. Still, Pang Lee had headed out to find them somewhere to stay. Charlie agreed to take some time off from packing to help with whatever Jimmy needed. He'd greeted Jimmy at the door and politely agreed to his request to arm the alarm as it would have been on the night of Dorothy's fall. He brought Jimmy up to the control room and, at great length, over twenty minutes, taken him through the camera feeds and where the alarm sensors were. I'm telling you, Mr. Stewart. Jimmy. Jimmy, nobody is getting in here. I appreciate that, Charlie. Just give me a second. My colleague is outside, and we just want to run a little test. He unclipped the walkie-talkie that he'd taken from the van from his belt, and spoke into it. All right, Phil, we're all set up here, so in your own time. Nothing happened. Jimmy looked at the walkie-talkie. It was on Channel One. They had definitely said Channel One. He turned the volume knob and spoke into it again. Phil, are you hearing me? Over. Nothing. Phil? Charlie looked at Jimmy, who was doing his best not to lose his temper. He wouldn't bet against the idiot having wandered off, possibly chasing a butterfly or something. Phil, come on, for God's sake! Can I keep this? Jesus! Jimmy jumped out of his seat, dropping the walkie-talkie, as the voice came from behind him. At least he hadn't let out a girlish scream, which was more than could be said for Charlie. Standing in the doorway, holding a toilet roll, was Phil Nellis. What are you doing here? said Jimmy. What? Phil replied looking hurt at the tone of voice. 
I was supposed to be trying to get in around the back where we sat. So I did. Yes, on my signal. The walkie-talkie died, replied Phil. I keep telling Bridget we need ones with a longer battery life. They don't always charge properly, I said to her. Hang on, interrupted Charlie. What are you doing here? Phil gave an exasperated sigh. Like I said, the walkie-talkie died, and I didn't want to bother walking all the way round, and... But how did you get in here? All oh, right, said Phil. Magic cat. Charlie looked at Phil. Exasperation writ large across his face. Then he turned to Jimmy. What is he on about? Jimmy sat back down. Phil here was looking at the footage of the night. You know, with the cat and all that. Charlie nodded. And he noticed there was a fraction of a second where you couldn't see the cat, when it left one feed and appeared on the other. You wouldn't notice it because it's that brief. Your eye would miss it when tracking it. But he noticed it, said Charlie, indicating the man who was rubbing toilet roll against his face. Yes, Jimmy conceded. He did. Jimmy looked at Charlie's crestfallen countenance and couldn't help but feel sorry for him. You've got, like, 358 degrees of coverage with the cameras. Anyone could have missed it. He didn't, said Charlie. Jimmy was struggling to think of something consoling to say. He was terrible at this bit. Wait a sec, said Charlie. Does this mean that somebody could have got in and pushed Dorothy down the stairs without being detected? Whoa, whoa, said Jimmy. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Theoretically, that's the word to remember here. Theoretically. Even if they did, they'd have to actually get into the house. Charlie jabbed a finger in Phil's direction, his voice rising an octave. He did? Well, yeah. He did. How did he do it? I don't know, admitted Jimmy. Phil looked up when he noticed everyone was looking at him. What? How did you get in? asked Charlie. Oh, right. Yeah. The locks you've got on those double doors at the back, you can get by them with a couple of pins and a chewing gum wrapper for the alarm sensors. Phil held up the loo roll. So, can I keep this? I want to bring it down the shop, see if I can find more of it. You're kidding. Phil looked hurt. Why, is it your last roll? No, I... Charlie looked at Jimmy, and then back to Phil. A couple of pins and a chewing gum wrapper. Seriously? Oh, that. Yeah, said Phil. Locksmiths are always pushing those locks. That's because they stand up well to a battering, and most people don't know the finesse approach. If you want, I'll drop this roll back when I'm done with it. Keep the fecking toilet roll. Phil pulled his neck back. I won't, if it's going to upset you. I don't give a damn about the toilet roll. Charlie put his head in his hands. Jimmy winched and placed a self-conscious, consoling hand on his shoulder. Don't feel bad, Charlie. Phil comes from a long line of professional thieves. Hey! said Phil, outraged. You can stop taking shots at my family. I'm not. I'm just... My uncle was only caught once. I mean, he only ever did one crime.
probably. You can't keep pissing on his grave. I'm not. I... Phil stormed out, shouting over his shoulder as he left. I'll be in the van. What was... started Charlie. Don't worry about it, said Jimmy. Personal issue. Right. I need to turn the alarm off or he won't be able to get... Charlie stopped talking, as he saw Phil striding purposefully down the gravel driveway. Oh, for Christ's sake! Chapter 22 Fast Cars Leaderboard after one challenge Queen Bee and Sidekick Boy, ten points Gregory and Arena, six points Tristan and Manny, four points Charlotte and Gavin, two points After Charlotte had eventually crossed the finish line of the horse hockey obstacle course they broke for lunch, which, in Bridget's case, comprised a banana and the longest shower she had ever taken. She changed into spare pink overalls, soaked the wrestling mask, and put it under a hand dryer. Yet there was still a faint aroma of horse shit. The possibility that the aroma might follow her for the rest of her life seemed like a very real one. She was even less keen on the black eye she had emerging from where the seesaw had hit her right in the face. A nice doctor had seen her and prescribed two aspirin and an ice pack. There had been a brief sighting of Conrad Dockery, the lawyer having noticeably remained absent for the first event. While she'd been in the midst of battle, the commentary coming over the tannoy had been just white noise, but from what Paul had told her, Spanner and Mickey had got into a fight with the director, Nigel. She was too tired to pay much attention, though she had caught some of the highlights of the morning event playing on a loop on one of the many monitors dotted around Gochran House. It was weird to realize the person in the mask on TV was you. They'd eaten in the main dining hall, which was all wood panelling and long tables, Hogwarts style. She overheard one of the crew who were eating down the table from them, commenting that it had all been great television. She doubted that Dockery shared their enthusiasm, at least about the fight between the presenters and director, all of whom had taken off to a room somewhere, no doubt to run through the finer points of the riot act. As they'd sat there, casually chatting, she and Paul watched the other contestants like a hawk. Gregory and Irina hardly spoke to each other, Gregory saving himself for berating the staff over God knows what. Manny was shoving coffee and any food he could manage into Tristan, presumably trying to get his client back on planet Earth after whatever medication he'd taken for breakfast. Charlotte was telling off Gavin, although Bridget was unsure as to what exactly was supposed to be his fault. The big man sat, munching his way through half the contents of the salad bar. He didn't look like getting berated by his wife was an entirely new experience for him. Watching them, Bridget couldn't get her head around the idea that one of them might have killed Dorothy. They may all be dreadful people, but none of them seemed to have the wherewithal to take out such a woman as their step-grandmother. At the end of lunch, Mickey, Spanner, and Nigel re-emerged and addressed the entire room, assuring them they had put aside all their differences and would proceed in a professional manner. They had the air of men who had seen all kinds of potential legal trouble in their futures and who were suddenly keen to get along with everybody. Once fed and watered, they'd been directed out to the pavilion area where another stage stood this one with a large screen standing behind it. On the way, they passed where the assault course had been, its dismantling already underway. The obstacles had been removed, the mud pit filled in with sand, and the massive pile of horse manure having gone wherever horse manure goes. Wasn't it used on roses or something? 
This place certainly had enough flower beds. The intro music roared through the speakers as Spanner stood before the four teams. From where the contestants stood, they could see a wet patch from where he'd held the ice pack to his backside, but it wouldn't show up on camera. Welcome back to the money games, where four teams battle it out for a shed load of cash. The leaderboard flashed up behind him on the big screen. After one round, the pink team are out to an early lead, but there's still plenty of time to make a move. We call our next game, with apologies to Tracy Chapman. Have you got a fast car? And it will feature the team members who didn't compete this morning. So, gentlemen, please step forward to the podiums. Paul, in his sidekick boy mask, Gregory, Tristan and Gavin, all obediently walked forward and stood where instructed. So then, let's find out about this game. Mickey, where's Mickey? Spanner looked around, faking surprise at the absence of his partner. In response, an engine could be heard revving in the distance. Every head turned as a sports car hurtled around the side of Gochran House and rocketed up the gravel path. It was an obnoxious shade of yellow, with heavily tinted windows, and was moving fast enough that members of the crew had to shield themselves from flying stones. It turned off the path onto the grass and headed straight for the stage, sliding into a handbrake turn as it came to a halt a few feet from Spanner. Bridget noticed a man in overalls flapping his arms in horrified exasperation at the damage it had done to the previously immaculate lawn. She had a strong suspicion he was one of the ground staff. The door of the car opened and Mickey, wearing a cat that ate the entire bird sanctuary smile, attempted to get out, which was not a graceful exercise. That's right, said Mickey to a question nobody asked. This is a Porsche 911 Carrera 4S Cabriolet, a prince among sports cars. You can build it up all you like, Mickey, said Spanner. They're not going to let you keep it. A man has to have ambition. He also has to have a license. And you've got nine points on yours. You'd never even make it home. Anyway, contestants, are you excited for the next challenge? Seriously? thought Bridget. If I spend a morning knee-deep in shit and he gets to race sports cars, I will be livid. Beside her, Manny stepped forward and raised his hand. Um, sorry, but Tristan doesn't have any kind of driving license. Yes, I do, responded Tristan. No, you don't. I did a driving test. Manny rolled his eyes. For the last time, you didn't. You did one driving lesson, and you and that instructor didn't do much actual driving because you and her... Manny stopped himself. He doesn't have a license. That's fine, said Spanner. He will not be driving a car. The shoulders of the four men behind the podium sagged a little. No, continued Spanner. This is going to be a quiz. Mickey, having extricated himself from the front seat, placed his hand on the car's bonnet. That's right. I'm the only one who gets to drive this magnificent machine that is sheer automotive perfection. Dial it back, Mickey. They're not biting. They might. Spanner held a finger to his ear and nodded. Right. On with the quiz. Gentlemen, pick up the pens in front of you and write down answers to the following three questions, and we'll see them on the screen at the front of your podium. You'll get points for each answer, and the person with the most at the end wins ten points for their team, second six, etc. 
Yes, it is a bit confusing, having two different forms of scoring. But when I mentioned it in the production meeting, I got shouted down. So there you go. Question 1. Brand new. How much does this car cost? Whatever it is, interjected Mickey. It's worth it. Seriously, it's getting pathetic. Stop. Spanner looked up as Gregory raised his hand and coughed pointedly. Um, I'm not sure we're supposed to take questions about the questions. Gregory's hand remained aloft. Spanner placed a finger to his earpiece. Okay, I've been told apparently we do. He looked off screen. Would have been nice if somebody told us that beforehand, he said pointedly. Yes, Gregory. In this costing, are you assuming the car will have the sports exhaust system like that one does? Spanner's brow wrinkled for a minute, and then he nodded. Yes. And, continued Gregory, the ORS spider designed wheels? Spanner touched his ear again. I don't know what you're talking about, but yes, all of that. Whatever you see there. Can I have a look at the interior? No, just write down a number. But... Write down a number. Just... I don't care. Write down a number. Challenge one had women in a mud pit. This is a bad knockoff of The Price is Right. I can feel us losing viewers by the second. Move it along. Boss. Final answers. Pens down in three. Bridget met Paul's eyes. He shrugged and puffed out his cheeks. Two. One. Pens down. Right. Let's see our guesses. The screens on each podium lit up. OK, Gavin, you guessed 200,000 euros. Tristan, you put 300,000 euros. Gregory, you put 225,000 euros. And Sidekick Boy, you put 90,000 euros. I can tell you the correct answer is... 237,000 euros! Are you taking the piss? said Paul. Cheap at twice the price, said Mickey. See, said Gregory, it's got the ceramic brakes. How are we supposed to know that from just looking at it? Calm down, Gregory, you won, said Spanner, before adding under his breath. What a monumental... He stopped and smiled at the camera, realizing he was mic'd up. Points flashed up on the podiums. Showing Gregory got four, Gavin three, Tristan two, and Paul just the one. Bridget tried to smile encouragingly at him. Moving on, question two. We asked one hundred people, when they saw someone driving by in this car, what one word popped into their heads? Give me your guess for the top answer. You've got ten seconds. Is it my imagination, or are we ripping off family fortunes now, too? Fun fact for our American viewers, said Mickey. That show is called Family Feud over there. Jesus, said Spanner. The only way you can stop him trying to get a free Porsche is if he's angling for America. For the last time, we're not doing a residency in Las Vegas, Mickey. Get over it. Mickey folded his arms. Your problem is you lack ambition. And yours is... Spanner stopped as the timer dinged. Right, gents, time is up. Probably just as well. What word did the 100 people in our survey think of when they saw somebody driving by in this car? Let's see what you went with. Now. The words flashed up on the podiums. OK, said Spanner. Gregory, you went with success. 
Our survey said... Spanner gave a classic game show wave towards the big screen, which pinged up with a three. Three people thought that. Not a good start. On to Gavin. You said... Performance. Something you're known for. Bridget watched the referees moving forward in case Gavin realized that was a dig, but he seemed oblivious. Our survey said... Two! Only two! Ironically terrible performance there! Right, on to Tristan. Tristan waved. Hi, Barry. Who is... Do you know what? Never mind. Let's see what you put as an answer. You put... Banana. Did you understand the question, Tristan? He pointed at the car. It's yellow. It is. Great point. Let's see if it's up there. Spanner gave a wave, and a one flashed up on the screen. Spanner looked shocked. Really? Was Tristan one of the one hundred people surveyed by any chance? Did I win? Well, said Spanner, in a way, you're all winners. However, in a much more real way. No. No, you didn't. Oh. Finally, on to Sidekick Boy. You're in last place, so you need a result here, and you went with... Wanker! Another note to our American viewers, interjected Mickey. Oh, for feck's sake. A wanker is what you would call a politician. Fair point. Let's see if it's up there. Spanner jumped, as from somewhere a siren sounded. Top answer! Fifty-eight people agreed with you! Sidekick boy, well done! And now, why does Gregory have his hand up? Is there any way we can taser him or something to stop him doing that? Final question. Can I just... No, Gregory. Nobody cares. Final question. All still to play for. Anyone could win. Well, not Tristan, but you know. Three out of four ain't bad. While zipping about town in his Porsche, Mickey here has got himself a milky coffee. The big question is, how much does a litre of milk cost? Spanner turned around in disgust to face away from the contestants, as everyone bar Tristan's hands went up. No, screw it. If I don't see them, they don't exist. I'm supposed to be a quiz host. The bloke who asks the bloody questions. Start the ten-second timer. A litre of milk. How do you like your milk, Mickey? Semi-skimmed. Right. Semi-skimmed milk. It's like the most basic question. Jesus, I can't believe we've got a whole week with these idiots to look forward to. Spanner put his finger to his ear. No, Nigel, I'll say what I like. It's the truth. The buzzer sounded. Right, let's reveal the answers. Gregory, you went with five euros. Seriously, five euros? Are you defective? I'm lactose intolerant. It's not a fair question. Sure. Lucky you weren't Porsche intolerant. Gavin, you went with... One euro. Tristan, you went with... Milk is free. Jesus H. Christ. And finally, sidekick boy. Paul's screen was a blur of tiny writing, crammed in to fit into the space. You wrote an essay. It's a tricky question, said Paul. Is it? said Spanner. Is it really? What in the name of the baby Jesus and all the saints? said Mickey. I'm losing the will to live, said Spanner. Mickey, go over there and see if you can read that. I've not got me specs.
Mickey hopped up onto the stage and knelt down in front of Paul's podium. Right, it says. The cheapest litre of milk is actually if you get a two litre from Aldi at one euro thirty-nine, but... Assuming, prompted Paul. Assuming, repeated Mickey, a litre on its own is seventy-nine cents in Tesco, or you can get one after 8.30 p.m. in Centra if it's dated for the next day for forty-nine cents. Mickey looked up at Paul. What in the fecking hell is wrong with you? What? said Paul. It's just handy to know. Jesus, man, get a hobby. Spanner looked off stage again. Nigel, you can sort this out. Spanner held his finger to his ear, rolling his eyes. Unbelievable. He's got people ringing supermarkets. This is some seriously riveting TV. If you're watching at home, feel free to nip out and grab some milk and make yourself a cup of tea. Oh, hang on, he's finally back. Spanner said nothing as he listened. He wants me to leave a dramatic pause. He apparently didn't want me to say that out loud. And... Sidekick boy has won! The question. The round! Well done, the pink team! Gavin second, Gregory third, and Tristan... Well... He's Tristan. Spanner waved a hand at the big screen. Here are the points after day one. He ripped his cards up and tossed them in the air. I don't know about anyone else, but I need a drink. Well, said Mickey, I might take this glorious Porsche for another quick spin. Oh, stop being a dick, Mickey. Leaderboard after two challenges. Queen Bee and Sidekick Boy, 20 points. Gregory and Arena, 10 points. Charlotte and Gavin, 8 points. Tristan and Manny, 6 points. Chapter 23 The Law Conrad Dockery gave the entire room a stern look. He was one of the rare people who could pull that off, Bridget thought. The man had gravitas. She could see why he was so successful in court. He gave off the vibe that he was the law. In conclusion... We will not tolerate violence from anyone involved in this production, be it contestants or presenters. Is everyone crystal clear on that point? His question was met with silent nods from the assembled contestants, presenters and directors, plus the two burly referees who were sitting at the back of the room. Excellent. Dockery turned his attention to Manny, and the once again slumbering figure of Tristan, who, this time, nobody had bothered to wake up. And Mr. Pagonis. Please, call me Manny. Mr. Pagonis, if your client could appear less... I'm struggling to find the exact diplomatic words. Stoned! said Gregory. Off his face, said Mickey. Blotto, offered Charlotte. Away with the fairies, said Spanner. Yes, thank you, said Dockery. I was not actually looking for suggestions. You take my point, Mr. Pagonis. Manny shook his head. I've no idea what you mean. Tristan is on certain medication for allergies which occasionally reacts with certain foods, but that is unavoidable. It impressed Bridget how long Manny held Dockery's gaze before looking away. She'd have disintegrated into a puddle in half the time. The man really did have that staring thing down. Moving on. He turned to indicate a blonde woman in her mid-twenties who had been sitting in the corner since the start of the evening briefing. 
Briefing was a very nice word for it. They'd all been called in after dinner for a bollocking. It was not unlike the one trip in her school career that Bridget had made to the principal's office. Well, the one trip not counting the series of discussions over poor Sean Coyne's arm. Beside her, Paul seemed more relaxed. He'd clearly been in a lot more trouble as a kid. Now, as you know, the broadcast of this competition on the Internet is being handled by Albino Gibbon Productions. Miss Claver would like a word. Hi, she said. Thanks so much, Connie. You can all call me Tick. Bridget was sure Conrad Dockery had never been referred to as Connie in his entire existence, and his facial expression indicated he had been fine with that. Miss Claver had an excited puppy energy to her, like she might lick your face and pee on the floor at any second. Just got to say, you guys are H-O-T hot. Excuse me, said Gregory. I mean, lava hot. We've put the feed out in the normal places, but social media picked up on it, and now so has the M.M. Sorry, said Dockery. The what? Mainstream media. You were on the six o'clock news. Good God, really? Yes. Charlotte grabbed Gavin's arm. OMG, this is huge. That's epic reach. It sure is, said Tick, delighted that someone in the room shared her enthusiasm. It is off the hook. Mickey punched Spanner on the shoulder. Didn't I feckin' tell you? Didn't I? This idiot said it'd kill our careers. No way, said Tick. People love it, all of it, including when you and Nigel got into it. Nigel jabbed an accusatory finger. You mean when he assaulted me? I'll get back off, you pompous ass, retorted Mickey. Gentlemen, said Dockery sternly, enough of this. Don't you dare stop them, Connie, said Tick. The audience love all this, not as much as the doo-doo flying about in the mud or the electrocuting thing, but yeah, it popped. Mickey, Spanner, and Nigel eyed each other, two sides who hated each other, but also saw there was money to be made. Tick referred to her clipboard and then looked around the room. And Queen Bee? Bridget sheepishly raised her hand. The woman rushed towards her, and Bridget drew back, half expecting her to start humping her leg. Oh, my God, people love you. That whole thing between you and the scary Russian chick. Loved it. Rocky Three vibes. Tingles. Right, said Bridget, unsure of what else was expected. And sidekick boy. I'm not a fan of that name, said Paul. Well, big news. Two dairies have been in touch, and they want you as a spokesperson. Seriously, your whole badass Mexican lady and her milk-loving wimpy sidekick. People just can't get enough of it. Who handles your PR? Paul and Bridget looked at each other. This had never come up before. Bridget gave Paul a little wink before turning back to her. Yeah, we've got a guy. I'll give you his number. His name is Decky. Super! Charlotte raised her hand. Hi, yeah, and what about Chavin? We could organize some synergistic promotion, if I could get my phone back. Right, said Tick, noticeably less enthusiastic. I think we're okay. Excuse me, we are a serious brand. You could... Honestly, we're fine. What do you... Okay, look, said Tick, suddenly serious. Your numbers are horrible. People love the Mexicans. They love to hate what's-his-name and the scary Russian wife. Gregory raised his hand. 
See, said Tick, people can't stand that pedantic a-hole thing he's got going on. It is really working. Got the audience loving to hate him. How dare you, said Gregory. And they love the stoned guy. Allergies, said Manny. But the whole Chavin thing just... Uh, no, not working. Charlotte, looking aghast, turned to Gavin and walloped him. Look what you did! She stormed out, providing an excellent segue for the meeting to close. Bridget and Paul got the hell out of there before Tick could launch into more unasked-for advice. As they stood in the lift, Paul pulled out of his pocket the envelope which Conrad Dockery had handed him. As part of the competition rules, all communication with the outside world was forbidden, but the issue with Dorothy's other request rather complicated that. His solution was to allow Jimmy Stewart to text him an update, which he would pass on. Bridget had texted Jimmy from Dockery's phone earlier to explain all. He'd just handed them a printout of all correspondence. Bridget read along. Jimmy, this is Bridget. We're not allowed our phones, etc. So text this phone, Conrad Dockery's, and he will pass on any updates. I hope you and Phil are getting on well. Okay. And no, we aren't. Update. We have determined that it is theoretically possible for someone to get around the cameras at Mrs. Graham's house. There's no evidence, though. I actually need to speak to Mr. Dockery at some point. Mr. Stewart, Conrad Dockery here. I can see you at my office at 10 a.m. Great. Thank you. They stopped talking as the lift doors pinged open, and two workmen stood aside to let them out. Bridget and Paul nodded their thanks and moved off down the hall. This place must pay well to have guys in fixing stuff at this time of night. Look around you. They're not short of a few quid. He held up the piece of paper. So someone could have gotten in, said Paul. Sounds that way. Jimmy is making good progress from what I can see. Yeah, I suppose. I'm sure he and Phil will iron out their differences. They're both adults. Paul looked at her. Weren't you and I just in a room filled with supposed adults? Bridget winced. Fair point. Look on the bright side, said Paul. We're H-O-T, hot. I know. You've become a sex symbol to milk-loving ladies everywhere. All that plus a ten-point lead, baby. Paul grabbed Bridget and kissed her as they turned the corner. Oh, hello, said Paul. Looks like someone got a prezi. I find it weird when you call it that, but okay. She lowered her voice. Maybe you could wear the mask? Paul pointed downwards. That's not actually what I was referring to, freaky. But also, yes. Bridget saw where he was pointing. A white box with a ribbon around it was sitting in front of the door to their room. Oh, she bent down and picked it up, reading the card. Congrats on a superb first day, C.D. Conrad Dockery, said Paul. Must be. Oh, hello, said Bridget as she flipped open the box. White chocolate, my favourites. Paul slipped his key into the door and opened it. They are made with the finest full-fat milk, available in two litres for one euro fifty-nine. Jesus, stop. You know you talking milk gets me all horny. Paul pushed the door open. I'll go get my mask. Chapter 24 Baby on Board As soon as Jimmy Stewart's foot hit the top step, he heard the van horn honk loudly outside. 
All right, he said to no one who could hear him. I'm coming, I'm coming. Jimmy had thought about it overnight and decided he would take a run at apologizing to Phil. He went to bed firm in his belief that he had nothing to apologize for, but woke up in a different state of mind. Maybe it was sleeping in the bed he'd shared with his Moira for forty years that had done it. Not that he had. They changed the base at least five times and the mattress a dozen, but metaphorically it was still their bed. The room felt like her spirit was there. The consoling, cajoling, gently chastising spirit. The one that told him he was being pig-headed. It was now 8 a.m. He'd been up for two hours because he was a man in his sixties and it was one of life's great jokes that when you finally found yourself with nothing pressing to get up for, your body would wake you up earlier than ever. He'd sat on the edge of his bed, waiting for the world to stop spinning. There was now a sense of dread every time he tried to get to his feet. He took the tablets they gave him, but couldn't tell if they were doing much good. The doctor said it might clear up in two weeks, two months, or never. He was starting to suspect he'd have got as much useful medical advice if he'd rang a number at random. The horn honked again. Oh, for Christ's sake! He had been waiting for ages, but he was of an age that his body filled in any downtime with regular trips to the toilet. If Jimmy ever met God, he would have a strong word about what he considered to be some serious design flaws. Three steps from the bottom stair, he had to stop, close his eyes, and take a few deep breaths. His stab at achieving Zen enlightenment, or at least middle-ear equilibrium, was thrown off by the sound of an ice cream van playing the theme to Popeye. Of course the surveillance van had kept the bloody siren. All good undercover vehicles had one of them. He stumbled slightly on the final step, grabbing his overcoat off the hook on the wall. Moira's still hung beside it. He knew Sharon and the other kids had a whispered conversation about it after the reception for the funeral, but nobody moved it. Jimmy slammed the door behind him as he stomped up the path. All right, all right, keep your hair on. The siren stopped, and Jimmy saw Mrs. French from across the road peering through her curtains. Jimmy clambered into the passenger seat. At least the dog wasn't in his seat this time. Was that really necessary? I didn't know if you knew I was here. You know, my house has a doorbell. Have you ever used one? Phil threw his hands up in the air. Ah, here we go again. More digs at me and my family being thieves. I'm not here to put up with this abuse. Jimmy took a deep breath and lowered the pitch of his voice to a more conciliatory tone. I didn't mean it like that. In fact, I meant to say... Jimmy gagged. Jesus, what is that smell? What smell? What smell? repeated Jimmy. Are you kidding? It's disgusting. Can you not leave the dog at home? Jimmy turned to see Maggie sitting in the back, regarding him with a cold stare. No, said Phil firmly. She's part of the team. And besides, we need her to take care of the baby. The Jimmy noticed that sitting beside the large German shepherd was a carry cot containing a baby. He turned back to Phil his voice now a whisper. There is a baby in the back. Well, yeah, obviously. With the dog. We know. It's my daughter. Jimmy turned to look in the back again. And you're fine with her being beside the dog? She's a well-behaved baby. She'll leave the dog alone. I didn't! 
Jimmy stopped himself talking. He looked out the window. He could see Mrs. French's curtain twitching. Okay, let's start again. Why is there a baby in the back? It's not legal for her to travel up front. Jimmy gave Phil a long, assessing look. You know, I have no idea when you're joking. About what? Never mind. My wife isn't feeling well, so I had to bring her with me. But we're working. And? I'm just driving you about, and you make me wait in the van half the time anyway. If I need to leave the van, Maggie will look after her. A dog cannot mind a baby. Says who? Says? Jimmy was struggling to find the words. He could feel his whole body tensing up. Arguing with Phil Nellis felt a lot like punching water. Sure, you were getting shots in, but none of it seemed to be having any effect. Forget about it. Just drive. Where are we off to? To see Conrad Dockery, Mrs. Graham's lawyer. He was busy yesterday with whatever the hell all that nonsense is out at Gochran House. Right, yeah. Phil turned the engine on and put the van in gear. Then he turned it off again. Now what? We just caught that smell, said Phil. We think the baby needs changing. Chapter 25 Hell. Was this hell? It could be hell. It definitely had a hell-like quality to it. Maybe Bridget had died in the night and got fast-tracked right by St. Peter. She'd tried to live a good life, and if you'd asked her a couple of hours ago, she'd have thought she'd made a decent fist of it. But the current evidence emphatically rejected that hypothesis. Clearly, the Sean Coyne's arm incident had really weighted against her. All right. She maybe should have not skipped the last practice on the dance routine, but still, live performance always carried risk, didn't it? Paul stood over her. We need the toilet. My head is in here. I need it. Use the sink. I can't. It's a number two. Use the bath, then. Paul had been first. He'd woken at 6 a.m. and rushed into the bathroom. Bridget had gone to check on him and then, possibly prompted by the smell of vomit, she had needed it, too. They'd called reception at 6.30 a.m. and they sent the doctor up. Bacterial food poisoning. Severe, he'd said. Bridget was unsure whose benefit that had been for. It wasn't like Paul and Bridget would have ever referred to their current predicament as mild. He'd explained, mostly through the bathroom door, that he recommended lots of fluids and could prescribe some antibiotics. But the only other solution was hospitalization. There was a knock on the door. Who is it? Bridget pulled her head out of the toilet bowl and Paul took the opportunity to sit down. Look away, look away, he howled. Bridget did, but the soundtrack didn't leave a great deal to the imagination. Who is it? she repeated. Conrad Dockery. Bridget assessed herself in the mirror. She was wearing one of Paul's old T-shirts that she slept in. The overall look she'd achieved was of someone who had spent a large part of the morning behaving like a human Catherine wheel, and explaining to the man she loved that if he didn't get out of her way, she was going to kill him. She considered getting dressed properly, then decided against it. It wasn't like she was done needing the loo. Conrad Dockery's poker face deserted him as she opened the door. Oh, Lord, are you all right, Miss Conroy? 
No offense, Conrad, but as stupid questions go. Right. Sorry, is Mr. Mulcrone? The retching sound from the bathroom gave him all the answer he needed. The doctor informs me you both have severe food poisoning. Yep. Bridget's face against the cold wood of the hotel room door felt nice. Maybe this wasn't hell. I am afraid the rules of the competition are very clear. You have to compete or forfeit. Nope. It was definitely hell, all right. Excuse me? Mrs. Graham left a lot of detailed instructions, as you know, and... Oh. Conrad Dockery stopped talking, as Bridget disappeared and reappeared about a minute later, wiping her mouth. You were saying... I'm sorry, but you have to compete, or else you forfeit. Right. Well, we've got a bit of time. You have to assemble downstairs in thirty minutes. Bridget sighed and noticed the flinch. Her breath undoubtedly was horrendous, but right at that point she didn't care. I want you to know, Conrad, I really hate you right now. I'm sorry, but there really is nothing I can do. Yeah, not to make you feel bad, but the last thing either of us ate were your chocolates. He gave her a blank look. Excuse me? The chocolates that you... Ah, you've got to be kidding me. Dockery shook his head. I didn't send anyone any confectionery. We've been poisoned. That's a very serious accusation. Have you any of these chocolates left that we could test? No, they're all... In the background, the toilet flushed again. Well, that... Right. I will, of course, bring this up. Poor choice of words. Dockery looked at his watch. I apologize again, but... I'm afraid you now have twenty-eight minutes to get downstairs. Bridget said nothing, closed the door and walked back into the bathroom. How much of that did you hear? What? said Paul, his head dangling over the toilet bowl. Okay, said Bridget, feeling more tired than she had ever done in her life. One of those pricks poisoned us. Super. Yep. And we've got to get downstairs or we concede. Paul grabbed onto the sink and hauled himself to his feet. Oh, God. I know. We have to. Yes. Right. Bridget went for a hug. Don't touch me. Fair enough. I mean... Not a problem. How long until? Twenty-something minutes. Right, said Paul. Well, at least we know that there's somebody in this competition who could kill someone. Because if I ever find out who did this to us, I'll murder the bastard. I will help you bury the body. Paul looked at Bridget. Can I get that hug now? All right, but make it quick. I need to stand in the shower and cry for a bit. Chapter 26 If he did it, we're screwed. Throughout his career, Jimmy Stewart had sat on the far side of a table from an awful lot of people. Criminals, victims, master manipulators, the outright insane, and once, rather memorably, the Minister for Agriculture, who in Jimmy's expert opinion was a combination of all the above. 
Still, he'd never interviewed someone quite so calm and in control of himself as Conrad Dockery. It wasn't an alpha thing. He wasn't trying to assert dominance. That was actually a boon to an interviewer who knew what to do with it. He wasn't trying to prove he was smarter either, which again, used right, could work to your advantage. No, Conrad Dockery simply was smarter. Jimmy was glad he wasn't a suspect, because he guessed if Dockery wanted to kill somebody, that person would be dead, and nobody could ever prove a thing. Even if Conrad Dockery was found sitting on top of the body holding the murder weapon, while watching a PowerPoint presentation on how to dispose of a body. How long did you know, Mrs. Graham? I've known her and her late husband for the best part of thirty-five years. They were one of my first clients. You were friends? Dockery paused. An acquaintance of mine has a joke where he says that lawyers don't have friends. We have clients with privileges. It isn't a terribly good joke, but it does rather sum up the dichotomy of my existence. Let us say I knew the Grahams socially, and I was certainly fond of them. As far as you were aware, did they have any enemies? It depends how you define the term. Mr. Graham's family had employed a lot of people before their original company collapsed. Consequently, it cost a lot of people their livelihoods. I don't believe anyone held a grudge against Mr. Graham personally, though. I certainly saw no evidence of it. There was his first wife who left him, and despite that he still supported her when she subsequently fell on hard times. How did the second Mrs. Graham feel about that? Dockery ran a hand along the leather surface of his mahogany desk. That is something I cannot speak to. The business that Mr. and Mrs. Graham launched together. The garden centers. Yes, said Dockery. There was the normal cut and thrust of commerce, but nothing out of the ordinary. The Grahams were shrewd but fair business people. So they had rivals, but not enemies. Jimmy Stewart continued taking notes in his pad. Okay. Then there is the family. Yes. What's your take on the three grandchildren? They are... challenging to deal with. Dockery's face was an implacable mask as he spoke. Do you think any of them are capable of murder? Respectfully, D.I. Stewart, that is what you are here to find out, is it not? Yes, and it's just Mr. Stewart now. Of course. Do you not keep the title in an honorary capacity after retirement? Nah. Some would argue there wasn't much honor in it before retirement. Dockery gave a polite smile. Would it be possible to see a copy of Mrs. Graham's will? No, I'm afraid not. Jimmy raised an eyebrow. Why not? Client confidentiality. But... My client is dead, yes. I'm afraid that doesn't make all of her affairs open to examination. I'm aware that she is effectively also your client here, which is a unique situation. I will endeavor to answer any questions you have to the best of my abilities, and with what latitude I feel is appropriate in the current circumstance. Jimmy leaned back, and the leather chair creaked under his weight. Shouldn't I be the judge of what I need to know? No. Speaking as the person who knows, I will adjudicate on what information is relevant. 
I apologize, and I appreciate that if there is anything that defined your distinguished Garda career, it was a burning desire to know the truth. Jimmy ran a hand around the back of his neck. How do you know about my career, Mr. Dockery? Dockery gave a wan smile. It is my job to know. For what it is worth, I was glad to hear that Miss Conroy and Mr. Mulcrone had engaged your services. It's just a temporary thing. Dockery nodded. So, do you think Mrs. Graham could have been murdered? Dockery took a moment and looked at the painting of a horse race hanging on the wall of his office. I believe that she believed it, and her final recording, given its timing, concerns me. Having said that, it would be remiss if I did not point out that Mrs. Graham, while mentally sharp, was, shall we say, prone to flights of fancy? I know she believed she had been followed, and that she felt people were showing an undue interest in her house. I was therefore very interested to see in your text message to Miss Conroy that it was theoretically possible for someone to have got into the house undetected. Yes, said Jimmy. But you can't give me any suspects on that front. I can tell you that all three of the grandchildren, or rather their representatives in one form or another, had been in contact with me over the last six months, looking for money from the Graham estate. They came to you, and not Mrs. Graham directly. He gave a curt nod. Mrs. Graham and her step-grandchildren really had no relationship to speak of. And yet, said Jimmy, they're sort of in her will. Yes. In consideration of the late Mr. Graham's dying wishes. Paul Mulcrone is in there, too, though. Dockery gave a slight head tilt. Yes. So he has a lot to gain here, too. He does. Only you've not mentioned it. Well, said Dockery. I assumed we weren't considering him. I mean, he is your boss. Not to get all huffy about it, but I rather consider Mrs. Graham my boss here. Dockery pursed his lips and ran a hand through his well-maintained quiff. I appreciate your point. What I can tell you is... Mrs. Graham offered Paul money on at least three occasions. In fact, once she all but forced it on him. He turned it down every time. On the last occasion, he returned a substantial check to me uncashed, and in no uncertain terms, asked me to prevent Mrs. Graham from attempting to give him money again. If he was playing some kind of game on that front, well... It was remarkably convincing. Mrs. Graham also wanted to invest in your current employer, MCM Investigations. But that was politely turned down, too. It was Jimmy's turn to nod as he continued to take notes. And what about Mr. and Mrs. Walker? Pang Lee would have had no firm idea she was in the will. She may have suspected, of course. Still, they are financially secure, and I had them both looked into in some detail previously, which raised no red flags. Why would you do that? asked Jimmy. Mrs. Graham asked me to discreetly look into Charlie when he and Pang Lee became serious, as you would say. I then had someone different check him out again when Dorothy informed me that she was going to offer for him to move in with Pang Lee prior to their marriage. 
That's a lot of checking. Mrs. Graham was elderly and wealthy. I felt it was my role to ensure her best interests were served. I am happy to attest that they would have known nothing about the will. Its contents were a very closely guarded secret. It can't have been that closely guarded. I mean, all the rigmarole out in Gochran House took a lot of organization. You'd be amazed what can be put in place discreetly if you throw enough money at the problem. Lots of people were involved, but it was compartmentalized. Almost no one had a view of the whole picture. Who did? asked Jimmy. Me? Mrs. Graham, obviously. Two of my junior associates. I will vouch for their absolute discretion, but of course we can make them available for interview if you wish. There were the witnesses to her will, all esteemed professionals with little to gain from breaking the confidence they'd entered into. In fact, the contracts they had signed made the penalties for doing so punitive. Miss Sharma, who recorded the messages, we carefully selected her as she is a student at University College Galway and a recent immigrant to this country. She wouldn't know any of the players, or indeed anyone in Dublin, so the chances of any leak were minimal. Mrs. Graham was a tad paranoid in that respect. How long had she been planning all of this? In earnest, about two years. I think you could say it became something of an obsession. The woman was... well... She was formidable. We'll all miss her. She was, frankly, always a lively and interesting presence in any day. And while I am not fond of the circus this has rather become, I will say her unusual requests were an enjoyable change of pace from the humdrum of normal legal work. Is there anything else you can tell me about her that might be relevant? Duckery tapped his fingers against his lips. Along with planning what happened after her own death, she had recently become rather obsessed with tracing her family's roots. Yes, Hang Lee mentioned something about that. It is not uncommon in our more elderly clients especially now with popular TV programs on the subject. We actually assisted Mrs. Graham, in so much as we had lined her up to talk to a Professor Mulligan in Trinity College, who had assisted us in these matters previously. Did anything come from it? Not that I'm aware of, although... Sorry, I've just realized you should know this. The Professor... God rest his soul, is the one who died recently in that terrible incident. Oh. Jimmy hadn't recognized the name, but he knew the case. A drug addict had broken into Trinity College and stabbed a professor to death with a needle. It had been all over the front pages and the radio talk shows. It had led to a debate about Dublin's persistent drug problem and how it left nobody untouched. What was he working on for her? I'm afraid I'm not privy to that. I have the number for Professor Mulligan's assistant, if you'd like it. Yes, please. A firm knock on the door interrupted them. Dockery raised his voice slightly. I asked not to be disturbed, Jacqueline. The door opened and his secretary walked in, looking flustered. I'm sorry, Mr. Dockery, but Mr. Stewart's assistant is here and he says he needs to speak to him urgently. I'm not his assistant, came Phil's voice from outside the door. I apologize, his associate. Phil walked in behind her, the baby strapped to his chest. Sorry, we need the loo. 
and I need you to mind the baby. What? said Jimmy, confused. Phil spoke deliberately, like Jimmy was a little slow on the uptake. I need the loo, and I'm heading into the Regent Arms across the road. So I need you to mind the baby. Sure. I'll be out in a second. No, I've been waiting ages. I'm boosting. Can't you bring the baby with you? Phil looked horrified. No, I can't bring her into the gents with me. She could see something that'll scar her for life. <laughs>